Hello! A little bit of context before we begin with this one. This was originally streamed on Twitch by myself and Mr. Paul Gannon back in late 2020. This is basically a supercut of all three streams put together. I still stream on Twitch twice a week, that's uh, Wednesday evenings and Sunday evenings, twitch.tv forward slash ashens for more info. And the stream. Anyway, enjoy this dive into the multimedia extravaganza? That is Ghosts with Christopher Lee. Hello, and welcome to Sundays. Yes, it's time for more CD-ROM guff from the mid-90s. This is the... I was going to call it a prequel, but it's not really. This is the CD-ROM that came before Weird, made by the same people, but entirely about the spookinesses. And please, be upstanding for special guest and expert on such matters... Mr. Paul Gannon. Hello, hello, hello. I am indeed the best man about ghosts in the world. This this is true. I asked a ghost yeah. and he confirmed it. I, I know. They always name drop me now in those supernatural parties you don't get invited to because, you know, they're only for the dead. So. Yeah. Also, yeah. he told me there was no such thing as ghosts. So that's kind of ruined this a bit, I think. It's, yeah. a, it's a weird paradox in many respects to be told something doesn't exist by the thing that doesn't exist. I didn't think of that. Now I look back at it, I wonder if they were covering <laughs> for something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you fell for the old I'm not really a ghost trick. Oh, it's the oldest one in the book. My yeah. God. Lamrit, so I'm you excited about this. Uh, I'm excited about this one today. Oh, yeah. This is, I mean, it's got Christopher Lee. So no matter how bad the script is, it's going to sound great. So, yeah. Quite that, that, that's the thing. He elevates quite a lot of crap. We were talking about just before we came on about. Uh, he was in a Halloween movie, Halloween 2, which has the great title, the subtitle of Your Sister is a Werewolf. <laughs> because <laughs> that's the plot, apparently. The <laughs> sister... it... <laughs> it's one of those ones where they recast everyone from the first film, and then whoever comes back gets very small roles, and then it ends up Christopher Lee's a werewolf hunter. And, uh... oh, I can't remember the name of the lady who stars as the werewolf queen, but she spends a lot of her time with her bappies out uh long story short he was in that film didn't really enjoy it much so when he got the role of gremlins 2 he went up to joe dante the director and personally apologized for being in howling 2 <laughs> because joe dante had made the original howling of course so that's i think he felt really guilty <laughs> oh what a nice fella bless yeah him. oh god right quickly just catch up the admin thank you to uh, the One Bobo, Kenneth Rufus UK, and Com Commissar Ludfang for doing subs. And Lamret, thank you for the cheer. They have just moved to Ipswich, which is a tragic situation. I hope you can get out as soon as possible. Yeah, condolences. Yeah, that's that's our hilarious Norwich versus Ipswich rivalry. <laughs> hey, it's so the funny. Yeah, the two cities. Oh wait, Ipswich isn't a city. Right then, <clears throat> let us have a look and see what we can get going with this bloody thing. Gravity Gunner says, uh, Christopher Lee, nice fellow with personal experience of stabbing people in the kidneys. True story. Yes. Oh, yeah. What is that story? That rings a bell. Yeah, he's in a, on the set of Lord of the Rings and somebody gets stabbed in the back and he's like, no, no, no. It doesn't sound like that. Because <laughs> wasn't it like he was a spy or something or he worked within the military for a little while and so that's yeah. why? Because I think he was related, wasn't he, in some respect to Ian Fleming? Oh, I didn't know that. I think so. I think it was like a distant relative, but it was one of the reasons why he was so keen to appear in a Bond film, and he did, and it was Man with a Golden Gun. Ah. I'm surprised it... all this Christopher Lee knowledge is pouring out of me tonight. I don't know where it's <laughs> come from. Yeah. Yeah, actual Nazi hunter, as mentioned in the comments. There. That's oh. right, yeah. He's like, he, you know when people say, oh, we led a life. Did he? Did he lead a life compared to Christopher Lee? <laughs> did your dad li live a life? As compared, or even Brian Bre Blessed, the guy who went boxing with the Dalai Lama and all these kind of things. <laughs> boxing with the Dalai? That's not what you do with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> what he did. Apparently, they had a nice, gentle bit of manly fisticuffs. How could anybody fight Brian Blessed and live? I, I'm not sure. I, See, I in feel my like that's head, instant though, death. 
in my head, I'm imagining that fight more like the wrestling match from The Lovers or The Devils. The Devils. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I need to rewatch The Devils, actually. My dad gave me a copy the other day. He's like, it's a great the film, The Devils. Really good film. Uh-huh. Based on a true story, loosely as well. The, 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 oh, I can't remember. It's based on what, something that happened in a French town in like the 1600s. And basically, it's about a, uh, a, a, a very randy uh, vicar or bishop or reverend, whatever the French have, and how uh, that led to basically him on trial in a kind of witch trial type way. Bloody hell. I'm very vague in the details that. at the moment. Need to rewatch that and Ken Russell's Gothic, which I haven't seen for like 30 years or something. Oh, uh, yeah. Gothic's also very good as well. Oh, yeah. I want fancy watching that. Also, there's a film I've been wanting to see for a while. I can't remember if it's any good. It stars, I think it's John Hurt. Is it Beyond Frankenstein or Frankenstein Beyond? Ooh. Do you remember that? No, I don't. It's like an 80s or early 90s thing. And I remember it being like, I think it came out just before or just after Bram Stoker's Dracula. And the whole gist of it was it was like super sexual, almost reanimator kind of narrative. It sets in the past and in the future. And I'm vague about it, but I remember it being quite a gonzo film. Ah, that's in. I might have to make a note of that. John yeah, Hunt. I think it's called Beyond Frankenstein or Frankenstein Beyond. I could actually look it up now if I wanted to, because that's what the internet's for, isn't it? It's for ruining all pub conversations. Yes, and people's lives. Yeah. Beyond Frankenstein, John Hurt. There we are. We'll look into that. It'd be nice if I could have watched Gothic again before Halloween, actually. It feels like that would have fit, mm. but. Ah, uh, there oh, we Oh, well. Are. How is your new arm doing now, Paul? Uh, my arm is fine. I'm getting the tattoo that was on it removed, uh, mainly because I just don't like having prison tattoos on my body. So, uh, for those people who do listen to the podcast, yeah, that's the <laughs> in law story now of my arm. <laughs> oh, Lewis Mitchell, thank you there. Um,. Good stuff. And also, thank you for showing the Polybius teaser with Eli yesterday. Great oh, stuff. no, it was very exciting, actually. It was it was fun because, um, the thing, you know, like, because you've worked with Eli now in a professional capacity. Mm. You know how, like, sometimes getting him to, how do I put this delightly, de- delicately? It's like, you know, like, getting him to do anything professional is like put, getting blood from a stone. Yes. And so <laughs> there's a part of me where I'm like, go on, there's a little tra- trailer. Pimp at Eli, and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, go on. And you just say, come on, mate, you can't walk the red carpet and have that attitude. <laughs> you know? That is that is very Eli, though, isn't it? It, it, it <laughs> yeah. takes a while to turn it on sometimes, yeah. I can imagine how hard it must have been for you to get him to do that, uh, you know, uh, download now, blah, 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 that little bit at the end you have him do with the jumper. I was very pleased to say I was not involved in that. Obviously, I did mine, Ooh. but then I left and just, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Riyadh, this one's on you, mate. <laughs> yeah, you left him holding the bag of poop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he did a good job, and he turned he up did. every day at the right time, which was the main that, that, thing. That's more than I get, mate, so well done. <laughs> yeah. We were genuinely worried at one stage. It's like, but hang on. If Eli isn't here at exactly the same time as Paul every day, how will we know he'll arrive? Yeah. Isn't Paul like officially his handler? Doesn't he have him on a leash? You know? It's more like a nanny. It's more like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My God, that's an image. <clears throat> Dear me. Right then. <clears throat> Just before we begin, Satanic Pork Seed has asked something I actually want to ask you anyway. Have you watched any of Truth Seekers on Amazon yet? I, I haven't for two reasons. One, uh, I just haven't had the time, and usually when I turn off at the end of the day, it's just with music. Second, I'm bitter because I, about five years ago, <laughs> this is where the bitterness comes out. About five years ago, I was pitching basically the exact same idea to all these comedy companies and stuff like that, and they all said they liked the script, but they needed talent attached. And because I wasn't doing stand up and this, that, and the other, it didn't get very far. And every time I approached them, the name was, but they would say, "If you get Simon Pegg involved, that would really help us sell the concept." So when it got released and they, they, they announced it, I was like, oh, fuck off. So out of bitterness, I'm staying away for a while until the buzz dies down. Uh, do you know, I, f- I feel vaguely similar, even though I only pitched something quite similar once to one company behind the scenes. So there's like absolutely no chance that anybody else saw it virtually. But it had a really similar title. It's totally coincidental. But, oh, uh... yeah, because it, it, it's not like the most original idea in the world. But what was interesting is that at the time... People were basically, all the companies were saying, we can't sell supernatural comedy. It doesn't work as a sitcom form. It hasn't worked in a while. It's really a hard sell. So that's why they needed Star Attached, basically, to, to get the idea through a door. It's always the same. Whatever you pitch, um, whoever is the um, 
you know, popular talent of the week is the one that always say, oh, could we get so-and-so involved? You know, mm. it was Vernon Kay. Every, Vernon Kay had to be in everything for a while. Then it moved on to Jack Whitehall. I don't know where we are at the yeah. moment. Uh, Jamelia always come up in conversations I had with friends uh, when they were talking about the stuff they'd pitched. A friend of mine pitched a, a, a panel show kind of thing, and every discussion he had with every single production company said, we were thinking Jamelia would be good on this. And like, she, her agent must be amazing to name drop her in all these conversations. <laughs> yeah, bloody hell, yeah. That's, yeah. that's like top-tier agent stuff, isn't it? Just the name is on every commissioner's lips constantly. Bloody hell. Yeah. And to be fair, the, the version of the idea I had wasn't like that. That was much more kind of... It, theirs is much more kind of dramatic and exciting. Mine was more like fools and horses. It was like, you know, low rent, bargain basement, living out of a kind of caravan and a park kind of thing. It was more grubby, as you can imagine, um, is my want. Yeah. Mine was more creepy and less comedic I suppose there were comedic elements but there was like an overarching sort of more serious story to it. but we never did much work on the idea to be honest with you so well I hope Simon Pegg has a very successful run with this show uh, because then it means someone might listen to my pitches again and <laughs> we'll see yes, how it goes <laughs> that, that would be nice yeah but anyway it's, it's probably good but neither of us have seen it there's the answer to your not question yet. <laughs> not yet in time yeah Doc Sigma thank you for doing a sub there right then <clears throat> Shall we go over to the ancient installation of Windows XP and look at spooky, spooky ghosts? Ooh, there we are. It's come up now. It's slightly zoomed in, just a little bit of technical stuff for the people at home, because uh, for some reason the CD-ROM doesn't seem to use most of the screen. So I thought I didn't want to leave massive areas unused. Hmm. So I like the uh, icon. It's pretty good. They made an effort. Yeah. Well, although they could have put a picture of a ghost in it rather than a skull, just you know, that, for that's consistency actually sake. a very good point. Oh, I mean, logo. oh shit, no sound. That's not good. Oh no, there wasn't sound in this bit. I did test it. Right. Good God, well, this is kinetic, so... isn't it? I know, but they must have been so impressed with this when they put it together. Hello, I'm Hello. Christopher Lee. Welcome Hello. to Ghosts. <gasps> Thanks, Christopher Lee. Oh, Thanks, now Christopher we're talking. Lee. Yeah. <laughs> music the the audio is of worryingly low quality i have been warned of this in a also, kind of compressed way yes big yeah. time compressed way also uh there is one puzzle in it i am told literally one puzzle that's better than a load of shit puzzles that's exactly what i was thinking yeah, yeah absolutely unless this is one shit puzzle <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Lee as Dr. Marcus Grimalkin. Why did he just introduce himself as Christopher Lee then? Maybe because if he said, hello, I'm Dr. something, or they might confuse people. Yeah. I like the music. Dr. Susan Blackwell, a parapsychologist. It's interesting to say starring when all these people are real and basically playing themselves. Yeah. Urkan, the reason it's compressed on the CD is because computers weren't powerful enough to just play high-res data off a CD. It had to yeah. be horribly compressed. Oh. These are the heady days of 1995 where even having music like this was a, a, an act of God. Yeah. What? What? Has what? it crashed? I don't know. I'm just going to click and see what happens. Not responding, maybe... it says. Oh, God, I think it has oh, crashed. No. Oh, no, it's ah. good. We're back. We're back in the room. Tony Cornell, investigator. Morris Gross, poltergeist investigator. He's a more specific one. Well, Mor Morris Gross specifically is from the Enfield poltergeist case. Oh, shit. That is, that, that's why anyone knows his name from that story. Father John Nuttall, a Catholic priest, known for Bible Fanfield tragedy. Mm. Robin Furman, ghost hunter. Quite a lot of priest ghost hunters, I've realised. Yeah, it sort of does seem to be a thing, doesn't it? Ah, this is now the people who made it. Right, I'm going to click the button. Boop. Oh. Right, there's a door. That's good. Good start. I think we can only go forward and look at the creepy knocker. Oi, oi. Oh, Should fuck. have started with a much more of an establishing shot of the house itself. That would have been more it's, interesting. I yeah, think, now we know. don't know what the house is like. How big is no. it? No. What's going on? It's Peter Popoff starring in this. God, I hope not, <laughs> Richard. My show, sorry. So that's just a zoom in on the spare. Okay. Oh God! Oh, what's... what happened there? I don't Did know. Click the button down. Yeah, and it's zom zoomed off to the it zombed off, zombied off, <laughs> zombed to the uh... zom zom. 
to the doorknob. Let's click on it. Oh, fuck. Welcome to ah. Hobbs Manor, my friend. Please excuse me for calling you out at such a late hour. I trust you had a pleasant journey. Mark my words, you have an eventful time ahead of you. Allow me to introduce myself properly. My name is Dr. Marcus Grimalkin, and I have devoted my life to the study of the paranormal. It is time for me to decide once and for all whether ghosts are reality or fiction. I hope that you can help me to make this decision. My visit to Hobbs Manor, a house that is world famous for its ghostly activities, is the climax of my life's work. I came here to gather the evidence around me, the documents, films and records that I have painstakingly collected over the years. Make use of the research material that you will find inside the house. You will have to look carefully for it, as objects in this house appear to gain a life of their own. Use my findings to make your own decisions. If you join me on my quest, you may be rewarded with great knowledge, but be warned, you may not like everything that you find. Thank you. Where was and then he? he got his coat and went, you can put the money in the post tomorrow. <laughs> I stormed out. <laughs> <laughs> Where was he? He was like out of the frame. Is he like a little elf who follows you around or something? I'm quite confused. I'm not gonna, I, I, I don't know for sure, but my guess is he's a ghost. This is going to be a sixth sense thing. Oh, God. Make up your mind as if ghosts are real. Oh, turns out I'm a ghost. Ma, 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 I am ma. proof. Proof That's positive nice. of everything. I don't know why... He was so keen to say, tonight I must reach the climax of my discoveries. It's like, wh why is there a ticking clock, he should have said. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a the really script... good point, actually. <laughs> well, to be fair, the script is full of what you'd expect the character to say. Hello, dear friend. Welcome. Sorry to call you out this night. Anyway, have a look around me house. Bye. See ya. <laughs> I hope he pops up again and tells us the ghost stories, because that will make things a lot more That fun. would be nice. Yeah. So I'm going to assume it's all a bit seventh guesty. Um, I'm going to assume we just Matthew East eighty two. Thank you. Uh, we just wander around the house much like we did in Weird, and it's yeah. just all ghosts. Oh yeah! Oh look! Oh look! Oh look! Mask, the Jim Carrey film. Uh, <laughs> is a is that a secret garden painting? Something like that? No, it's just a photo. It's something. a man. It's a what, man's face. What should we begin with? Shall we start with the secret garden? Yeah, Seems let's go in this. Yeah. I like the idea. Of oh, wait, oh. there's some dude in it now. Was there a garden before? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then. Okay. Should you see a portrait fall from a wall, look carefully at the subject of the painting. This unfortunate person may soon be dead. Huh? Was that I'll a threat? <laughs> <laughs> so. That little look at the end was almost like him going, did I read that right? <laughs> yeah, gonna, what a load of bullshit. But I can get away with it. Because I am Christopher Lee. Um, so, so the painting, when you click on it, changes then, I take it, to reveal a picture of a person who now has a ghost story attached. I just click on it again. Yeah. Should you see a portrait for... Oh, no. no. That was it. I guess this is the tutorial painting we heard so much about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so look, look in the pot. Oh, it's a glove. Oh, you can't. Oh, it's not anything. But that little, is that a glove or a leg? I, oh, it it's looks like a glove. Thing. But it's a... Okay, so this isn't like weird in that everything has a story. This might have items that aren't a story. I guess so. I think they're just really proud of that pot. Yeah. Look at the pot. Look at the pot. Look at and our look pot. At look at we our pot. We bought it from a 3D stock art. Oh, hang on. What's this arrow here? Oh, ho! Oh, yeah. Oh, glass. Oh, you can't do anything except look down. Oh. So you can look up and inspect the broken window panes that look out into the negative space of outside reality. Also, why hasn't he had those fixed? Hmm. Right. Unless, actually, they're not broken panes of glass. They're cardboard black sheets he's pinned to the glass. <laughs> they're beer mats. <laughs> so when someone stands at a particular angle on a particular time of the day and the sun comes through, it looks like they've got a big black square on their face and he laughs. <laughs> Manoeuvres it around like in Father Ted so it looks like they've got a little hint. <laughs> yeah. That's not what a Nazi hunter means. You can't make up your own Nazi. Solid oh. WTF2 says, I want to play Noel's, Noel Edmonds 
a ghost house party. You know what? I'd actually Ooh. like to see that. But I think the all the house he already has is more terrifying than any haunted house we could fathom. I don't know anything about Noel's house, and I'm genuinely scared to learn. Mm. Right. Is, is this a mirror? Is it another door? Is it a? No, that's a mirror and a and a coat rack or something. Yeah. Well, you can't click on it again. Look, it's not anything. Do you think it's one of these things oh. where maybe later on there's stuff there, and this is easier just holding pattern images until something appears? I think it just you can look at everything, but not everything has a story. Would be my guess. Yeah, oh. could be right. I hope not. You have to go around the house forty times or something. Otherwise, this is just an addition of changing rooms. <laughs> this horribly textured pot where it's all distorted on a lower bit. Nothing as well. The, right, the mask. Yeah, the mask Come is on. something. It's got to be, isn't it? That's it. As you walk around Hobbs Manor, you will almost certainly find some portraits and films of experts like myself in the field of the paranormal. Tony Cornell has over 30 years experience in the field of paranormal study and investigation. He has developed a sophisticated ghost detecting machine called Spider, which travels with him to the hundreds of ghostly locations that he investigates. Dr. Susan Blackmore is a senior lecturer at the University of the West of England. She has a doctorate in parapsychology and has written widely on the subject. She was awarded the Distinguished Skeptics Award in California mm. in 1991 and has been involved in the production of many television programs on the paranormal. Robin Furman is a trained psychologist and expert in the field of the paranormal. He founded Ghostbusters UK in 1984 and How did he not get sued for that? Hundreds of hauntings. <laughs> Father John Nuttall is a Roman Catholic priest who preaches in the county of Surrey. He is fascinated by the subject of ghosts and has helped members of his parish in the past who have experienced hauntings. Thanks, Christopher. So, yeah, this is the tutorial room. This is the tutorial yeah. hallway. Tutorial hallway. The, um... I've noticed that when he appears in front, they couldn't do like alpha channels or something because there's no transparency. They have actually had to render the background here. And you can see it oh, really? <laughs> Macho Fantastico. Thank you for the sub there. Right. Uh, let's have a look at this, I suppose. Shall we clear out this area, then go through yeah. the doors? Yeah. And then look at the... Is that Robert Redford in the paintings on the top? It looks like from the distance, we've got Robert Redford in the top left. We've got uh, Il Medio Estevez in the top right. Uh, that's Rick Moramis bottom left. It could and be Wayne I... from Wayne's World, as somebody in chat pointed out. It is, and then on the right, it's the guy from the office, Kevin. <laughs> My God, the... Ryo Kazuki says, remember that time Noel did a Mr. Blobby gotcha on Hudson and Hall? Then one of them died shortly after filming, but before the show aired. Noel got the surviving one out to watch the whole thing, then he killed himself shortly after. What? What? Who's Hudson and Hall? I don't know. I've never heard of that. That's the most bizarre. I have story. never heard of this story. Unless it's, this is... I'm... Now I've got to do the research. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very bizarre thing. I hope that that's not true because it's awful. But I imagine it is because that's a really weird thing to make up. Oh, the yeah. two chefs from New Zealand. Oh. Right, hang on. Let me have a look. Noel Edmonds. He's got blood on his hands everywhere he goes. And no, there's no cheap show curse. Why would a cult podcast with a reasonably small listenership compared to some of the mega podcasts have such an influence on the galaxy and the universe and, and life itself that we can pick off specifically light entertainers we do bad impressions of? It's not a thing. Although I'm still worried trend. by the curse of Barshans because that, that was... We had two or three times. If you mentioned somebody obscure or you hadn't heard of for ages, they either died or turned up while we were filming the next time. Yeah, like, it's just, oh, uh, I don't know. I think either the curse passed from Barshans to us, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's directly involved in me. That's it's the Ganon curse. This mm. is the answer. Right. <laughs> Can we click on the carpet? Is the carpet a thing? Yes. Oh, please have a ghost story about a carpet. I couldn't yes. help but notice that you were admiring the splendid carpet. Mr. Montague, a previous occupant, brought it back from a world cruise alongside many other treasures. He was a well-travelled man, both in this world and in others. This house has a strange history. Many people have lived here, but none have stayed for very long. It is constructed not just from bricks and mortar, 
but from mysteries and legends. Some say the spirits of the dead walk its rooms and hallways. You may be one of the chosen few who feel their presence. Never make your house out of mysteries. No, no never do that. You can't get planning permission for that. Okay, let's. I want to see the uh, the exciting lamp that looks like a big blob. Oh, you can't. Can't click on that. Oh, Easter Island? No. No, they're just there for show. Fair enough. Plenty a lot of that, isn't there? Yeah. Obviously, the deep sea diver helmet's got to be something. Let's do the table. Oh, look, there's a big box of stuff and the same lamp. That's the true um, mystery of the house. How there's so many lamps that are identical. Do you think they all went to Ikea and fitted out with Geflurpel or something like that? <laughs> and this is where they keep all the manuals <laughs> for them. <laughs> the receipts. Oh, right. Oh, oh, look. Oh, my God. Look, old VHS tape. Oh, wow. Ghosts and spirits oh. in religion. Oh, no. Now that's Mr. Nuttall. That's Father James Nuttall, or whatever his name is. Right, let's let's check him first. Father John Nuttall is a Roman Catholic priest who preaches in the county of Surrey. His fast oh, this is exactly what Christopher Lee said earlier. Do you think night. Christopher Lee went around, had to play the game to write the <laughs> script? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where is my script? Uh, well, actually, uh. we didn't write it down. It's just in the game. You'll have to play this CD-ROM and read it out. Fine. Right. Yes. Ghosts and spirits in religion. I mean, the answer is Ooh. it's everything to do with religion because that's the whole thing, isn't it? it? Well, yes. Why has Jesus got a sword in his ear? There's better ways of getting the wax out, mate. Crikey. He's doing one of his tricks, isn't he? Oh, deep reference. Commissar Ludfang says, did he buy Tutankhamun's vacuum cleaner too? Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Oh dear. Any more Uncle Derek asked Steve. There is, Craig. there is. Once the problem is that we want to do it with Stuart, obviously in the studio. So we'll wait until lockdown ends and we're all happy to meet up in a space in space. And then we've got hopefully one last story to get through. I say one last story, I mean one last one that we could actually listen to because the quality on some of them are awful. Oh Do you you know I could potentially ask our audio engineer from the movies, the BAFTA award-winning, multi-BAFTA award-winning Jules Woods, maybe if he would have a, see if he could clean up a couple of them if you're stuck. All right, then. Well, then I'll, I'll get in touch with a... Uh, I'll, I'll sort out getting the audio, because I have them on a laptop, and I think it's on an old laptop now, so I'll, I'll look for them. And uh, I'll, I think there's only two or three left anyway. One is unusable, one is okay, and one is the one that is brilliant but has no ending, apparently. Or the recording has no ending, but the guy know what the ending is we can all guess it ah well that sounds fun in itself i think that'll be fun yeah. i mean i can't promise he'll have enough time he might just tell me to piss off and shoot me with a gun but that seems yeah. unlikely because he's a nice guy so yeah well even nice guys have guns <laughs> even nice guys have guns <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a sort of adam driver <laughs> film that's straight to netflix or something <laughs> right okay let's what, what should we do Let, let's look at the tape first it's got to play some video yeah we? Oh, yeah, here we are. Oh, look, you actually click on the quit. That's interesting. Okay. Oh, that is nice. Father John Nuttall, tell me, man, what processes does the church go through to help someone who is disturbed by a haunting? Well, the first stage would be, I think, actually to talk with them. Good. Um, we need to ascertain whether some people are actually, this is putting it gently, some people are actually more prone to spiritual phenomena than than others. Some people, for example, are constantly seeing visions. I've never actually seen a ghost um, myself, but I certainly wouldn't dismiss the idea um, of there being um, such things, obviously. So the first thing is really just to ascertain um, what is actually happening within the house, and then, or, you know, wherever it's taking place, and thereafter then just to offer them um, a, a kind of stepped service almost. We wouldn't call in um, the bouncers, as it were, straight away. Um, it'd be something quite gentle. Bounces. If that wasn't working, then there's a sitcom script. Write it down. The next stage, and then the third stage would be when um, we really felt there was just an overwhelming um, presence, and probably a presence of evil that we'd actually have to call in specifically. Uh, a man, a priest, who is actually designated by the bishop within the area, um, perhaps of the diocese, who could actually, and is authorised to, to tackle that. Blimey. 
Mm. I was going to say, how do they though. discern evil? I, I suppose they just look at their Twitter history and see who they follow and that kind of stuff. That'll give you a good there was, idea. A, there was an interesting story in, oh, I can't remember if it was the BBC website or something, but online anyway, recently saying that during lockdown, the number of possessions and exorcisms the church had been, uh, have been having to do has, has increased over this time period. And it's fascinating because a few years ago, and I always recommend this book all the time, I always bring it up, but Will Storr versus the Supernatural. There's a whole chapter where he talks about uh, exorcisms and how uh, people are trained to do it. And there are st the, the Vatican still teaches it, although the class numbers have been growing year by year because of everything, because of the way the world is, because everyone watches these shows, because more people believe they're being haunted and things like that. And Will Storr in the book says he remembers going down this corridor in the Vatican, which is, you know, opulent and gold framed paintings and stuff like that, taking a left, going down a corridor. And he said he walked into what was effectively like an NHS ward and like they had a bed there with like straps. And, like this would be one of our exorcism rooms where we bring people. And he goes, it's just so clinical and cold. It's just, a, it's just a very strange thing, I think, when it comes to religion and how the religious deal with supernatural stories. Blimey. That's, uh, well, just going to hope they're not just rounding up mentally ill people and attempting to cure them with nonsense, which is... Well, yeah, well, they do say when they have these lectures that they take that <clears throat> one of the things that these, you know, bishops or exorcists and training are told is that you have to now go through this checklist and make sure they're not mentally ill in any way and if so then they are legally bound to get proper authorities in and they have to step back but then you're putting a psycho you know a, an analysis in the hands of someone who isn't trained to give that analysis yeah oh now we've got to ask what the point of performing an exorcism is <laughs> it's gonna yeah, be for good films yeah yeah a very good film the original mm. uh what ho snorkers thank you very much for doing a sub i hope you're well my friend hope to see you in the non too distant future and duncan 80 thank you for doing a sub as well right okay what is the point of performing an exorcism and Starbearer, thank you for doing a sub um i really hope the answer isn't just this is laughing it <laughs> something to do yeah. this is quite a different area to to ghosts we're talking about a rite of an exorcism, which is more to do with the presence of evil. And really, the, the, the point of doing an exorcism is actually to, to make sure that that very presence of evil is actually driven out, whatever form it may actually appear in. Um, so a little bit more radical than the way that we would actually treat with ghosts themselves. Uh, perhaps I ought to point out as well that not everybody is actually permitted to do an exorcism. It's regarded as such a serious matter that a bishop in the diocese would actually appoint um, a man, normally a priest, um, to actually do the exorcism. It has to be, I actually talked with an exorcist a few years ago, it has to be somebody who is incredibly holy because apparently part way during the, the actual rite which again i haven't witnessed myself um the demon as it comes out of whatever it's in is liable to shout the sins out of the man who's performing the exorcism so one has to be terribly careful that one doesn't sort of trip into this lightly otherwise all one's uh, faults and sins are going to be broadcast uh, around the place i know what you did to that dog <laughs> <laughs> you said you were going to tickle it, but you kicked it up the arse. <laughs> oh, you dirty bugger. Uh, <laughs> that, isn't that what they bring up in the Exorcist movie as well? That actually happens towards the end, doesn't it? Yes. The demon starts bringing out uh, you know, all the sins that those two guys had done. And then leaps into uh, Father Karras, yeah. Brother yeah. Captain Birdseye, a year sub of subs. Thank you very much. We salute thee. The point of performing an exorcism is to allow people to put stupid sound effects over levitating children. <laughs> uh, that's a, yes. <laughs> he was editing something interesting, earlier. There's an interesting uh, side story to this in that he mentions a few times, and I'm not going to put like a lot of blame on, on this guy and his opinions, but it's more like, how, what do you judge as evil? And different religions and different countries and different cultures see evil in different ways. So you're looking at it and from, you know, a dogmatic point of view is that they see evil by what's written in the scriptures. But does, it's, it's, it's such a tricky thing to quantify, I think, what is evil? And I tend to find, or I tend to think that when the ideas, the concepts of 
uh, demons were invented for the purposes of writing the Bible and all of that shit that the Catholics went later crazy on. It just feels like sometimes it's a get out clause for some of the exorcisms that they have done because then it's all gut feelings rather than psycho evaluation. Mm. It's, yeah. It's a funny subject, really, isn't it? It is this whole thing of define us some evil, then. Is it just people who aren't you? Is it people who do a certain thing? Exactly. The, again, going back to that Will Store book, there's a bit where, uh, again, I try and compress it, but basically he, he watches this video of this kid who's meant to be possessed by a devil and this demonologist who's with him. And demonologists are people I don't particularly agree with. One or two are nice chaps, I'm sure. Um, but he was saying, oh, look at this. This is a definite possession. And all Will Storr said he saw was like child abuse. And he said, what you want to do is rid, rid yourself of this case completely and get authorities involved. Mm. It's the old thing, isn't it, of um, the, the priest steps into the room, says, I will now remove the evil from this place and then leaves. Mm. You know. Oh, good God. Somebody pointing out that Max von Sydow was only 43 when he starred in The Exorcist. That always throws me, that one. Yeah, it's crazy. Bloody hell. Younger than I am. Well, same age. Right. People are mentioning The Exorcist 3, which always disappoints me, because uh, I watched it earlier this year, and it was pretty bad, and I couldn't understand what people saw in it. Turns out I had watched the director's cut, which is nowhere near as good as the original theatrical cut. Oh, weird. <laughs> yeah. Because I'd imagine the director's cut pretty much gets rid of the exorcism part of the film, well, doesn't it? The t I yeah kind of and some bits just went on crazy too long there's a really amazing scene with brad dorif but it outstays its welcome by a ridiculous amount of time it's all to do with that oh, yeah. but it was directed by friedkin i believe who wrote the uh the book it's based on yeah the, uh, oh, hang on, uh, i've got my heretic. names mixed up no heretic uh, is the second one. Third oh, that's is right heretic yeah. the second Legion, one is yeah, dreadful yeah. absolutely oh, dreadful and yeah. so is both prequels that they made at the same time remember that when they made two ha uh, exorcist prequels at the same time that was the weirdest thing, wasn't it? I remember seeing like the trailer for both and thinking, hey, th is this the same film? Because it looks completely different. <laughs> <laughs> it was basically the Snyder cut of its time because the film was made by Paul Schrader, you know, who wrote uh, Taxi Driver. And uh, it, people basically said it's crap because it wasn't scary and it was too cerebral and it was too drama. So they went, we're scrapping this. Rennie Harlan, who made Cliffhanger and Die Hard 2, you're now making an exorcist film and he made whatever the fuck that was but off the basis of that flaw warner i think it was whoever owns the film basically went oh well we've got this film anyway let's just put it out as an apology and just <laughs> threw it out there into the into the ether <laughs> sorry everyone here's another film my god uh, Blood Relnex says, I'm sure a demonologist can still not actually believe in demons, right? It's just an expert about demon law, yes? Yeah, maybe that's mm. what I'm saying. I think there are different types of demonologists. Those who are like that and just study it and, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And then there are people like Fred Bat on Most Haunted, who in the middle of a haunting will just suddenly start chanting Latin to try and create a demon in the middle of a room. And it's just like... If, even if demons are real, that's reckless behaviour, you attention-seeking old fart. Sir, this is a Wendy's. Yeah. I mean, it's just no need for you, <laughs> Oh, General Zakimson says, I love Friedkin's work. Sorcerer is my favourite movie. Yes. Oh, Sorcerer is great. It bloody, I hadn't seen it till last year. Um, it's a bloody fantastic film. It really is. Yeah, it's kind of like Speed, but if the, if the plot was on its head. Yeah. Also, terrible title. It really doesn't give you any idea of the film whatsoever, no. does it? It's kind of a curse, that, in many respects. I think a lot of people didn't see it as a result of being confused by the title of it. Uh, yeah, totally get it. I had no idea what it was about. It's a it's truck. This, yeah, it's a source of the name of the truck. It is. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, I can't remember the name of the other truck in it now, but yeah. Right. What, what happens during an exorcism? Here we go. There are two basic formats for an exorcism. Power and TC. Quite frequently, where one is actually aware of something within all of us that's not quite right um, church calls that sin if you like but it, it's the same origin um, we're talking about the very presence of something which isn't good again if i could just illustrate that i mean this is quite a gentle um, little format where we would pray over an individual or a group of individuals and say uh, something like father of mercy you led the man born blind to the kingdom of light through the gift of faith in your son. Free these from false values that surround and blind them 
set them firmly in your truth, children of the light forever. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. That's more or less what I call an everyday um, situation, not that we use that every day. There is a second form, though, which is perhaps much, much more serious, and there we would eventually have to call in the designated man from the diocese who would be appointed by the bishop to, to actually do an exorcism. Now, I've never actually witnessed one, but I've spoken to an exorcist, and it normally has to be accompanied, in the case of the exorcist, um, by a lot of prayer and fasting, actually prior to the little ritual. Um, in the actual ritual itself, um, again, there is prayer, there's usually the laying on of hands to actually expel the presence of evil, devil, demon, whatever we would want to call it. And then, very often, nearly always, uh, a sprinkling with holy water. The tie there with the use of holy water is, is to baptism, when we were actually made, made children of, of, of God. So it would be, if you like, to install the presence of God within that individual and to cast out any, any possible manifestation of evil. Um, the only other little detail I think that probably needs to be added is that it can be, again I've gleaned this secondhand from the exorcist himself, can be quite a violent thing if, if the manifestation, the presence of evil is so strong. He said that having done this, which was done in a kind of an old-fashioned vestry with wrought iron windows or um, what have you round about the actual baptistry, he was actually hurled against um, the wrought iron. So it was, it was quite a, a force, if you like, as the devil came out of the individual. And he was quite severely bruised afterwards. So again, it's not something to trip into lightly. And again, it's why somebody has to be designated um, by the bishop to do that. Why does he keep oh. saying designated by the bishop as if that means something really amazing? It's just meant the bishop said he could do it. Yeah, but let's think of the TV series you pitched to Fox, Designated Exorcist. He didn't <laughs> want the job, but he got given the job. <laughs> God damn it. I That's just also wanted what he to was... sell my hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm suddenly getting rid of demons? It ain't my bag, baby. Uh, there's also that thing where he goes, oh, before they do an exorcism, you have to go through a whole bunch of, like, study and fasting. And I was thinking in my head, oh, wouldn't it be funny if um, it was like a, a montage in Rocky? And then I thought, actually, no. That was the film Repossessed, and in that film, it wasn't funny. So uh, that was a thought exercise. Oh, bloody hell. Um, I, I don't quite get this designated man thing, because it's not necessarily... Designated man thing. That's a DC Comics character. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, so it's not necessarily a priest. It's just somebody who's been pointed out by the bishop. The only thing for we know for certain, apparently, is it can't be a woman. Because it's designated yeah. man. That's it. Well, that, that's very old-fashioned thinking. I, I don't actually know if there have been. I can imagine they must have been a few female exorcists in their time. But you know what the church is like. Mm. Well, I've seen Father Ted, so that's probably close enough. Isn't it? True that. True that. Are ghosts evil in any way? <laughs> that, that, now they're asking the hard questions. Yeah, they are. No. Stop the video. <laughs> the simple definition of a disembodied uh, presence of somebody who died. We'd actually say a ghost is is no more or no less than just simply something which is non-physical, uh, non-material, can't actually touch. Although, again, some people have actually spoken to me of uh, almost like a spine-chilling experience of, of having felt somebody or something pass by them. Um, the, the hairs on their arms sort of stand up on end. Somebody actually described it. She felt that somebody had gone physically right through her and it was just chilling. Um, so I wouldn't say that ghosts are manifestations of, of evil. If we went one stage, if we took that as the, the bottom plateau, if we went one stage above that, we'd actually talk about poltergeists. A little bit more physical there. There you've got sort of things coming off uh, they wear hats and gloves. flying around mm. rooms and what have you. Show you. Again, the general definition is more of a mischievous spirit and not actually wishing evil to, um, to happen to, to the other individual. And the third and probably the most extreme case, we'd say, um, diametrically opposed to, to ghosts is 
where one would need to think about exorcism, a positive manifestation of something which was evil or which wished to cause harm to, to another individual. Bloody hell. I mean, he can talk, can't he? Although he never seems to say er or um or anything, so it's it's impressive. But uh... Yeah, he, he'd be great on just a minute. <laughs> I may have to start cutting him short if there's much more video footage of him. <laughs> it's going to go on for well, bloody ever. At least we're getting more money's worth as opposed to the last one where it was just someone going, yes, here's a story that you've just read the text of that <laughs> I'm now recounting you oh, again. God. Right, ghosts and spirits in religion. Jesus with his ear swords. Ear swords. Introduction. The majority of it. I know. Hang on. Yeah, you can export the text out of here. It also says "Book of Hauntings" picture, top and bottom. I don't know what that is. It's always great. Right now. I haven't discovered that. I Maybe something that pops up later. Yeah. When does it export it to? Just like a word document. Yeah, TXT file. I would have said. Oh. Majority of faiths that are practiced by the population of the planet, except that spirits or ghosts of some form or another exist. These spirits may be in the form of angels, demons, gods, devils, materializations of human emotions such as good, evil, and holiness. Great. There's going to be a lot of this, isn't there? There's yeah. a lot of this. The Holy, sp Holy it, Trinity in Christianity. It's pretty much what he said, to be fair. Just kind of a bit more passed out. Yeah. Angels... See, these, these sort of angels are rubbish. I want the old school angels, the Old Testament ones, where it's like a, a wheel of fucking eyes that's burning or something bizarre. Yeah, like that. fire coming out of their wings and a massive uh, bugle that they blow that ca causes the apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> the apocalypse. The apocalypse. that wrong. <laughs> apocalypse meow. <laughs> apocalypse meow. This one's just making soup out of people. Bloody rude. Right. What is that? He's got some scales. Yeah, weighing, up. Up weighing. Oh, this is a rapture, I think. Ah, so they're weighing up his sins. Yeah. So he had all those things you need. He had that big sausage. He had that cheese wheel <laughs> and <a> small demon. <laughs> that's cheating. There's a fucking demon on it pulling it down. Yeah, that's not fair. And look, there's another one there. A little guy hanging on to an angel, and she's saying, "Get off, get off." <sighs> the angels aren't cool. On. They're, they're like just cheating. What was that film with um? Paul Bettany, where he played the Archangel Gabriel, and it was a bit, it was a bit like um, every John Carpenter film ever, set in a diner. Do you remember that? What was it called? Oh, bloody hell. Um, I can see the cover of it. Um, yeah. I've never seen the film either. Um, oh, only Oliver Legion. Hart was there. Legion. Yeah, there thank you. you. Sata thank you, satanic pork seat. <laughs> Hang on, I've just got to speak to me more, man. God. Yeah. Hi, Mum. I'm on, I'm on the internet. You can't talk because you're being listened to by hundreds. I need to talk to you. Okay. Oh, I might need to speak to me more, so bear with me. Can you crack Certainly. on? Of course I can. We'll go through this. Bear I'll, with me. I'll uh, drop your sound out and we'll be back in a sec. All right. There we are. Why have I dropped Paul's sound out to the stream, but not to myself? Hang on. There we are. There we are. Good. So. Oh, hang on. Great Yarmouth has got some. Uh, they sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. From Ezekiel 115 there. See, that's good. That sounds like the angel of BMX or something, doesn't it? Ah, uh, astonishing. Captain Brother, says, uh, Captain Brother Bird's Eye says, There was a site called Rapture Ready, which showed you various mansions that you would get in heaven, depending on how good you were. <laughs> Can I have a blue one? No, I'm afraid you uh, weren't good enough. You'll have to make do with the standard grey. I'm enjoying this demon's one. There's old Beelzebub or whatever, Lord of the Flies. And there's just one having a shit on a toilet. I, I don't really... I, I'm not quite done. It looks a little bit like the demon of Rumpole of the Bailey or something. That's, uh... Okay, then. Now, here's an exorcism. Spewing out a ghost and being caught with a candle or something. All right, then. Saints! Which one is the saint? I'm guessing the one on the left. What do you guys think? Oh, that's the end of it. Oh, okay, then. How do we... Oh, there we are. Is there anything extra? Is that, yeah. No, it's literally just... You can jump to each chapter. 
Okay, then. Uh, well, I reckon we should click on this diving helmet, which is going to give us a Christopher Lee soundbite, I'm pretty sure. Yes. This diver's helmet belongs to Mr. Montague. He caught the bug for underwater exploration. Unfortunately, a rather large octopus caught him. What's that got to do with bloody ghosts? Bloke went deep sea diving. Octopus got him. There we are. Oh, did that devil have a face on his crotch? Right, got to go back and look now. You can't let a face crotch pass up. That's in uh, Twitch's terms of service. Uh, not that I can see. Some, uh, that is like a classic image, isn't it? It's using ghouls and ghosts. But, uh... Ah, there we are. Yes, you are correct. It's a crotch face. Yay. Right. There's nothing else in this room, so I suppose we should... Oh, hang on. Hang on, there is something else. We didn't go this side, did we? Uh, we saw the stupid painting. Ooh. Spooky plant pot with nothing... Oh, that's rubbish. Right. It looks like it's just this guy's photo. It was on a, a Sunday morning, very warm, very hot, about 11 o'clock in the morning, and the group of people I was with went off for a walk, and I decided that... Um, I was going to play the trumpet. I was outside, I think I was playing Summertime or something like that, and quite suddenly I was terrified. I mean, I really was absolutely petrified. I was cold, I had shivers down my back. I was so <laughs> scared, I ran into the house. And I didn't know why I was scared, I just was. What I realised was, when I stopped playing, there was no sound at all, nothing. No birds, no pigeons, the trees weren't moving, none of the trees. Now, in a forest, the chance of trees not being moved by wind is almost nil, but nothing was moving. There was no sound at all. That night, when I was in bed, I don't know what time it was, maybe three or four o'clock in the morning, it was quite late, and I woke up, and again, I was absolutely terrified, and I couldn't breathe this time. I mean, I really couldn't breathe. I was... Uh, 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 and that was it. But I was, there was definitely something was getting at me that day. This, the, the, the two incidents just couldn't, especially the still trees. I mean, that's the thing. Still trees and no birds singing in a forest. But it was, it was well, it's, well, if that wasn't being haunted, I don't know what was. I mean, it's really, really quite a serious thing, which I'll never forget. But that's a panic attack, mate. It sounds like you were blowing your trumpet and either knocked your ears out or just scared all the animals off and there was no wind. And then later you had sort of an anxiety problem. What? I, that's very... Why would you pick that person and that story? Very odd. Also, why is there a really specific photo of him but no name? My God. Also, what the fuck is going on? Like, oh, everyone went for a walk, but I thought I'd stay back and play my trumpet outside. What? Was it a military funeral? What? I don't know. I don't know. Right, we're not going to go upstairs yet. Well, there's two doors here. Oh, God, there's going to be a basement, isn't there? That's, what is that, the living room? Dining room? Are you sure you want to leave the house now? No, that's not what I meant. No. Thank you. Um, let's go through this door. Ooh, it is the... The... the Drawing room? I don't really know. What's by the door? Oh, a couple of new ghost stories. Right, look forward to that. I went saw a potato. It's a bit funny shape. That's not a ghost or what is. Stuart, if you can hear me, just Hello. a quick message. Uh, just a quick thing. Sorry, uh, basically... That is no worries, mate. I hope everything is okay. Ah, Mr. Gannon apologises, but he must rush off and deal with a temporary emergency. So, we are going to save this here and possibly do something else for a while. I kind of want to hear another couple of ghost stories, though. So, uh, I might be clicking on these. Also, I really need to click on that television. 
because something interesting is going to happen, isn't it? They're going to have like a television ghost story or a mocked up program or something. Okay. I can feel it. I can feel it. Well, let's see what this one does first. I hope the frame goes on neon again. Why did I have to click three times? As I looked up on the top right hand side window there, there was what I thought was a face, you know, somebody looking out and those rooms aren't actually used anymore because, you know, they're, they're rotten, completely rotten. Um, it looked like a, it looked like a child. It looked like a, you know, just a, a little boy. It was so quick. It was just as, you know, it was like a blink. It was just like a, I just don't know. I just don't know. It just looked like a, a little boy. When other things do hap uh, happen here, um, it's the room upstairs, it contains all the cleaning things that we have in the shop, which is the overstock. Normally, uh, things are sort of ruxed about, you know, thrown on the floor. Like we have big uh, one kilogram tubs of swarf eager. Um, we had five of those broken in different places on the floor upstairs. Uh, and that was overnight, when we, uh, and everything's locked up obviously when we go to work so nobody could have possibly gone in there like last year we, I was getting some garden furniture and there was somebody walking about upstairs and I needed some help and I called out and there was nobody there and it sort of stopped and when um, I went back out there the, there was somebody pacing about upstairs again so I ran upstairs and there was nobody there there's nobody in the room so somebody thought he saw a face for a fraction of a second Somebody's nicked all his Swarfiga, and he heard some noises once. Not entirely convinced by that one, I'm going to be honest. Come on, my lady, give us a quality ghost story. When she was about 13, she came down to breakfast one morning and said that she had seen a Roman in a toga in her bedroom. And I thought, oh yes, that sounds a bit far-fetched, a teenage fantasy. But Debbie, later on that day, went out in the garden and was playing and came in with a small coin in her hand, which turned out to be a Roman coin with the head of Septimus Severus on it. So I was quite excited by this because it was quite unusual. And uh, so soon after seeing this Roman in her room, about three months later, she had the same experience and saw the same gentleman in her bedroom and she found the second coin on the site and soon afterwards she saw him again and found the third coin on the site. Now all the coins had the same head, the head of Septimus Severus on them. Um, once was unusual, twice was coincidence, three times was a bit more than um, coincidence. And although I've never um, experienced or seen Septimus Severus there at all, we do have funny things happen in the house, like the curtains have been taken down, all sorts of odd things of that nature. And um, I believe that Debbie <laughs> saw him because she happens to be susceptible to these things. Susceptible to the Romans. Um, <laughs> hang on. So they keep seeing somebody in a toga, but the curtains keep disappearing. <laughs> It's somebody nicking their curtains and wearing them as togas. <laughs> uh, so two other points here. One is I like the way that um, they immediately assume it's the Roman emperor on the coins. It's, it's not just like somebody who could have been in the empire or anything. And two, aren't these weirdly fragmented? They've just kind of edited in a point um, when, with no setup whatsoever. It starts off... Well, how did it start? When she was about 13. Who? <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> right. Can we look out the window? Yeah. No. No, we can't. That's boring. I really want to see this. Oh, here Local we go. vet Keith Michael has assured us that the cat will make a full recovery. And finally, tonight's special report investigates a real life haunting. The residents of this 300 year old house, set deep in the countryside of West Yorkshire, England, have been experiencing strange phenomena. An apparition of a woman, known as the Nanny, has been seen in various locations around the house, invariably carrying washing in her arms. Local historian Norman Reed told our reporter that local records show that a wet nurse lived here in the 18th century. Witness Mavis Hartley is convinced that the apparition she has seen is the spirit of this woman. We have arranged for Ruth Breary, a woman with psychic abilities, to visit the house to give her opinion of the ghostly events. She has not spoken to the residents before and has been told nothing of the events. Ruth's visit to the house proved largely uneventful until she entered the small bedroom on the first floor. 
She made the following statement to our reporter after the event. This art is shit. As soon as I stepped into the bedroom, I felt a wave of oppressive cold come from the eaves and near the fireplace. I knew that this was a place where the spirit had slept. I didn't need to see her to know she was there. You've been watching Viewpoint. I'm Rhea Searcher. Good night. Well, that was a bit different. I quite enjoyed the sort of in characterness of it. Um, it's a terrible, terrible story. I mean, I really, was that a Newton's Cradle? Oh, I found Christopher Lee's Newton's Cradle. That's it. Oh, well. oh, that was exciting. Um, blimey. Right. Oh, God, no. Calm down. Oh, we must not get too far ahead with that, Paul. I am going to turn around at this point. Blah, 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 blah. I like the way when it turns, it looks like the sofa has a really crazy angle in it. Maybe it does. Right. Save position, please, Bob. We shall stick that in documents. And it's a p oh, it saves as a piece of shit file. That's nice. Uh, excellent. I, uh, I approve. Yeah, great. First piece of shit. Mm. I'm imagine getting that sofa through the door. Bloody Ellen Kingston. Horrendous. There we are. Oh, yeah. Right, we should get into some bloody ghosts, my friend. Yes, we should, because I had to leave, unfortunately, last time, because my family had a big bloody wobbly meltdown. So that was fun. <laughs> and by fun, I mean absolutely terrible. Oh, God. Is, is it as sorted as it can be at this stage? Uh, it's as sorted as my family ever dares to sort something out. It's like, <laughs> once the emergency's over, no one dares speak of it again. So it's just been hanging <laughs> in the wind. So oh, there you God. go. That was fun. Uh, right. Let us get back in. So we had a look at... I did look at a couple of extra things in this room, but only sort of very briefly. We've basically gone into a room off the side... That's right, because the pre premise of this was you're in uh, Christopher Lee's spooky house, exactly. and he goes, look around and make your own opinions on the evidence of ghosts, and there you go. Have fun. Yeah. Anyway, I'm Christopher Lee. Bye. Bye. I'll pop up randomly like <laughs> like a pop-up book card character. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get the mouse pointer to work properly. Ah, there we are. There we are. Oh, man, yeah. So, uh, I've, I know we saw these last time, folks. But, uh, oh, hang on, XO220C, you've found a white ZX Spectrum. Is it worth more than a normal black one? Uh, generally, if it's a white one, it's an aftermarket case, I think. So probably not, unless it's like a Jupiter Ace or something that just looks like one. Dunno. Dunno. <clears throat> right. Paul, you need to suffer. I mean, enjoy no. these incredible ghost stories from these people. Uh, in the words of Aerosmith, I don't want to miss a thing. <laughs> you, you won't be saying that when you hear these astonishing ghost tales. So, is there any concept to these to the this room? There's no. It's just you walked in and you've seen this picture, and that that's it at this at this stage. Exactly. There's no like this is the blue room where Aunt Margaret died. Be careful. Nope. This is literally just you walk in the room, and here we go. Fine. Yeah. Good. All right. Let's let's begin with the chap on the left. Oh, go click again. As I looked up on the top right hand side window there, there was you know, what I thought was a face, you know, somebody looking out. And those rooms aren't actually used anymore because, you know, they're they're rotten, completely rotten. Um it looked like a it looked like a child. It looked like a you know, just a, a little boy. But it was so quick, it was just as you know, it was like a blink, it was just like a I just don't know, I just don't know. It just looked like a, a little boy. I mean, other things do hap uh, happen here. Um, it's the room upstairs it's, contains all the cleaning things that we have in the shop, which is the overstock. Normally, uh, things are sort of ruxed about, you know, thrown on the floor. Like we have big uh, one kilogram tubs of swarf eager. Um, we had five of those broken in different places on the floor upstairs. Um, that was overnight, when we, uh, and everything's locked up obviously when we go to work so nobody could have possibly gone in there like last year we g I was getting some garden furniture and there was somebody walking about upstairs and I needed some help and I called out and there was nobody there and it sort of stopped and when 
Um, I went back out there. The, there was somebody pacing about upstairs again. So I ran upstairs and there was nobody there. There was nobody in the room. Spooky. Is your girlfriend with you in case you faint, Paul, due to the incredible uh, spooky horror of this? I've actually got a strong whiskey nearby in Good case man. I need to measure my spirit. Um, so, okay, so do we know the context of this man and the story, or is this something we're going to have to piece together by exploring this room? Uh, well, we have no context to the extent that the story seems to start mid sentence. Uh, there is no information about this man, and that's it. There is no more information as far as I can tell. So that, that could be any man <coughs> talking about anything. It might not even be taken from ghosts. It might just be a, a man who has a house with someone who lurks in the walls. Yeah. You don't, you don't know that. It's 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 not impressive. But if I remember, this one was even worse. So, uh, I mean, Hooray. even better. <laughs> when she was about 13, she came down to breakfast one morning and said that she had seen a Roman in a toga in her bedroom. And I thought, oh, yes, that sounds a bit far-fetched, a teenage fantasy. But Debbie, later on that day, went out in the garden and was playing and came in with a small coin in her hand, which turned out to be a Roman coin with the head of Septimus Severus on it. So I was quite excited by this because it was quite unusual. And uh, so soon after seeing this Roman in her room, about three months later, she had the same experience and saw the same gentleman in her bedroom and she found the second coin on the site and soon afterwards she saw him again and found the third coin on the site. Now all the coins had the same head, the head of Septimus Severus on them. Um, once was unusual, twice was coincidence, three times was a bit more than um, coincidence. And although I've never um, experienced or seen Septimus Severus there at all, we do have funny things happen in the house, like the curtains have been taken down, all sorts of odd things of that nature. And um, I believe that Debbie saw him because she happens to be susceptible to these things. Do uh, you know what? I remember being 15, lying on my back, aroused, and thinking of all those Roman soldiers that were my teenage fantasies. <laughs> I remember that quite clearly. All, in fact, all my friends were into Romans back then. We were but, really into that Roman soldier fantasy. Did you used to go in WH Smith and pretend you were 18 so you could get Roman toga fantasy magazine? Yeah, and we always would meet up in the woods with our mum's best <laughs> uh, duvets and we'd all pretend uh, we were Caligula and have orgies in the woods. It was a crazy time. Oh, I remember the police sacrificing all our sandals. It was terrible. Oh, yeah, dear. yeah, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm of the opinion that what's happened there is she's been scammed by her daughter. <laughs> is, is that your opinion? Because that's quite obviously what's happened. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like she's gone, oh, I found these coins. I got these coins from a local uh, charity shop. I'm going to play a trick on me, mum. You watch this. Mum, Roman coin, and I've seen a man in me room. That's fine, dear. It's not fine if your child can see a man in basically a duvet. It could have just been a man in a duvet as well. He could have been another guy hiding in the walls. It's probably the same guy. Perhaps that's why they're on. They're next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Because I wonder God. if they've just gone around and said, "Do you have any ghost stories?" <clears throat> yeah. All right. We'll call them. We'll stick them in our CD-ROM. I, I think that must be what's happened. It's probably like relatives of the people who made it or something. Probably. Maybe. Know. It's like, oh, my, my, my aunt Carol. She uh. She said uh, her daughter saw a ghost, did she? Yeah. And then she speaks to Aunt Carol. Aunt, um, I've said you do an interview with these guys who are making a CD-ROM about, remember what your daughter saw? What was that? Remember about the toga? No, no, I don't remember that. Oh, I've, I've blown this. You're going to have to come up with this, Mum. They're all coming over. Come on. <laughs> M. Kingston has made a good point. Uh, so a man wearing a toga appeared in her room, but also apparently the curtains were taken down. Ah, yes. Well, ah, very well done. <laughs> We've solved it. Bloody hell. Well, yeah, that's that's an astonishing tale. I mean, I've heard that if you collect three coins with Queen Elizabeth's face on, she'll come to your house and make you a cup of tea. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, what happened after that? Was it just a, a, it was a three-coin chump? He turns up, gives her a coin each to keep her quiet. That didn't work, so he stopped giving her coins. <laughs> Can I just point out with the precursor here, I've spotted that the... Uh... Texture doesn't quite match. Doesn't quite line up. Oh no! Uh, it's almost like a screen tear or something. Right. Enough of these beautiful people. Let us uh, continue onward into the room of terror. Can Come we... on, that TV's got to have something on it, hasn't it? It does. We clicked it last time. I remember. Actually, there was like a, a fake news report. 
You can't just put a TV in a room and not want not have it Local click. Local vet Keith Michael oh has assured us that the cat will make a full recovery. And finally, tonight's special report investigates a real-life haunting. The residents of this 300-year-old house, set deep in the countryside of West Yorkshire, England, have been experiencing strange phenomena. An apparition of a woman known as the Nanny has been seen in various locations around the house invariably carrying washing in her arms. Local historian Norman Reed told our reporter that local records show that a wet nurse lived here in the 18th century. Witness Mavis Hartley is convinced that the apparition she has seen is the spirit of this woman. We have arranged for Ruth Brewery, a woman with psychic abilities, to visit the house to give her opinion of the ghostly events. She has not spoken to the residents before and has been told nothing of the events. Ruth's visit to the house proved largely uneventful until she entered the small bedroom on the first floor. She made the following statement to our reporter after the event. As soon as I stepped into the bedroom, I felt a wave of oppressive cold come from the eaves and near the fireplace. I knew that this was a place where the spirit had slept. I didn't need to see her to know she was there. You've been watching Viewpoint. I'm Rhea Searcher. Good night. <laughs> so he's dropped the gong down the stairs at the end. <laughs> I, that, call me cynical, but that's not a real news report, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be very worried if it was. <laughs> Bloody hell. Uh, we need we need to make this uh, fake news report idea work. What we're going to do? We need to kind of, kind of have a story coming out the end of, as if they just turn the TV on. Oh, cat! There we go. Everyone loves a cat. Yeah. And uh, Becky in reception. She's got a nice dress, so she can be our news reporter. She doesn't want to do it. Tell her we'll give her another tenner. Like, just get on with it. Just get, get her. Tell her she's working late. Yeah. <laughs> God. I, I spotted this last time, but I love the way the sofa looks like it's an insane shape due to the way it scrolls. <laughs> One of those weird new IKEA designs. Well, I seem to remember you could click on this. Oh, the and, old Newton's cradle. Nothing happens. Just literally. Right, well, it doesn't even cradle. animate a. That's it. No, rubbish. There were also a lot of like. Oh, there was some something about dogs. To, yes. Oh. I remember the dogs because they appear in a sort of. Oh, I think they're somewhere in the intro sequence or something. I'd seen the sort of model before. I think the left oh, one is closely oh. at the cinders within the heart. If you find any that are shaped like a coffin, there may be a death in the family. Okay, well, then. That, that, that's an old wives' tale where if you go foraging in your fireplace, you might find a coffin shaped piece of am uh, ash. A piece of ash frith? That seems odd. If I found the ash frith in a coffin, yeah, that would be a bad sign. Yes. Especially if it was in my fireplace. Especially if it, for ash, that'd be a terrible sign. <laughs> yeah, be, it, it'd be. It'd be it's all over for him. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there we are. I'm zooming in slightly so we can get a bit more Christopher Lee in our lives. Right. Uh, well, that that was a thing. I think we're on to new territory now. We'd, I've not seen anything from here on. Right. So we've got... Um, Candelabra. Carriage clock, which always reminds you of number six on Bully's Pride board. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Burp. Every time I saw one of those, I thought, it's a bad week for prizes if they've got the carriage clock out. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, ugh, bullseye prizes. We look at them every week on stream. And, yeah. If you're very lucky, there's a Commodore 64 or an Amstrad in there. But that's I remember, it, really. I remember getting excited when I watch it back these days on YouTube. And it's like, oh, they're giving away a Sega Master System. Yeah. But all I remember are speedboats and carriage clocks. Yeah, there's a great story. I believe Jim Bone told about bullseye work. It's like, <laughs> if they always had a boat on standby. Because... I think the idea was if they if they didn't want people to win, or if they didn't think they were going to win, they'd wheel out the expensive car. But then if it, if they ended up winning, they'd get the boat out instead because no one would want the boat and they'd take the money. It was something weird like that. So of course, who on earth would want the boat? Most of the people on there were probably living like in a you know a tower block in the middle of London or something. What are you going to do with a pissing speedboat? <laughs> exactly. So they always took the money. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you, JP Quinn. Right. Uh, let's start on the left, I suppose. Uh, nope. No, these aren't anything. I wish we could they straighten just... that. That's annoying. Yeah, that's annoying. That's affecting my OCD somewhat. The clock isn't anything either. What? C 
come on. A clock. You've got to at least to imagine a clock would be something. Like a, It's like the Amateurville clock from the film The Amateurville Horror Escapes or whatever it is. You remember that when they ran out of... Answers. When they ran out of excuses for going back to the Amateurville house. So now they just did films where someone who bought a clock or a lamp from the house <laughs> would end up having a haunted house because they brought the evil with them. You just think that's just bad. I didn't know that. So it's like the Amityville toothbrush or something. Generally, I think there's two or three sequels that all hinged around the idea of someone's bought an item that used to be in the Amityville house. So I think it's a dollhouse in one, a clock in the other, and yeah, a lamp, a haunted lamp. Bloody hell. What a, well, I'm going to comment on that. You can't click on the axis, so this this whole thing is kind of a bust, except for the, the uh, fireplace. The yeah. fireplace. And even that is mm. just his, Steve, his Christopher Lee with an old wives' tale. Yeah, yeah literally. Unless he was in the Bureau. Oh, oh, here we are. We've got the case file. Case files on the poltergeists. What what have I done? I think I've. Yeah, there we are. Right. Oh, I see. Poltergeists introduction and case histories. Poltergeist is a German word meaning noisy spirit. Poltergeist activity is a term used to describe unexplained phenomena such as objects moving, breaking and levitating, temperature changes, noises, furniture being ranged, strange smells, water spots, fires, and writing appearing, and so on. That just sounds like any writer's room for any sort of media fair. project. Yeah, it just also sounds like the terms and conditions of buying some kind of new laptop. <laughs> <laughs> this is the new Facebook terms and conditions. It involves smells. Yeah. You scroll it and just accept anyway. Yeah, yeah, I think we're about to do that, to be honest. How long is it? Oh, it's not too bad. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these events can be both disturbing and destructive, unless you're watching uh, Ghost Watch, which in which case they're kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, there are no recorded cases of any person sustaining an injury from poltergeist activity, despite the fact that it is by far the most common paranormal event in the modern home. <laughs> what other common uh, paranormal I events? I want Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, we did a, we did a survey and we found, you know, largely spooky tinkering is quite high, but poltergeist, nine out of ten times, if you cut moves, it's a poltergeist. Yeah, and giant marshmallow man, very rarely see them these days. Yeah, it, it, That's not as common as it used to be in the 80s. Yeah. Despite the fact that it's by far the most common run in the modern home, poltergeist activity is by no means a new occurrence. Italian documents from the 6th century describe poltergeists and ancient Egyptians strongly believed in them. The traditional theory upholds that poltergeist activity is caused by spirits of the dead who, unable to remain on the earth as human beings, must influence the living with their paranormal acts of trickery and mischief. Okay. And increasingly vile, foul language, like some of them like to use. Really? Sweary poltergeists? Well, that's the ghost in uh, the Enfield poltergeist case, when it spoke through uh, one of the girls in the family, was uh, just... There's audio footage of him saying... You dirty fucker. And all this kind oh, of stuff. God. Cool. I wonder yeah. if that's in here. That'd be interesting. Well, they'll probably cut those bits out or um, bleep them or something. But Very likely. Or they just won't put them in at all. During the first half of this century, researchers working on the subject began to theorise about a possible link between adolescents and poltergeists. It was considered that the repressed emotions of children, and in particular girls, that have recently reached puberty may be the cause of paranormal events. It is certainly true that a large percentage of poltergeist activity is centred around households where there are young people. Serious family arguments or crises may also trigger people-centred phenomena, with the activity invariably stopping when the family's problems are resolved. Kind of sounds like something psychological then, doesn't it? Mm. There are place-centred poltergeist cases as well as people-centred ones. These occur when the building that the activity is occurring in has been the site of emotional unrest in the past. For example, a murderer may have buried his victims nearby, or a child may have died. Lovely. They're the two I think of when it comes to examples. That's, uh, hmm. There's a lot more pages here than I thought. Do you know yeah. of the Rosenheim poltergeist? I don't. I mean, uh, it rings a bell, but again, it's like the problem is my brain is stuffed so much of this stuff that only bits and flotsam and jetsams of the facts come to come to the surface every now and then. I've never heard of it at all. So you're definitely one up on me here. This case was centered around an 18-year-old secretary called Anne Marie Schneider, who worked at a lawyer's office. Blah blah. Conti continued for two years. The office workers became extremely concerned when the electrical and telephone systems appeared to be subject to a great deal of interference. I mean. There's a lot of things that could cause that that aren't spooky dead people. Especially in an office building where it's full of wires and cables and, you know, just the infrastructure of how you make a building work. Well, absolutely. 
Uh, light bulbs would flicker and brighten. Some bulbs would twist out of the socket, apparently of their own accord, and fall to the floor. Especially strange, as they were bayonet. Uh, saying this... that, <laughs> saying that, this is in Germany, and they're very well known for their, uh, you know, you know, von Brun technique or whatever it is from the Volkswagen adverts. Uh, so yeah, this would be unusual to have a German building built to unsatisfactory standards. You would hope so. God. Um, others would smash, despite the fact they were switched off. Technicians were called in to check the electrical systems in the office, and they discovered that massive surges of electricity were coming into the building intermittently. But that's not a ghost, that's like a problem with the electricity supply. Yeah, quite a big one. I think those problems in this house we're in now, actually, at some stage, because all the plug sockets are filtered. Um, the ones fitted to the walls. No. Oh. And as it was, it was previously owned by somebody who seemed to be quite mean, there's obviously a reason for that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what they screwed their own thing is it yeah my god telephone bills became inexplicably high but that's not a ghost's fault specifically i mean what you're just blaming ghosts for bloody everything now documents it's, it's it's the secretary she's been coming in working late and she's been like making all these party line chats documents produced by the telephone company suggested that the speaking clock had been dialed hundreds of times in a few days again that's surely a problem with the system my god yeah. um at one point the number had been dialed six times in a minute this appeared to be impossible as the technology of the time then it took 17 seconds for a call to be connected well this again, now sounds like technical photos over yeah. a ghost obviously Telephone interference did not stop there. Calls would be cut off with no apparent click. Your bloody phone system isn't working, for Christ's sake. <laughs> You're son. working in a shit house, is what it comes <laughs> yeah. down to. The local press became interested in the strange events, and for very long, television companies were producing documentaries and CD-ROMs on the subject. The lawyer who owned the <laughs> firm filed a charge against the unknown practical joker, who he thought must be responsible for the disturbing events, so the local police also had an interest in the case. It is estimated there were about 40 witnesses to the Rosenheim case over the two years that paranormal events. What paranormal events? Exactly. So far, it's basically the plot of the film Pulse. Remember that? Oh my God. Yes, I do. <clears throat> I've only seen the... Like evil electricity. Yeah. Bloody hell. I've only seen the... It was Japanese, wasn't it? Oh no, there's, I think there's a Japanese film called Pulse, but there's some 80s film, I think it's called Pulse, about oh. um, this little suburban street and something happens and all the electricity becomes evil and starts killing people off in the in, in the street with electric-based accidents. Oh, no, I've not heard of that one. That in fact, the best way to describe it is imagine the film Arachnophobia, except you replace spiders with electricity. So it's kind of a cross between Arachnophobia and Maximum Overdrive? Yeah, I guess. Because you yeah. had people strangled by hair dryers and stuff in that, didn't you? No, it's it's not really that. It's it's more it's more um, Final Destination y, where it's like, oh, oh a, a thing bursts and there's a pipe leaking water and a wire is in it all of a sudden, and it's that kind of thing. Ah, okay. Interesting. Um, is that the one where a guy's in the electric chair and goes into the power system? Asks no, Chazales. that is either Shocker. Or House 3, The Horror Story. Oh, I do know. I saw that recently. House 3. Quite obviously not supposed to be a house film and changed at the last minute. Not at all. In fact, all the house films are very different to one another. It's 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 a strange franchise. It's, isn't it only the fourth one that continues on characters or something? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, yes and no. It does have William Cat in it. And it infers that he is the character from the first one. But he's killed off very early into the film and then comes back as a ghost at the end. So it doesn't oh. really matter. God. I've been slowly going through them with a friend, but we've only done one, two, and three thus far. Mind you, there is only four, aren't there? If I remember. Yeah, I, remember. I, I love one so much, and two's strangely a good family comedy fantasy horror film. Yeah, it's, they are an odd, odd bunch, aren't they? Speaking of odd bunches of eighties horror films, we watched all of the Phantasm films in order recently. That oh, what six of trip. them is there now? Yep, I believe there were. Wow. Yes, hang on, at least four. No, at least five. Because um, one came out recently that apparently wrapped up everything. Yeah, which it doesn't at all. It yeah, absolutely does do. not at all. It doesn't even attempt to. Also, everyone was saying, oh my God, this is one of the best ones. It's fucking terrible. I would have said it's the worst out of the lot. And uh, four uh, is comprised mostly of footage from previous films. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Back to the Future 2 almost of the franchise. Oh my God. Yeah, but the first one, first two, I love them. I love those yeah. films. Quite enjoyed the second one. The first one's great, like properly great. It's just so weird and sort of ethereal and odd. Just oh, yeah. I really liked it. Just different from what else was going on. 
Yeah, absolutely. Right, let's uh, let's get through the Rosenheim electricity failure. Um, Professor Hans Bender, perfect, of the University of Freiburg's parapsychology unit, <laughs> said to uh, kill all humans. Now, he linked the phenomena <laughs> with Anne-Marie Schneider, as all activity seemed to occur during the time she was in the office. Hmm. He observed hmm. that lights would swing violently when she walked underneath them, and other events would be aggravated by her presence. Bender tested Schneider for ESP abilities, and the results suggested that she was telepathic. What? Wow. But just like some Zena cards or something. What? I, I want know. a second opinion on that. God, get Bill Murray and he'll sort it. Um, her mental state during the time of the paranormal events was poor. Her relationship with her fiancé was deteriorating. She had experienced a great deal of family problems. Other phenomena began to occur at the office. Pictures rotated on the wall that was apparently caught on film. If it was caught on film, it wouldn't be apparently because it'd have the footage. Yeah, exactly. It's like my mate said. That's the, basically the same equivalent sentence. It's just hearsay and conjecture. Those are kinds of evidence. A heavy filing cabinet moved forward on its own. Photocopy of fluid was spilt when no one was near to it. Don't photocopiers use toner, which is a form of powder? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, mm. fluid. Hmm. Uh, the lawyer lost patience for the occurrences and sent Miss Schneider home on leave. The paranormal events stopped immediately following her departure. Well, I think we all know what this means, right? <laughs> yeah. We're just going to have to put the two and two together there, really, aren't we? My God. Other than the idea of a film about a woman who's a secretary who goes mad working for an office and then becomes the ghost in the office is an interesting take. Yeah. Also, I've just come up with a brilliant... I'm actually, I actually think this is a brilliant idea. Not one of my pithy brilliant ideas that are jokes this one i actually think is great i've got a new idea for a ghost hunt show and it's called ghost court so here's the pitch right it's like judge judy but with ghost cases so there's someone in and then they turn up and go, my house is haunted and they present their evidence and then a skeptic presents their evidence and at the end the jury gets to decide if the house is haunted or not and then it legally is a haunted house at the end and would the jury be comprised of random people or minor celebrities or of of absolutely crazy people? Like I want, I want Robbie Williams on there. I want, uh, I want all the all the people you see on TV who talk about this stuff passionately. I want Dan Aykroyd on the jury, so every house <laughs> ends up being haunted. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, so they'll it'll be obvious from the evidence there are no hauntings, but they'll all be legally adjourned to be bloody true because of the um, nature of the jury. That's yeah. interesting. But then maybe some weeks they go away and it's like, is your house haunted? They, they say not guilty. And they go, oh, I thought it was haunted. But all these skeptics said it was just me taps of crap. <laughs> <laughs> My taps were crap. A ghost story. I, I'm actually going to pitch this. Because <laughs> I think it's a great idea. That... Judge Judy meets most haunted. Bloody hell. Uh, yeah, I would be up for that. Well, watching it, probably not pretending I had a haunted house. No, I'd be the judge. <clears throat> I'd be Judge Gannon, the ghost judge. So what you're saying is you would be replaced by some sort of comedian who's the flavour of the month. Yeah, if you say Sarah Pasco, it'd be someone like that. Yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, Jack Whitehall, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it'd be all those. And his dad would be the 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 the, the what's the plaint the bailiff. Oh yes, the plaint. Uh, the clerk of the court I, you know, I don't bloody know my god you can't even sentence the ghost to death we <laughs> you'll be hung, hung by the neck until we, we can't <laughs> we're just gonna do, sentence we're gonna you to wizard. life yes. oh that'll be a horrible one <laughs> well we've got the miami poltergeist case 1967 in a warehouse owned by Tropic and Arts, a company specialising in novelty gifts and souvenirs, items stored on the warehouse shelves began to move and break of their own accord. Employees were at first suspected of causing the breakages, but it soon became apparent that they could not be blamed. Okay. The manager began to complain of a ghost in the warehouse and reported his fears to the local media. The parapsychologists W.G. Roll and Professor J.G. Pratt. Roland Pratt. What a name. The Beca great band of the 70s. <laughs> became aware of the case and were given permission to carry out a full-scale investigation. Roll was the director of the Psychical Research Foundation of Carolina at the time. Pratt was a lecturer at the University of Virginia. It was not long before the researchers linked the phenomena with a recently employed clerk called Julio Vasquez. Vasquez, a... sadly not the person from Aliens, a Cuban refugee, <laughs> seemed to trigger the movement of objects when he was in the warehouse. He could stand some distance away from the shelves and still cause items to break. 
Roland Pratt made detailed notes of every strange event that took place, resulting in 224 separate incidents being documented. I thought you said Roland Rat then, because the way it's like Roland Pratt came out, it just sounded like Roland Rat. <laughs> Some people have said that in chat as well. <laughs> Roland Rat, my dude. Hey, <laughs> Spook fans. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> Kevin the gerbil standing there with some sort of recording device. I can <laughs> sense ghosts in the pink bucket. <laughs> pink bucket. My God, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Oh, it was considered that, as with the Rosenheim case, the mental state of the central agent was causing the paranormal phenomena. It was established that Vasquez had been experiencing family problems and had recently attempted suicide. He felt great resentment towards his employers and often arrived at work feeling angry and depressed. On the days when he was experiencing the most mental problems, the phenomena at his workplace were particularly extreme. Numerous tests were carried out to eliminate fraud from the case. No fraud or trickery was uncovered. Many people witnessed the events, including several police officers, a professional magician, weird, and many researchers. Some months after the poltergeist activity had begun, Julio Vazquez was found guilty of theft and imprisoned for six months. Is that relevant? Mm. As with the departure of Anne-Marie Schneider from the Rosenheim office, Vazquez's imprisonment saw the end of the strange events in Miami. So, so oh, Julio, uh, why did you leave your last job? Uh, I attracted ghosts. Then I nicked something. <laughs> but then I nicked a load of stuff. <laughs> but it was mostly the ghost, honest. <laughs> be a, well, either in either way, sir, we can't hire you for this job. Cool. We don't want things nicked, nor do we want ghosts here at Double Eight Smiths. <laughs> I mean, what an odd thing that is. It just sounds like he was doing a load of crazy stuff to cover up his theft. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, oh, hang on. We've got somebody who actually looks slightly cynical there. Dr. Susan Blackmore is a senior lecturer at the University of the West of England. She was one of the first British people to be awarded a doctorate in parapsychology and has written widely on the subject. She was awarded the Distinguished Skeptics Award in California in 1991 and has been involved in the production of many television programs on the paranormal. So we've seen these before, haven't we? But was it on the other CD? I think this was on this CD. I think they might bring these out every so often. If they actually have any video from them, maybe they explain who they are again. I don't remember Tony Cornell, though has over 30 years' experience in the field of paranormal study investigation. He's developed a sophisticated ghost-detecting machine called Spider. Yeah. Spontaneous Psychophysical Incidents Data Electronic Recorder. Yeah, they fight mask. <laughs> <laughs> Miles Mayhem has over 30 years' experience. Um, yeah. Which travels with him. You mean he takes it with him? He doesn't fucking ride behind him like a drone does it to the hundreds of ghostly locations that he investigates spider so um, what do you reckon it is a big directional microphone yeah probably it's probably just a bunch of stuff that he nicked from the set of you know the stone tapes and decided that's proper equipment because it's got an Oscar later on it do you know I want to rewatch the stone tapes I've got it on DVD it's good it's great it's, it's Nigel Neal isn't it and it's a yeah. great horror story but what people fail to take away from it is that it's a thing he invented in his mind that people have now decided is a proper supernatural theory. Which oh, is, I've spoken yeah. to about this numerously in the past, I think, um, about stone tape theory and how I don't quite buy it. Because the overall gist is they believe in buildings of oldie days gone by. They used a lot more silica in the brickwork. And silica apparently is something they also use in cassette tapes. So the theory is with enough negative or positive energy, the silica in the brickwork can record the, the sounds of the day and if you generate enough energy in and out of the brick work you can maybe get those recordings to come back maybe they're ghosts Ooh. there's a video on youtube about tony cornell and the spider project i'm gonna have to check that out later because this is something i've never heard of before i'm hoping that we will see spider as part of this cd rom I mean, it's like my god i've just seen the textures on the side here bloody hell they're dodgy aren't they dodgy Anyway, let's look at the photos. Vicky Clark presently lives in his student lodgings close to her college. Not Nicky Clark, the guy who uh, does hair. <laughs> My name is Vicky Clark. Oh, I'm right in October, and uh, about three weeks after that, the event started to happen. I did have two other roommates, but they've both moved out now. One left the course, and the other one's found other accommodation. So it's just me on my own now. There was one night, it was quite scary, there was us three girls that stay here, living here, and um, one of my roommates woke up because she'd heard banging around her head and she got quite frightened about it. 
and then she felt something brush over her face. So I got up and turned the light on, and we said, look, there's nothing here, it's all right, you know, we're just being silly, because we were getting worried about it at this point. And so we all sort of calmed down, and we turned the light back off, off and then I got into bed. And when I got into bed, there was a toilet roll in my bed. It's, I don't know what a, quite how it got in there, but um, and then when I woke up in the morning, there was um, black, like, tarry stuff in my bed as well. It was on my pyjamas, and it was on the cover, and it was on the sheet, and it wasn't there. When you I had an Atari in your bed? Because, I mean, I'd seen <laughs> the bed, and it was clean. Um, so I don't know where that had come from either. And, yeah, one day I went down to the toilet, and I locked the door, and when I came back up, it had moved a chair all the way across the room to right behind the door. I mean, we tried to we tried to work out if someone could have done it, but no one could get their arm round the door to pull the chair in enough. Um, also, uh, we had some pennies on top of the desk one day, um, and it just sort of it's flicked one and it spun on the floor and then settled down. Um, and also, bottles fall off the side, but they don't tip over; they land upright. Um, also, I went home for a week because I wasn't very well, and the girls next door said they heard a lot of noises coming from the room, but no one was in here because I'm the only one with the key now. No one's ever seen anything. It just seems to move things. I don't quite know why. Wow. Fair enough. Although, Thanks, I, take away, I take two things away from that. One, ghosts are really good at bottle flipping games, so they're probably good at beer pong as well, so that's good to know. I bet they've got their and own two, YouTube channel. Yeah, two. Every single image in that video reminded me of the TV show Get Stuffed, and it was depressing. <laughs> D- did I ever tell you I had a meeting with the guy behind Get Stuffed once? No. Yeah, so he um, lives around Norwich. It was all produced around Norwich, and it was all like UEA students or something. I didn't know that oh, at wow. the time. Yeah. For people who aren't familiar with Get Stuffed, which would be most of you, it was a late night television show on British TV, very, very low budget, um, about student cookery, kind of. But it was all very sort of ad hoc and get stuffed, yeah, let's get a colander, yeah, put the cauliflower in, wash your hands, and all this kind of semi musical stuff. It was very, very yeah. odd. It was. It had a weird. It had a weird almost 80s aesthetic to it even though it was very much an early 90s thing yes absolutely um that so just what was the project you were really. working on was I it ju- the I just, opposite of get stuffed i just had a challenge he said he had this idea for a new series um I mean, I'm not going to say the idea in case, I don't know, somebody nicks it and he's still working Fair on enough. it, but it seems unlikely. It, it involved going around public toilets, so... Um, oh, yeah. they, hang on. Already, already I can see problems. Yeah. <laughs> just just out the bat, you're yeah. going to have licensing issues, you're going to have to get everyone to sign disagreement when they come out of the toilets. It's just... It, yes, exactly. It, it was an interesting, interesting meeting. He was an interesting man, put it that way. My God. Um... He, what was I going to say? If if you've ever seen the day to day, they parody get stuffed where somebody's father dies and they have to they have like a public that's, information film of what to do. That's right. Yeah. The you know, I really that. miss that block of programming that used to happen on like, especially Channel Four oh. late night oh, when man. they commissioned like Adam and Joe is a great example of the stuff that came from that kind of risk taking they did. But there was another show I loved. I think it was called Exotica, and it was like an hour long show. And they took really awful, like, 50s, 40s, maybe 60s B-movies, colorized them, and then put, like, stupid speech bubbles on them or voiceovers. It's kind of like a mystery science theater thing. Yes, I'd totally forgotten about that. Exploitica, Nandor says. Ex- I think that might have been right. Oh, man, I'm gonna have to, there must be some of that on YouTube. I'll look that up later. I, I'd had a look for stuff, and I couldn't find a bloody thing. But that, I remember that being one of my favorite things to stay up late for. I went through a period of like not really being able to sleep until late and I would go mm. downstairs usually on a Friday or Saturday night and watch stuff and there was always things like um the James Whale radio show yes 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 despite on being on television uh oh what was the heavy metal one with Crusher's Cosmos um Oh, God. I don't know. That might even have been a regional thing, because different regions got different programming at that time of night, didn't they? Oh, that's true, actually. Yes. I can't remember that was because that was very lo-fi as well. Um, what's the other side? It's weird. I, I just kind of miss those moments where at any time of night you could watch something really weird on a main channel. And, it, you know, they didn't have to explain. Like, there was that program on ITV, wasn't there? That was at midnight. They went live to somewhere. 
and it was like a fire engine or it was somewhere else and like that was the exciting thing they're coming live night watch i think the show was called oh i don't remember that one that's that sounds more interesting than what i used to watch to be honest no oh, and there was dare to believe cotton m yeah but no one talks about that now dare to believe how do i know what that is but i can't specifically remember was it's it like a weird sketch show it. Yeah, but the people who watch the show could write sketches in. So the idea is that you could just send a sketch in and they'd make it. Ah. But it, I think it was bad for everyone involved in the show. In front, behind, <laughs> watching it. No one benefited from Dare to Believe. My God. Um, somebody has pointed out the heavy metal one was just called Heavy Metal. Yes, you are absolutely correct. There you yeah. go. My God. My main memory of that, though, is a, a show called Passengers. Um, oh, what was that? It had the a sort of version or cover version of the Iggy Pop song Passengers as an intro. And I don't remember whatever it was about. I remember it being very long. It was on every bloody week. And it was like about youth stuff from around the world, perhaps. Oh. So like I a kind of why don't you meet, meet ho a holiday show. Yeah, with a hint of the tube, maybe. I, I genuinely can't remember what was on it. My God. Mm. Anyway, we should probably look at this videotape. Yeah, well, we'll do another series of videos where we look over old TV magazines and we remember the shows from the past. We'll do that one day. Oh, God, we should do one with clips and then just immediately get hit with copyright. Oh, shit. For Twitch, you'll be all right. It's just not when you want to host it again. <laughs> Ad Key says, I played you some Dare to Believe in my phone once. See if you'd seen it before, because only me and my cousin had ever watched it and done it some kind of fever dream. Oh, Ad Key's, am I remembering it from the time, or am I just remembering it from when you showed it to me on your phone? <laughs> that might be it. <laughs> I don't know. Did I remember? Well, the answer is, because I can't remember, did I remember it at the time, Ad Keys? Because if I did, then obviously I did say it originally. If I didn't, then I'm remembering it from your phone. My God. It's um, probably the best way to have remembered it. Yes. I just remember, dare to believe. So that's definitely a thing from something. Right. Mm. Here's Tony Connell's Poltergeist Experience, which, again, great 70s band. I think <laughs> Rick Wakeman played keyboards. Oh, there was one case I think that was interesting from the point of view that uh, my fellow investigator and myself were somewhat scared. You, you get blasey about this, but we were in a house, um, an old house up in the, the, in the Fens, north of Cambridge, and in a room that nobody would sleep in or live in because they said funny things happened to that. And they were using it to store furniture. And when they put electricity in the house, they put everything else but in that one room. And we're in there. I said, in there, and we got all the other helpers, uh, actual members of the University Society downstairs, doing a Ouija board, not to communicate, but to get everybody round so that we could control them. And suddenly there's bumps and thumps coming. We got the door uh, from that direction across the bare boards. And I'm saying to Alan, this night, saying, Alan, cut it out. He's saying, just cut it out yourself. I said, it's not me. And bang, 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 we got two torches. And we're showing it. I mean, we've known each other for years. I knew he wasn't doing it. He knew it. But it got quite scary because it's a thump, 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 you see? And the last thump was on a brass bedstead over my head. And I thought, wow, I don't like this. And Alan said the same, more or less the same thing. That people were making a noise downstairs. And we used that as an excuse to go down and tell them to keep quiet. We got to the door and we forgot that we had put strings across there in case somebody was going to take us for a ride. And we went through there and collided with that, came back, and as we came back, we heard a noise, and we swung our torches around, and we saw a chair going across the room and land bang on the wall. That was a bit scary. Ooh. Oh, this is scary. I really like his idea of holding a seance around the Ouija board, not because they believe in the Ouija board, but just to make sure everybody is there, and they're not doing anything suspicious behind the scenes yeah there's a great quote from him i'm reading on this wikipedia page as well which i'll boil down to the point which where he says i don't understand why people like seances and ouija boards they're a distraction and also if you're a ghost who can you know transcend the barriers of death and come back why would you do and why would you do that and make a ball levitate and then blow a trumpet it's like you do, <laughs> you do more amazing things and it's like it's a good point <laughs> i like the idea the only way they can communicate through trumpets and balls. Oh my yeah. God. 
I'm reading a great book at the moment called Illusions of the Mind, which uh, I think I've mentioned elsewhere, uh, even on the Halloween show, I think we did. But um, it's a great book about uh, the history of uh, psychics and ghost hunters. And they talk a lot about all of that kind of seance claptrap and how, you know, people were wowed when things would levitate and musical instruments would play. But it's like there's no context for why a ghost would want that to be the thing it does if it comes back from the dead. It's like maybe it will just write with a pen on a piece of paper or appear and say hello. It wouldn't go through this mind thing of only appearing uh, and levitating objects that you've picked out from a box. It, oh, it's, it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's sketchy at best, I think is a polite way of putting it. Yeah, I don't want to repeat myself because I've gone on about that quite a lot in the past, but it, this, this is a great book anyway. Oh, uh, Dare to Believe update. No, I hadn't heard of it when Adkey showed it to me, so my memory of that is entirely probably from Ad showing it to me and then me looking it up on YouTube later or something. Uh, right, Sue Blackmore's Poltergeist Experience. One of the most interesting cases I investigated many years ago now was in an uh, ordinary council house in North Bristol. I was called there because the family had been seeing strange lights in the sky and the UFO group had started investigating it. But then odd things started to happen in their house. They were seeing strange things, they were hearing strange things, they saw the lights um, swinging when there was no one there, they heard somebody opening the front door but there wasn't anybody there. The clock was jumping along the mantelpiece of its own accord when nobody touched it and the television was changing channels spontaneously with nobody near it. So they called me in to, to try and find out what was happening. I found a very pleasant and interesting family. I got on fine. I went there a day a week for many weeks and sat there and watched. And of course nothing happened. And I got them to keep a diary and I put various pieces of apparatus in there to detect what was going on and nothing was detected at all. I put a sort of fraud detecting piece of apparatus there and they didn't fall for that and commit any frauds, which meant that I could relax a bit about that. And then one day when I was sitting there, the clock jumped along the mantelpiece. And I thought, wow, you know, at last something psychic's happened. Amazing. So I wanted to find out, was this to do with the position on the mantelpiece? Would any clock in that position jump? Or was it something about the clock? Was the clock haunted or the place haunted? So I thought the best thing to do was replace that clock with another clock and take the jumping clock away to my house. So I got them to put another clock on the mantelpiece and I took the jumping clock home to my desk, put it down on my desk, kept working, you know, day after day, and suddenly it went ch -ch -ch. And I thought, ha, huh, whatever this is, whether it's a ghost or something normal, it's in the clock. So I took it to a technician I knew who specializes in mending clocks and he took it to bits and he told me that it was a very cheap metal 1950s clock with a very heavy old dirty spring in it that was totally clogged up, he showed me, with muck and dirt and so on. And what happened was you wind the spring tight, it all sticks together with this gooey stuff and then as it unwinds it sticks and then ch -ch -ch jumps and because the clock's so light and it was on a shiny tiled mantelpiece it would actually move it a long way along. And that was the beginning of dismantling the story. It turned out that the television channels could be changed by various kinds of sounds, ultrasound, that could be produced by the rattling of a dog's chain, and often it happened when the dog was lying in front of the television, um, and uh, other sounds as well could do it. We tried some out. And gradually the whole thing fell to pieces. Now, I still don't know whether really the, the, the uh, light, lights were swinging when nobody was there, as the people said. I never saw that happen, happen, and I have only their word to go on. And that's how it's always been. Things I've been able to investigate have turned out to have a normal explanation, and a lot remains that I just don't know. So they shouldn't have said Sue Blackmore's poltergeist experience, because that's fraud. Yeah, this is Sue Blackmore's very, very well-proven lack of poltergeist experience. <laughs> I, yeah. I would like to hear her explanation for the Rosenheim poltergeist case. That was yeah, the one that was it. obviously bad electricity and phone lines. You know. Yeah. Dragons for Hunters. Thank you very much for the sub there. That was very good of you. Right. I think that's a very difficult and interesting case. I knew some of the people who were there and everybody I talked to who'd been there came back with a totally different account of what had happened. 
What seems most interesting to me about that case is the telephone bills and the idea that you couldn't dial fast enough to get the speaking clock. But I've never been able to find out, although I have tried, to get a transcript for, of, the, of the, the phone bill or anything that would show me that was really true. As far as I'm concerned from the investigations I've done, that remains a fascinating bit of hearsay that I haven't been able to track down. That's always how it is, and it's very frustrating because maybe it's true and I'm wrong, but I can never seem to get hold of a bit of evidence that's really convincing. The producer of this video be like, we shouldn't have booked her for this. She's <laughs> ruined this for us. Yeah, bloody hell, the logic. Get Christopher Lee back on to tell you you're going to die <laughs> if you see a reflection of a potato in your window. God. I love basically that little video play that pops up. And if you look carefully on the bottom of the screen, it says, like, made, made in, in the, the UK. UK. Yes. And I just love the fact that that's the biggest they could dream. <laughs> <laughs> That also, that wasn't an explanation for the Rosenheim Poltergeist case. You didn't even ask her that question, I don't think. You know. No. Oh, so we've got this as well in the background. The case of briefs. Uh, this is all about the Enfield Poltergeist. Okay. Yes. And we have covered that quite an extensive amount of time, I think, on these discs. Yeah. It's fun. Maybe there's a few videos or such. Yeah. Let's see what else we've got. But that, this was very heavily covered in um, Weird, if I remember. It? Yeah, I mean, it's better presented here by the looks of things, but the, the overall gist of the story is the same. Oh, Viscount One, thank you very much for the sub. Uh, list of witnesses. That's useful. I, I, anyone could write names down. David Martin from BBC Scotland. Marvellous, yeah, great, thanks for that. And you'll notice there, not once, are the Warrens mentioned. At least I don't think the Warrens were mentioned there. Let's have a quick look again. Oh, yeah. Oh, hang on. I don't, oh, God, this is fiddly. Let me right. just have a look. Any Warrens? No Warrens no. there. No there. Any Warrens? No. no. There's Rimmer from Red Dwarf came. That's good of him. Although so, E.O. Keith, which is weird, because there's a ghost hunter called Kieran O'Keefe. used to be on Most Haunted years ago. I wonder if they're related. Oh, uh any warrens oh el warren usa ah you see there he, we are he apparently turned up for a couple of hours and left whereas in the movie the conjuring 2 him and his wife saved the day oh that's a bit i like the sound of professor playfair he sounds like a children's tv character telling you not to cheat at things yes hello boys and girls but today we're playing monopoly no come back i'll try and make it fun <laughs> no cheating though uh Witness report statements. When we were in the living room, we heard something drop of the unit, so we all went out the garden, including Mum. When we got outside to look, we saw nothing until suddenly a stone came over from James' unit. James' unit. James, you absolute unit. And over our unit, and it broke into pieces in the air before it dropped, but no one was out there at this time. But the stone dropped and could not be seen. Just as if it disappeared from the ground, I looked for it, but I couldn't see it anywhere or its pieces. Janet Hodgson. I'm guessing she was quite young. And yeah, I think that was the girl that was mostly based around. Uh, yeah, let's, let's not go too far into this. I quite like the way this is presented for somebody mm. who isn't sort of familiar with it. But yeah, we've seen all this really, haven't we? Um, what, however, do you, what do you think onto the cassette? We had automatic, two automatic cameras set up in the room, which were controlled by a button from outside the room. So that if we heard anything happening in the bedroom that was untoward, we could start the cameras going. And the cameras used to. Uh, flash at half second intervals and we've got various episodes happening but here's a particular interesting one there's three episodes three camera shots here at half second intervals the first camera shot shows a pillow here apparently going towards the camera which is over here in front and we know that that pillow and the one on the one on the floor there were on the bed here by the side of Margaret. Now, so we've got a pillow actually going towards the camera now. The second photograph here shows the pillow has now doubled up here and is going in the other direction, like backwards. And the third photograph, a half a second interval, shows the pillow has now come forward again and is resting on top of the one that was on the floor. So in actual fact, we've got the pillow doing a zigzag motion. Well, physically, of course, that's not possible. <laughs> but it kind of happened, mate. Yeah. For some time, for some time, the mother and the children have been telling us that the bedclothes have been flying up the wall and the curtains have been billowing out into the room. Well, we hadn't seen this at all. And we had just had to take it at face value what they told us. 
But to one night, we got a sequence of four pictures on our automatic cameras, which shows that actually happening. Here on the first one, you see the bed clothes, the, the bed cover flying up the wall here, the curtain billowing out into the room, and it was mid, it was mid December, the, the window was shut tight, no drafts, and yet the, the curtain is billowing out into the room. The next picture shows the curtain has now, the uh, bedclothes have now dropped down, but the curtain is moving because in the first picture that was concave, uh, that was convex and is now concave, so we know the curtain is moving. Uh, Janet here has not moved her hand very much, it's more or less still on her stomach and her thigh. Here the next picture, the curtain has moved again because now it's more or less straight. And in the last picture, the fourth picture, the curtain here has twisted round and the bedclothes has twisted round as though to meet one another. Well, you heard the story of levi the levitations in the case. Here we believe we actually have a levitation of the girl flying through the air. And you have a look at Margaret over that side there. You see Margaret, very, very strange thing for girls to be doing at three o'clock in the morning. There's Janet flying through the air. And Margaret is there lying in, in bed with one foot up the wall and one hand up in the air. You must admit, a bit peculiar. Even if she's just jumped. But let's look at the next picture. The next picture shows a same, similar thing happening, but this time the mother is in the room. Similar thing happening. See, I'll show you the first picture again so you can perhaps see them both side by side. Right. Now, when I questioned the mother on this, I said, what was happening at the time? She said, Janet was lying in bed and I was talking to Janet. I said, then what happened? She says, I don't know. She says, suddenly Janet was flying through the air. I said, now, now let's get this straight. You were talking to Janet and what did Janet do? Did she get, or get out from under the covers, go to the top of the bed and jump? She said, no. I was talking to Janet and suddenly Janet was flying through the air. I said, you sure? I said, absolutely positive. So how did Janet get into that position if she's lying down talking to Mrs. Uh, to her mother? This one is of a similar incident again. It wasn't done once, twice or three times. It kept on happening. And usually in the middle of the night. Wow. At what, uh, Janet, it's like the, all those pictures look like if Ken Loach did Peter very, Pan. Very, very <laughs> trance. Very violent trance situation. So bad at one time that we thought that she might even kill herself. She used to rush over and smash her head on the wall. It was a dreadful thing to see. To see. She used to swear and curse. And she, was, she was so strong, in fact, that at one time she picked up a social worker who was lying on the bed trying to restrain her and threw her straight off the bed. And this social worker, this uh, woman, she's an ex-police woman, and she wasn't a very small woman, I can assure you. Incredible. Anyway, one night, she, when she was in a very, very bad state, we called a doctor who uh, came, and he gave her a 10 milligram injection of Valium to quieten her down. Well, 10 milligram was not an adult, uh, let alone a child. Um, she went out like a light. 40, uh, and then we all went downstairs and the rest of the children, the other children had gone to sleep we went downstairs. 40 minutes later, there was an enormous explosion. I thought the top of the house had come off. We rushed up the stairs into the bedroom. No Janet. She disappeared in the bed. Well, we looked at the bed, you know, you know, what's happened? And then we looked round and we saw Janet on top of this chest of drawers. There's a radio there and a chest of drawers. She's on top of the radio. She'd been thrown apparently 14 feet across the room and she was either in deep sleep or unconscious because I examined her eyes and everything. She was either deep in very deep sleep or unconscious. That happened three times that night. Here is Janet in this violent trance state where I'm restraining her. All pretty violent stuff. And here's another <coughs> one, similar. 
Here's just a small one taken with my camera. I have plenty of these. This one's got iron thread, which was found on the back of the bathroom door. Whether Fred did it, or whether the children did it, it's anybody's guess. But anyway, that was found on the back of the door. And here's another rather amateurish photograph of some of the furniture turning over. Oh, <laughs> and suddenly we cut scene. You know, it, it's interesting because around this time, stories like the Enfield Poltergeist were quite common. Um, I was just looking up, um, does, does, the BBC had a show called Nationwide way back in the day, which is like a national regional show. Um, one story they did is basically the same as the Enfield Poltergeist case, um, but it was in 1975, which I think was two years before the Enfield Poltergeist case. Um, and this was in, uh, I think it was Newcastle. I'll find the link for it and try and put it in the chat room. But um, it's a fascinating story because all the beats are the same. A, low, a very poor family living on a, you know, in, in, in this case, I think it was like a block of flats or like tenement building almost. Um, same kind of thing, knocking, banging, voices, things moving, levitation. Almost the exact same story, but people forget about that for whatever reason. And obviously remember the Enfield case, just because I think the Enfield case was just so widely reported thanks to things like the Daily Mail and Radio 4. Not the Daily Mail, sorry. Daily Mirror and Radio 4 doing big features on them. Hmm. So it was a massive media thing at the time, basically. It, it wasn't uncommon. And like this, there are stories which, you know, depending on where you where you lie politically, kind of ends up where you believe. And that a lot of these people were faking ghost stories because their uh, council house was awful and they wanted to move. And so they'd invent these hauntings and then get moved to another house. It, it is an, un, an uncommon thing to have happened, although that doesn't make it common by default. Hmm. Bloody hell, it's an odd one, isn't it? I mean, they, a lot of nonsense in that last thing, my God. Particularly the movement of the pillows, where he talks like there weren't people in the room at the time. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yes. God. And it's a tricky one, the Enfield Pol Poltergeist case, because half of me believes it's mostly all made up and the other half of me believes there's something going on there whether that's supernatural we don't know but there's something going on there because they were a troubled family and poor but they always said they didn't want to leave the house that wasn't the issue they didn't want the attention um at all initially but they just wanted to reach out to someone but you know long story short their plan wasn't to move out of the house in fact they stayed there long after the the, the thing died down bloody hell Imagine what they would have done if they'd have had, like, access to After Effects back in those days. Man. We'd have oh, seen yeah. some proper fakery, I reckon. But weirdly enough, that this case informs directly uh, Stephen Volk's Ghostwatch. Because it's it's like a, there was a trend almost, as well, in the 80s and early 90s, to make horror films modern. Because everything was leaning on the gothic and the supernatural and maybe leaning on Christian and religious stuff. And then you see between films like uh, Poltergeist and Ghostwatch, this idea of like the modern haunted house is the one that was only built a few years ago. And it kind of retextualized a lot of what ghost stories meant to uh, the community. As a result, it wasn't just pubs anymore. It became more like socially focused on families. Hmm. It's, I mean, Ghostwatch was a huge thing at the time and still sort of reverberates now. And so, yeah, every, every Halloween now there's always an article about it and the, and the newspapers are online. Did they ever show it again? I don't think they did, did they? Never did, never did. The, the, a lot of people say, oh, it's because one kid killed himself. And there's always caveat to that story in that, yes, the kid did kill himself. And yes, he did leave a note saying he wants to be with a ghost now. But what people forget is it wasn't just that one show that... Uh, you know, made him want to kill himself. This kid had had a troubled mental health history for a long time, was failed by the system a few times, um, and he only seemed to get any acknowledgement once he died through this case, and it's kind of a really sad story. Oh, bloody hell. Well, that's genuinely tragic. Really unpleasant. Yeah, but, but again, it's like that taints the show to some extent, because the BBC, you know, wouldn't decided to never show it again. Hasn't stopped uh, someone releasing respect. it on DVD, though. I've had two no, different that versions. Was the, yeah, that was for the BFI initially, I think. The BFI had to release it because the BBC wouldn't. Um, I, I don't know. In many respects, banning it was the best thing for it because people started remembering it as a kind of urban legend. Do you remember that show? Oh, no. Until YouTube came and ruined everything. Yes. Now, we all know everything at all times. Yeah. The Mate. internet ruined 
our, our ability to fondly remember nostalgia and it also ruined our ability to have conversations in the pub where no one knew who was in gold during the 1966 World Cup. <laughs> uh, Atreyu asks, oh, incidentally, the link you put in was blocked by a bot, but you've been... I thought as much. Now. Yeah. So if you want to repost that link, it will now work. Oh, I'll do that now. Yeah, this is um, uh, this goes to BBC Archive with the story of the 1975 haunting in, I think it's Newcastle. But again, very similar story beats. So if you want to watch that, they now can at the, at the click of a link. Oh, well, the, the bot has hit it again, despite oh. it saying you were allowed to. So there we are. God. Oh, Dave. Put, uh, you know what? If people are interested, I'll put it on my Twitter account later and people can look at it then. Good shout. Good shout. Um, Atreyu asks, are you familiar with the Zozo demon? Uh, I mean, I, I know it's something to do with Ouija boards. That's about it. But I don't... I don't know. I think it's one of those things that people have attached to the Ouija board to make the Ouija board more scary than it is, which is a piece of wood with the alphabet on. Mine was a bit of cardboard. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's like when we got it in the post from a. Uh, for, of for course, we used on I the sent it to you. I'd forgotten. Yes, yes. yeah. Uh, I was both impressed and unimpressed at the same time. It was like, oh, this is a big bugger that's slightly made, but then it was like, but it's on cardboard. Yeah. <laughs> it's two quid for a reason. Absolutely. Uh, apparently, Tony Cornell's spider machine looks like a ZX Spectrum in a box. Apparently, it is on this CD somewhere. So. Uh... Oh, good. We'll hopefully come across it later in our travels. Hmm. Right, let's have a look at the audio cassette, I suppose. We'll have a listen. Oh, nice. Ooh, ooh, look! We can hear some objects being thrown. Ready? I like that. We we can uh, hear it on the silica in this. Yay! I mean, it's not the silica say... that records; it's the you know ferrous oxide magnet or bit. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't I, I, I'm spot spotty on the science of that quote unquote science, but I do need to check that up before I write my book. <laughs> <laughs> right, go on then. Objects being thrown. Johnny just got in bed from his head down, turned the lights out, and that lands over there. He put the light or something. Right, that's the uh, front of the uh, doll's house. It's thrown right across the room, over the top of the bed to the door. Yeah, the doll's house is in the corner, <laughs> away from the bed. And the light has jumped backwards from the end of the bed and is now under the bed. Oh, that's strange, isn't it? Oh, no, don't go straight in. Um, that bloke's voice sounds like a fake voice I often do in videos. I'm going to have to listen <laughs> to this again. Come on, where is he? Where is he coming? I only just got in bed from me head down, turned the lights out, and that lands over there. I just hit it and it happened over there. My oh, God! Oh. It. Has anybody done the? In 1982, no yeah. one died. No one died. <laughs> has, has anybody mentioned that, that somebody must, else must have spotted? Yes, Super Bantam 123 there. In 1975, no one died. one died. I didn't think people actually spoke like that. Astonishing. Let's hear Bill speaking for the first time. Oh, okay, yeah. This will be good. Maybe. Let me hear you say my name. Come on, let me hear you say my name. <laughs> Teaching the dog to talk. Come on. Now, if you squeak the bed, I can't hear you talking. 
Now, say Dr. Belloff. Come on. Come on, say it for me, Dr. Belloff. Dr. Belloff. Right. Oh. Oh, my goodness. Um, so let's listen to one more. How about G-H-O-S-T? You could do nine, how Bill died, because he talks about how he died. Now, I think that they they also did these tests again, because what people, what, what you might not know is uh, they're talking to Janet. I think it's Janet. Uh, it's one of the two girls. Um, and the voice is coming through her. And they use she's using the same muscles in her throat that a ventriloquist uses to talk. But they said... Considering the length of time the conversation they had with Janet uh, and the raspiness of the voice, it would have ruined her voice in minutes, but she could talk for half an hour, 40 minutes in that voice, which was very unusual, regardless of anything else. Um, so there are some ex recordings that come from the building they were in in Enfield, and some came from when they took her to a science lab and sealed her mouth with water and put tape over it. And the voice still apparently came out, but obviously sounded like it was in a lake or something. I don't know. <laughs> Oh my god! So she either practiced or had a funny throat, really, or, or naturally could do it for a while. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, oh yeah. Sorry, the point I was going to make is that when he described how he died, apparently a relative got in touch who, who had a relative that lived there in the past before the family moved in and said, "Yeah, my my uncle died uh, in that chair, and just like it was described." Oh, right. We need to hear that now. How Bill died. In 1973, <laughs> Bill <didn't> died. <laughs> I want you to tell me whether you remember what happened to you when you died. Just before you died and just after you died. So we knew he had like, hemorrhage. Sounds like Derek, if you noticed that as well. <laughs> and then Dracula gave me his hoover. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on, Bill. How did you die? I was killed by an Irishman. <laughs> I knew he was Irish <laughs> because of the statue on his windowsill. Oh, my God. I would like to hear the voice described, though I think that will mm. do for the Enfield poltergeist. Oh my God. Well, I know how they build the TV show. They've just got people sitting in a chair and then they rotate if they like it. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> if that's what this is. <laughs> that would Breaking be down an ITV format. Yeah. I suppose that one of the most extraordinary things about the whole case was the voice. Now, this voice was quite something. And how it started was this. On December the 10th, 1977, we're talking about, I was sitting in the room, in the, in the front room there, downstairs, with the mother and the children, and we were just talking, and suddenly there was whistling and going on. And I thought, that's funny, very sophisticated whistling. The children can't whistle like that. It sounds like the whistling that Mr. Nottingham does. He whistles quite a bit next door, but he's not there, he's at work. I thought, crazy. Suddenly, a dog barked in the room. Hmm, fine, a dog barked in the room. But there was no dog there. I thought, well, you know, this is even crazier still. And I began to think, you know, okay, it can whistle, it can bark. And the thing began to turn around in my head. And it went on quite a bit. Then, lunchtime, about lunchtime, Guy Playfair came along, and I said to Guy, this morning I heard a dog barking and whistling in the room and there was no dog there and I said it was a dog barking. Mm, no, he took everything in his stride, he always did. And we decided then that if it could bark and it could whistle, it maybe I should talk. And I said to Guy, well, I'll tell you what, if it happens this evening, I'm going to take the children into the bedroom by themselves and see whether it can talk. Now this was the day that nine other 
investigators, most of them scientists, were in the house. So we had quite a lot of people who heard the first noise that was made. About six o'clock in the evening, and everybody was there, got the barking and whistling again. Round about nine o'clock, if I remember rightly, I said to Mrs. Hodson, can I take the children upstairs? I want to do an experiment. She said, OK. I mean, she's used to it by now. She's used to everything. So I took the children upstairs, and they got into bed. And in the next bedroom, in the small ball box room, Guy Playfair was there with his headphones on, and we put a microphone in, in the room I was in with the children, so he could hear all what was going on. Uh, and the barking and whistling was going on. Then I suddenly said, if you can bark and you can whistle, you can talk. Say my name. And for quite a while, nothing happened. Then suddenly it said, Morris. <laughs> <laughs> Good, some results. And then I challenged it again. I said, no, that's not my name, because I didn't hear it properly, you see. Got it right in front of my eyes, something like that. So I said, you know, say it again. This time it said, Morris, quite dear me. Then I challenged it to say, say Dr. Belloc. Dr. Belloc, one of my colleagues. We know, we've heard that. this. He's a very famous parapsychologist. And it said, Dr. Belloc. So I knew that we had a voice. Now, what was this voice? How did it work? First of all, when it starts to speak, I thought we had uh, a discarnate voice, what we call discarnate voice, a voice coming from nowhere out of the air. Then I began to realise when I watched the children more carefully, and watched Janet particularly more carefully, it was, seemed to be coming from her direction. Now, her lips weren't moving, her, li her mouth wasn't moving, her lips, a slight tremble on her lips, but that's all. But I noticed when the voice spoke, her chest went up. So I watched her very carefully. And then, after a while, I challenged her and I said, Janet, that voice is coming from you. She said, oh, no, it's not. I said, yes, yeah, it's coming from you, Janet. She said, not. I said, if it's not coming from you, where is it coming from? She said, it's coming from behind me. I said, uh, you sure? She said, absolutely certain. That voice is not coming from me, it's coming from behind me. So we did a test. Later on, sometime later, we did it. Just a simple test. Not terribly scientific, but a simple test. We put a microphone in front of her throat, and one on the back of her neck. And we found that the one on the back of her neck was louder than the one on her throat. Shouldn't be so. <laughs> Thanks for that. I mean, I'm presuming so. I mean, it's, it's an interesting case because, as I say, I think a lot of it was created by the two girls uh, to keep people around but i do also believe there was something going on in that house weird but who knows it makes for great movies apart from the the, the ones that they've made which have been bad <laughs> the end that was the enfield case known in france as the bob moraine case there's a ex terrible joke for you if you know old french video games well <laughs> okay that'll do for that bloody hell there's been a lack of content in this room up until that and then it's like have all the content but that's nah. all that's the trick of the disc that that's everything now you've seen it's, it's probably there's nothing more to see now nothing whatsoever imagine if we'd gone around the whole house and not gone into that cupboard and the, the end was just like <laughs> was like did did you didn't find anything did you because go so real sucker burn <laughs> and then he just it, disc ends <laughs> i would unironically love that but uh, oh my god and then burns out your hard drive <laughs> and then <laughs> destroys your computer what so is a picture of the uh Skeptic lady, how do you actually? Uh, there you go. Oh, there we go. Does anything ever frighten you? Ooh. Big question. Well, I've just realised we're actually missing the top off the stream. I can... There we are. Let me just check something. If I go back out, yeah, it's fine. Does anything ever frighten you? Lots of things have frightened me, but not ghostly things. In the course of investigating supposedly haunted places, I've been down in cellars with no lights on and no torch, just hoping something will come out of the slimy walls. Um, you know, I've slept in several bedrooms where I've been told you know, no one slept there for 20 years, and I sort of go to bed and go to sleep, um, you know, wishing something spooky would come along. As a child, I can certainly remember seeing apparitional type things and being frightened, but nowadays I would 
if I see something like that, I think, oh, there comes an apparition. Or, uh, I think it's my own mind, so it doesn't, it's not remotely frightening. I'm quite happy to go to bed at night, see all kinds of things being created by my mind, and, and they don't spook me. So the answer is no, but of course it might happen. I might get this terrible shock and, and one day go to a haunted place and, and, and uh, see that ghost that I so far don't believe in. Hmm. They regretted asking her to be on this disc. I just know for a fact. Imagine if you were Christopher Lee and you were building a house full of ghost facts. And then, because you ran out of time, we just put any old facts in, including the people who don't believe that your facts are real. You yes. just go ask to get all in. <laughs> Thank you, Paper Crane, for doing a sub there. 23 months. Thank you. <laughs> Trey says, The problem with a sceptic is that they will never accept evidence, no matter what it is, because they are too attached to being a sceptic. I think you're describing believers. Yeah, that, that's more than there's skeptics. A subtle, there's yeah. a subtle difference there. I do, mm. I do understand that some skeptics go in with a frame of mind where it, it's it they're, they're willing to knock things down before they even get started, but they tend to be the ones that are just all focused on themselves and their attention and and, and their standing. Most of the people who are in the skeptic communi community tend to be open minded. I, I would say I'm reasonably open minded because I've seen and experienced things that I can't explain. The difference is I just instantly don't go, well, then that's a ghost. It could be two ghosts. You it could know. be a bag of cats. <laughs> a bag of ghost cats. A ghost bag of ghosts. Let's stop this. That, uh, in a ghost world surrounded on a ghost planet. <laughs> Let's have a look at Robin Furman, ghost hunter. Robin Furman, ghost hunter. The case at the empty haunted church where uh, the team and I went to look because we'd been told by various students and people that they'd seen figures moving in the gloom there. This particular church I didn't know existed, but when we went there, figures did move in the gloom. There were tombstones which had been disturbed. This strange mist filtered into the church. The atmosphere was intensely oppressive. That was probably the most frightening case that we actually went to. Spooky church times. I mean, they're pretty I've, spooky. I've, I've been not so frightened on a ghost hunt, but I've certainly felt uneasy because, you know, you're in a foreign place you don't know in the dark at two in the morning on your own your natural you know your, your natural defenses kick in for self-preservation and you know i have bottled it once or twice i'll be honest but it doesn't mean i you know it, it doesn't necessarily mean i am afraid of the dark or afraid of the supernatural it just means you know it's just on it, it, it's, it's it's a strange sensation to be in a haunted house yeah, especially if you're led into a place and told it's haunted, that's half of you set up for that kind of frightening anyway, isn't it? You exactly. Know? Go on, Tony Cornell, tell us your fears so we may manipulate them against you. Like, Imagine if he just said one word and said, cancer, and then the video cut <laughs> off. <laughs> <It was> just... <laughs> yeah, keep it light, Tony. Yeah, <laughs> Come on, Tony. <laughs> we paid you five quid. It just comes up and says, sock puppets. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there was one case I think that was interesting from the point of view that uh, my fellow investigator and myself were somewhat scared. You, you get blasey about this, but we were we've said house, this, um, haven't we? An old house up in uh, the f in the Fens, north of Cambridge, and in a room that nobody would sleep in or live in because they said funny things happened to that, and they were using it to store furniture. And when they put electricity in the house, they put everything else but in that one room that we're in there. And sitting there, and we got all the other helpers, uh, actual members of the university society downstairs, doing a Ouija board, not to communicate, but to get every. We've literally heard that clip before, today. Weird. Bloody hell! Recycling already, guys. That's not on. I just looking... hung the same picture up twice. That's the problem, I think. <laughs> I'm going to uh, look at this spooky lamp. It's the Amateurville lamp. That is literally the Amateurville lamp, I think, as well. <laughs> it looks like it. Cool. Oh, you see, it, it has... Uh, it's got a false cursor, because it claims nothing's going to happen. But you uh, see a spooky skull. Ish. Mm. You just wouldn't turn it on if it did that, then, would you? See, no, you definitely wouldn't. It's probably a novelty one from, like, I don't know, Hawkins Bazaar or something. Now I want to click on these in case there's a spooky thing... No, no, no axe. No. Why give it? Why give it space on the disc if you can't click it? It's an odd one, isn't it? It really is. 
no, that's not happening. Well, oh. we're finished in this room. Oh, well, this was the um, room of anecdotes. I can't wait yeah. for the next room. That, that, that is the room of anecdotes done. There's the pictures up the top there again. Well, can we look at these? No. Perhaps you can, you go no. up the stairs. Right, we did all round the front bit here, didn't we? Yeah, I do remember that. So now, the library. Oh, nice. Ooh. It's full of books. Let's see. Actually, it's not full of books. It's full of VHSs that are hidden in plastic book-looking <laughs> cupboards. I was going to say, I haven't seen those for years. That's a lie, actually. I think Peter's got some in his office. I was going to say, he must have. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> oh! The Book of Hauntings. Can you imagine how disappointed it is to try and do jump skirts in a 1990s CD-ROM game when they don't <laughs> have the speed to deliver on the fright? <laughs> wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute. And there we are. It's like, uh, we're going to do a big boo. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Right, let's see what the ashtray is. Nothing. Oh. Nothing. It's not nothing. This green ashtray, the Can emerald we catch it? No. No. Mm. What about the window? Can we look out of the window at spookiness? No. Nope. Literally unclickable. Blimey. What about this little thing? No, it's a. Is it a little ladder? Yeah, step posh thing? step ladder. Yeah. It's not that high a shelf. Well, yeah, I'm guessing the skull is something, but that seems to be it around here. Oh, I thought I found something hidden. This is that logic in games I don't like, where sometimes I understand it because you just want to build a world, you don't want to put detail into everything, but like, don't put doors in a room if you can't open doors. You know what I mean? Don't put books on a shelf in a game if you can't click them. It's nothing sort of breaks the immersion more than, no, no, that's not part of the game. You know? Yeah. Go on then. Let's have a look at this incredibly badly rendered skull. Betiscombe Manor is quiet these days. But it was not always so. The villagers in this lonely nook of the Dorset countryside still recalled tales of a terrifying scream that was said to originate from a skull kept in the manor. Oh. In 1685, oh. <laughs> Azriah Pinney, the Lord of Bettiscombe Manor, was banished to the West Indies for his allegiance to the Duke of Monmouth. A man of acute business sense, Pinney made good his exile and prospered in the godforsaken colony, accruing a vast fortune which was turned over to his heirs on his death. Two generations were to pass before any of Azariah's kin dared set foot on English soil. It was his grandson, John Frederick, who returned to England in 1734 to reclaim the family seat in Dorset, bearing considerable riches and a Negro servant from the Isles. However, shortly after their arrival in the country, Frederick's manservant, Isaac, was stricken with a malady that racked his body for days and only eased when the wretched fellow approached death. It was on his deathbed that old Isaac, who had served the family well, pleaded with his master that he must be taken back to his homeland for burial. If not, a terrible curse would befall the manor and all who lived therein. A phlegmatic man, John Frederick was not given to superstition, and duly ignored his slave's dying wish, discreetly burying his body in the local churchyard. It was then that the howling came. At first, many thought it a prank played by schoolchildren, defying one another to remain in the churchyard after dark. But when one of the youngsters returned home, ashen-faced and shaking with fear after hearing a strange groan emerge from one of the graves, the games stopped and few would enter the graveyard again. And the wailing continued, louder than ever, a wild, keening sound that chilled the soul and which could be heard for miles around. The villagers knew the source of the shrieking. But Frederick would not heed their desperate pleas and refused to disinter the remains of his servant. And so the howling was joined by tremors and thunderclaps that shook the very foundations of Bettiscombe Manor. It seemed as if Isaac's corpse had risen from his defiled grave and was hammering angrily at the doors and shutters of his former household. If Isaac couldn't rest in peace, 
neither would his master. The din was appalling, but it had its desired effect, almost. Finally, two sleepless months after Isaac's burial, John Frederick wearily succumbed to the inevitable and exhumed the body of his servant. In such haste was the deed done that Isaac's rotting head was rudely detached from his body. Yet rather than return Isaac's complete remains to the West Indies, Frederick shipped his body back for burial, but kept the skull as a ghoulish memento of his recent travels. The skull was deposited in the loft, and the Lord of Bediscombe Manor retired for an early night, comforted by the belief that he had done all in his power to appease Isaac's vengeful spirit and a blissful silence descended upon the village once more. And so it stayed, until John Frederick's own death a decayed later. However, the new occupant of the manor, William Thornton, had not been appraised of the skull's presence, and upon seeing its ghastly village, had it thrown into a pond behind the house. He instantly learned the error of his hasty actions, as an ear-splitting scream rent the air and drove him to the sanctuary of his manor. Quick were his neighbours to inform him of the nature of the cry and the penalty for ignoring old Isaac's wishes. But Thornton was a proud man and steadfastly rejected any attempts to retrieve the skull and let it defile his house again. No matter how much Isaac's ghost bellowed into the night sky or raged against the manor with his phantom fists, Thornton would not yield. Nor would he accept the accusation that Isaac's clamorous protestations were responsible for an unaccountable crop failure that year or for the mysterious death of livestock in the region. It was to prove a fatal stand. On a bitterly cold January morning, the Lord of Bettiscombe Manor was found in a state of collapse by the edge of the pond, dressed only in a sodden nightshirt. Driven mad with fatigue, his spirit had finally broken, and he had stayed up the long night, raking the pond for the accursed skull to no avail. He spent the rest of his short, tormented life on a sickbed in the wing furthest from the pond, but he could not shut out the damnable screeching. Within a year of taking possession of Bettiscombe Manor, William Thornton, a man of rugged health and fierce temperament, was dead, having faded to a shambling shadow of his former self. After his funeral, held many miles from Isaac's former resting place, a handful of villagers recovered the screaming skull from the pond, stole into Bettiscombe Manor under cover of dark, and restored the dread relic to the loft. And there it languished, content and quiet, for well over a hundred years, as each of the manor's subsequent proprietors wisely paid greater heed to the legend of the screaming skull than their ill-fated predecessors. Most would never visit the loft, lest they encounter Isaac's spectre in a less charitable mood. But when Bettiscombe Manor passed into the hands of Charles Pomeroy in the early part of this century, events took a bizarre turn. The new owner, a modern gentleman of liberal disposition promptly removed the skull, now encrusted in dust and a curiously sticky residue, had it polished and reinstated the grisly heirloom to a more prominent position in the household. It was a well-meaning gesture and an effort on Pomeroy's part to return some measure of dignity to the memory of a former resident of the manor. He could not have imagined what followed. On the eve of the Great War, a torrent of blood issued from the cracks in Isaac's newly veneered skull, staining the mantelpiece on which it stood, and the blood would not cease. 
So shocked were visitors to the manor that Pomeroy was forced to return the weeping artifact to the loft. There it remained, reportedly oozing blood when the outbreak of war was imminent. Peace now reigns at Betterscombe Manor. But should anyone ever be tempted to remove the skull from its adopted home, old Isaac's spirit will scream the place down. What a load of old bollocks. <laughs> really was, some horrible bastards being dreadful with some poor sod's head, basically. Do you want to know the big twist to that, though? Go on. 1960, they did a study of the skull and found out it's actually not of a slave, but rather of a woman from two or three thousand years previous. Oh. And the skull that still exists in that house is in a bureau, and they just keep it locked up apparently in there now. But yeah, uh, when it was studied in the 60s, they just found, oh yeah, it looks like it belonged to a woman from about two, three thousand years ago. So he possibly he sent Isaac's skull back, or Isaac wasn't even existing. I don't know. Or didn't even exist. As I seem to remember, there's one story about it where <laughs> this doesn't make sense logically at all. But apparently, Isaac and the uh, the uh, they had a fight, the two of them, and no one knew who won the fight. But whoever it was was the skull. And so it's like, how do you lose ninety five percent of two bodies, but only <laughs> have the skull left over, and that it doesn't even tell you who the winner of the fight was. How has that all lost the time? Bloody hell. That's... Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I haven't even got a comment for that, my God. But here's the thing. Was it just nice to s sit back and have Christopher Lee tell you a ghost story? That, that's the price is worth paying for this already with that. Yes. It certainly was. Although he did say village rather than visage at one point. Which is a rare <laughs> Christopher Lee error. What we should cherish. <laughs> That's what happens when you haven't got time to read the script and they plonk you down in front of some idiot boards and say, action! That is exactly what happened. Yeah, I would dare say. Uh, right, oh. So, somebody said, apparently the entire Book of Hauntings, which is like a load of old photos of, you know, old photos, sorry, pictures of, you know, supposed ghosts and things, is hidden in here somewhere. And I noticed Fine. the book that flies past is the Book of Hauntings. But I can't, you yeah. can't click on it. Just got it. problem with these is because they're so oblique sometimes it might be like even time sensitive like you've got to click on everything first and then come back to this room and then then it's accessible you know it's that kind of stuff i don't think this is that one advanced that one there's only one puzzle in the whole game apparently Although this could be it though and it might be rock art <laughs> yes, yes, yeah bloody hell you could be right actually i hadn't thought of that uh no that's not gonna happen i would imagine if there is the book of hauntings it would be in here somewhere wouldn't it but, yeah hmm. Right, we'd better do one more than finish up the evening, I suppose. Mr. Yes, King. it's been a lovely evening of ghost fun. Ooh. I actually think I like this better than the first CD, because I just think the atmosphere is better, even if it's still reasonably lacklustre. Yep. Oh, according to Zap, Roused Hour. Roused Hour. He's on... The book is on the other side of the room. Oh. I was going to say, yeah, maybe we should look for where it comes from, rather than where it's going to. Oh. I, th I thought this was going to be a thing, but it's not a thing. Is this a uh. thing? No. Oh, well, fuck it. Well, I mean, it literally is a it. thing, but it's not a no, good it's, thing. Yeah, it's just a thing. Because one of my one of the bucket list things I got to do was my one of my favorite films of all time, hands down, is Robert Wise's The Haunting. Uh, I think that's one of the bestest films ever, and um, I got to stay in the house where they filmed it because it's in the UK oh, where they. I never well, knew that. Certain the exteriors were shot in um, the UK, uh, but the interiors were all soundstage. But yeah, I got to stay in that house. And it's, in itself, it is a haunted house, but it's beautiful. I loved it. It was great walking up the big long path to it and seeing it there just like it was in the movie. It is a bloody good film, The Haunting. I need to find out what the building's called again. I forget now. Obviously, you're referring to the Catherine Zeta-Jones version. Yeah, yes. I am. That is the best <laughs> film ever. You know what? There's recently an article online trying to reappraise that lo load of garbage. It's awful. And it's Yander a terrible bon, remake it. of a great film. Oh yeah, but Yann de Bon says it wasn't meant, not meant to be a remake. If it hadn't been called The Haunting, it would have been just been Scary House. Except that 95% of the plot is taken from the book, so I yeah. can see why people might have been confused. Um, I mean, what? Oh my god. 
Well, this yeah. is spooky story man here. Apparently, it's on the table, the Book of Hauntings. Oh, look, oh, fucking hell. Oh. It wasn't exactly hard to find at the end of the day. <laughs> just have to turn around. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look. Sp spooky, spooky, spooky skeletons. Oh, God, look at this. Oh, wow. This Amazing. Is every haunted house in the UK? Apparently. Oh, we've got little weird pictures, look. Of Basil Fawlty come back from the dead. Ettington Park is the name of the house for the haunted ah. house haunted, from the original haunted movie. God, I just love the haunting. This is kind of great. Loads of information. It is great. Yeah, look at this stuff. Arundel Castle. It's a grundle. We're still on A, you know, assembly rooms. Oh, in Edinburgh. Ooh. In Bath, apparently, these ones. Oh. Oh, okay. Because there are Edinburgh assembly rooms in Edinburgh as well. Aren't oh, there? yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Athol Hampton. Hampton. They've done a ghost hunt there of uh, Most Haunted. Mm. But most of the places in this book have probably been defiled by the Most Haunted team. <laughs> <laughs> Ale Merton. Somewhere in Norfolk, that one. But I'm not aware of a spook. Blazing House, Baynard's Park, Bolu Abbey. Ooh. I've been there. Beckles. <laughs> Beckles is fairly local. Haunted. Beckles is home to several ghosts, some of which live within the grounds of Roos Hall, one of England's most well-known haunted places. Who are boy? Um, Roos Hall also sounds like someone who used to appear in Heidi High as a bit character. <laughs> a phantom coach and four horses. Oh yeah, there we go. Couldn't make that out first. Uh, 50 Barclay Square. Oh, that's a very famous one. Uh, yeah, although yeah. they believe that was largely bollocks now. Uh, I've heard the name, but Berry Pomeroy. Betterscombe Manor. Well, you literally there just told us the bloody story of that. Great, lad. that. Um, oh, the house bled. Bisham Abbey. Blickling Hall. Oh, Blickling Hall's very close to up in round Blickling Hall. Oh. Um, I think you tend to go to the grams more than internally, but. Yeah. Oh. I believe that uh, the ghost of Anne Boleyn, apparently. Mm, She's meant to have fought like three or four places, though. She gets about. She's got a uh, zero hour contract, you see. Just has to be. Ah, there you working. go. Yeah. He's freelance. Yeah. Borley Rectory, Rectory, of course. Bramber Castle. Bamba Gascoigne. No, Bramshot to believe. <laughs> Bamba Gascoigne was haunted, but that's a personal <laughs> issue we can't go into. <laughs> Breed Place. That's a, that's a spooky old image there. Oh, yeah. Mm. Brooklyn's, Brooklyn's Racetrack. Okay. Oh, I don't know. I don't like the idea of animals and ghosts. It's boring to me. I never get scared by ghostly animals. Yeah, like the ghost squirrel that showed earlier in this book. So, yeah. You know, it's a bit more comedic than anything. Canterbury Cathedral, Capesthorn Hall, Castle Rising, Charlton House, Chingle Hall with the blue hand. There was a film out a few years ago about that called Chingle All The Way. God, I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> Christ's College, Clandon Park, Claydon House. God, they, they've done their research, and by research, copied and pasted <laughs> up to their CD-ROM. <laughs> Cleopatra's, Needle. Cleopatra's Needle's Haunted. I've never heard of that in passing. I've never heard of time. that. I know this, they think it might be cursed because, you know, they nicked it from Egypt, but... This three-and-a-half-year-old granite obelisk was transported from Egypt and now stands on the banks of the River Thames between the Waterloo and Hungerford Bridges. It is not the monument that is said to be haunted, but the area surrounding it. Mocking laughter has been heard there, as well as the sound of anguished, painful cries. Police... Yeah, that's because there's a comedy club nearby, so that explains that. <laughs> I guess why I've been there. Police have also <laughs> noticed that most of the suicides that take place on the stretch of the river are generally carried out near the giant monument. Well, that's, that's just because people right. jump there, isn't it? You know. There is a story oh. involving a tall, nude figure that runs from behind the obelisk, jumps onto its base, and then throws itself into the river. According to legend, however, there is never a splash, and the water never ripples. Or, it's called Saturday Night in London, when you see a pisshead. Yeah. Clifton Hampton. I had a case of that once. Doesn't half clear up if you put some uh, yoghurt in the area. <laughs> Corpus Christi, Cottage Craster Tower... Crown Hotel. That's an image. Nice. I wonder if Black Shook's going to be in here or somewhere. Well, actually, probably not the uh, in this bit. But Dacre Castle. East Riddleston Hall. Oh, that's on the cover, that image. I there we go. And as uh, Pseudo Sapin pointed out, 
to me. This is often a little tangent, but that film I was talking about earlier, Pulse, about the horror film Electricity. There's a ghost story about that because there's a famous picture of a, a tube thing. And someone gets, oh no, I'm getting my stories confused. Ignore me, I'm getting my stories confused because I was thinking about the tube picture there where they saw someone being electrocuted. But it couldn't have been a ghost, but it was probably a poster of the nearby ex execution exhibition. I've ruined everything. Moving on. <laughs> Here's a swirly Epworth Old Rectory. Farnham Castle, Farnham Church, Felbrick. Felbrick Hall, that's local, isn't it? Yeah. 17th century house in Norfolk was once the home of a man named John Wyndham. He made many alterations to the house, including the addition of a library. He has been seen on many occasions by a number of people and always in the library. He was seen sitting in a big armchair looking through the books he lovingly brought to Felbrick. That's the kind of ghost I want to be like. The kind of ghost who just sits around and reads in a nice chair for all eternity. It's, it's a lot better than, um, I don't know, having to scream your skull and bleed everywhere, really, isn't it? Yeah, because, well, I mean, it's strange, that whole story about that you must take my body back to my village and blah, blah, blah. And it's like... What did he say? Say, like, mate, uh, it's out of my hands. It's not on. It's not my rules. It's the rules of the village. So you know, <laughs> then he dies, and it's like, what? I've got to. I've got to scream every night now. No one wins in this circumstance. <laughs> I don't get buried at home. Then why didn't they just send the skull back? Well, we know why they didn't send the skull back because it wasn't that guy's skull, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Daxi and Preston, you'll need another fifteen years on those hot dogs, mate. But uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Ford Abbey Formby Coast Oh, this not Black Shook, it's a different one The sand dunes and shoreline of Formby Coast on Merseyside Merseyside, they're reputedly Mersey. haunted by a phantom black dog called Old Trash Of course, Scouts has come up with a name like that <laughs> the, the coastly hound has been seen by few people and is thought to have huge luminous eyes the sight of which will bring grave misfortune to the onlooker one Halloween night, two reporters went to Formby in the hope they might catch a glimpse of old trash. <laughs> just, just give the cinema when it's showing Keith Lemon the movie. <laughs> just as midnight was approaching, one of the men saw a dark shape circling the top of a sand dune. As they moved closer, they saw the shape of a dog. But as soon as they reached the top of the dune, the figure vanished. The sand was undisturbed. Whatever they had seen had made no footprints. Two drunk guys thought they saw a dog. Brilliant. Yeah. What a fucking story that is. Well done, what they guys. saw was a car in the distance with its headlights on. Oh, no. Bloody hell. Is Gorsworth Hall. Oh. Ooh, spooky. Glastonbury Abbey. Oh. Great Melton. Yeah. Oh, that's local, look, Norwich, Wyndham. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's mm. quite spooky around you then, isn't it, apparently? Yeah. Especially the way you pronounce Wyndham when it's clearly spelt Wymondham. <laughs> We've got a lot of those. Postwick is pronounced Posick. Uh, the best one is Haysborough, which is uh, Happersburg. But, I'm uh, sure they do it just to, you know, weed out the people who aren't local. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Somebody's <laughs> dropped a, some sort of puppet in a lake. That's interesting. Yeah, one... That's a horrible puppet to find. Gunby Hall. Ham House. Oh! Hey! Blimey. I, I just like the name Ham House. It sounds like yeah. a. Comedy series written by Mr. Weeble or something. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> about some... Or some new Noel Edmonds project. Oh my god. <laughs> no. Noel ha Edmonds, Ham House. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck me, here's Haysborough. I talked it up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> One of the most hideous ghosts of all time haunted this Norfolk town in the 1800s and was spotted by local farmers on many occasions. This ghost appeared as a legless human torso without legs or drunk its head dangling down its back attached by a cord of flesh Ugh. don't need the h in that the guys it was seen floating from the sea to an ancient well where it had been but where it would put down the sack that it had been carrying right the farmers who had been so disturbed with this gruesome sight decided to search the well and a sliced up human cadaver was discovered it is thought that the murdered man was a smuggler who lost his life after a fight with some companions over some stolen goods that will do it now, I've been to Haysborough many times. It has never once had a spook mentioned. Hmm. Yeah, because a lot of these things, like we found out on the last disc, like, here's a ghost of a lake, and I typed in the lake name in Wikipedia and whatever, and it's like, here's the history of the lake. No, it's ghost stories attached. No ghost stories anywhere. You think, where did these stories come from? Where do they go? Where did they come from? Cotton Eye Joe. Cotton Eye Joe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a spooky black dog with... with roller skates on is yeah. what is that it's a, ro it's a roller skating dog ghost 
<laughs> Sounds like a rejected Hanna Barbera cartoon. <laughs> Jesus Christ! They tried every idea. <laughs> oh dear! Just, oh, quick! Let's jump through this. Lime Park. Okay. Lime Hall. Make one priory. Minister Lovell Hall. This is really. For, this is a lovely little addition, isn't it? Yeah, and as I say, you get your money's worth with this, if nothing else. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing if there's yeah, more local ones. One. One. Mel's spelt M E O L S. It's a place in the Wirral. Ah. Weird. I wonder if they got these photos from somewhere and did them themselves. I hope they did them themselves because I want to see what shit stock library has and all this garbage in it. <laughs> <laughs> Cherry pick. Shaftesbury Abbey. You just wants a hug. No, oh, poor ghost. He wants his cuddles. <laughs> speak hall oh yeah, speak hall in Liverpool. That's Ooh. nice and spooky. I think that's even got some uh, secret <laughs> corridors and stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Michael speak. Okay. The temple. There's a royal Drury lane. There's a royal Portsmouth. That oh, I did a ghost hunt there because I performed there. That that's an image. That looks like Biffo. <laughs> Spooky Does digitizer. <laughs> I see where you're oh, no, coming sorry, from. it's not. It's Charlie Brooker. I, I take ah, that back. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thetford Warren House. This is local. Go on. This 700-year-old house was once a leper's sanctuary, and to this day, the begging bowls and bells that belong to the inmates can be seen. One inhabitant of the century has returned as a ghost and is frequently seen by local people who are shocked by his horrific appearance. The spirit is surrounded by a foul smell and is dressed in tatters. His eyes appear to be burning red and his, fate is, his face is flat and pale. Tintagel, Tower of London, Treasurer's House, Therese, University College, Gower Street, Watton Priory. Oh, where's me head? Queen Yarnham there. Uh, Waxham <laughs> Hall. This Norfolk mansion houses no less than five ghosts, all of which are knights who died during battle. They phoned that section in. It was yeah. like, just bang it out, Waxham Hall, we got nothing. Yeah, I know they're ghosts, knights. What are they doing in there? I don't know. Nah, they all died there. Sod it. Next chapter. Windsor Castle. That's just um, Prince Philip, I think. Yeah, he will. I wonder if any of the rules we have now will ever come back as ghosts. Like if you if very late at night, if you listen carefully, you can hear him saying something racist on the wind. <laughs> Not gonna give an example. Um, <laughs> York Minster. This beautiful cathedral has two ghosts. One is an elderly gentleman who attends services. Sure, that's a ghost or just a man. The other is a figure in medieval clothing who has been seen carving wood. Alright, keep them busy. Mm. Whittling. Yeah, whittling other ghosts. Right, I reckon we should continue on from this guy's doubtless riveting story next time. Is that one of the craze? Because it looks like it. Oh, God, I'm going to click on it. <laughs> it looks less like one of the craze now. Actually, shall we finish on this riveting story? Shall we finish on uh, one of the great craze? Yeah, why not? Why not? Approached the, the abbey, walking across the fields over a fence, looked up, could see the abbey and what looked like a procession of monks or hooded monks. Couldn't see any faces or anything but there were definitely monks walking towards the abbey. At this point we uh, heard a cough which sent shivers down my spine and as, as a group of three of us we all turned and ran and leaving the scene just as fast as we could. Having prepared yourself to actually believe uh, that they, they existed, to actually encounter something and, and feel something then gives you the exact opposite of saying they don't exist they can't be happening to me then they don't exist at all it's very very um very difficult to to um to get your mind around it oh that that was good Amazing. that was almost literally nothing that, that's astonishing we couldn't see what they were but they were definitely monks I'm surprised there's all those volumes of the history of Surrey that. Honestly, yeah, don't... fucking Christopher Lee was really interested in Surrey. Clearly, yeah, maybe it's a very haunted place. Mm. I don't know. Your ghost story has to be better than we all ran because someone coughed. <clears throat> it's got to be. It has to be better than that. Oh, oh go oh. on. We should probably actually let's finish with a tiny anecdote let's... from Christopher Lee. Yeah, we have to end with Lee. Unless you want your luck to make a turn for the worse, never sit in another person's chair soon after they have left it. 
<laughs> the bloody hell was that? He's turned into the pub drunk. Sir Christopher, <laughs> what's going on? Bloody I thought he was going to tell the story about that pub that had that chair. And this, the, it, used to, it used to be the chair of the guy who always is at the pub. And one day he died, and then someone sat in the chair, and then they died. And then the next the next week, someone sat in the chair, and they died. So then, long story short, the, ch the pub still has the chair in it, but it's now attached to the wall on the ceiling, so no one else dies if they sit in it. Bloody hell. I thought it was going to be it. Instead, Christopher Lee just said, yeah, here's another old wives' tale. I'm going to the pub. <laughs> Hang on. I'll, I'll just make this one up. Something about if you, if you sit in a chair, uh, you'll hurt your legs. Yeah. I'm half expecting, like, we click on a ladder next and say, like, don't walk under a ladder or you shall have <laughs> bad luck. So I, th I think we may have finished this room, actually, Paul. <laughs> There's nothing else to work on. <laughs> what a high point to end on. Oh, Media Design Interactive, they want you to know they made this. Is this the credits? Yeah. Weird. Just There's something about the 90s where they thought, oh, let's break the system down and put credits at the start of the game. Or somewhere near the end, like the other one. Yeah. yeah. Sort of random door. Yeah, Janet Board for Tea and Photo Library. I imagine that came. Oh, special thanks to Adam Hart Davis there. Oh, maybe he'll pop up a bit later. Yeah, was there a spot? Yeah. Yeah. Bloody hell. Mind you, he's not in the contributors bit, so probably not, actually. Uh, no Father Lionel Fanthorpe, though. They kept him back for the next one. Yeah. Mind you, he wasn't he... so much into ghosts, was he, to be fair? No. He was. He, he, they spent all their money on Christopher Lee, so they had to save what was left for the next one. Which I think is a perfectly fair decision to make. Well, I'm enjoying this one quite yeah. considerably. It's it's this is better fun than the other one. I thought it wouldn't be as good because it's all ghosts, but actually, it's yeah. yeah, just nicely presented. And Christopher Lee is, of course, mm -mm -mm, the king of reading stuff. Because you know, it, this it could be the exact same disc, but if you replaced Christopher Lee with I don't know Paul say, Ross, Joe Joe Pasquale, <laughs> it would ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> I want to tell you a story about a ghost. Don't sit in a chair. <laughs> you won't like it. <laughs> you won't like it, Aladdin. Right. Uh, I th did we look at the? We did look at the deep sea diver helmet. So we're yeah. into the doors behind now, aren't we? Yeah. I think we'll use the uh, as the helmet as a as a as a as a flag for our next location next time we come back. Excellent. Thank you to Blindio10 there. Ah, fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us there, Mr. Paul. My pleasure. I'm going to go get some food now because I have my rumbly tumkin. Oh, you don't want that going on. No. So I will leave you for now. Have a lovely time. Bye-bye, boys and girls. Mr. Boys and girls and Mrs. Ladies and Gentlemen. I'll see you next time. <laughs> Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Let's go back to the House of Spooks for our... This is our third assault, I believe, isn't it? On the... Um, yeah. Christopher Lee's haunted, haunted pad. House of Mysteries. Yeah. Right. Oh, I oh, seem to that the house itself you. isn't haunted, but merely full of haunted items and stories. It's a bit of a lie on his part. Uh, uh, we did see, like, a ghost at one stage, or an image of a ghost flick up, didn't we? Did we? Yeah, I think there was. Apparently most of them are random, somebody said. But whether that's true oh. or not, I don't actually oh, know. Oh, and there was that floating book as well. Yes, the book was flying around, repeatedly flying around, actually. That is entirely true. Mm. Right. Oh, I take it back. Boop. There we are. I reckon it's just Christopher Lee pissing around with us, personally. Yeah, he's like uh, the guy from the film, the remake of The House on Haunted Hill, where he puts a bunch of CGI and computers in there to make it look like a haunted house, but it's not really a haunted house until later in the film. It really is a haunted house. Oh, that's one of those films that's kind of fun, but by the end of it, so little of it has worked, and the ending is just yeah. kind of... Uh, yeah. But still, I, I, it was interesting because... All, well, is this, I, this is where I disagree. I think 13 Ghosts is far better. That's just oh, my opinion. The whole of that Dark Castle brand was designed to remake William Castle films, which is mm. why you've got 
Ghost Ship and 13 Ghosts and The House on Haunted Hill. And if it had been more successful, we would have had a Tingler remake. Oh, my God. The one with the electric yeah. seats. Yeah. Yeah, the one with that. I might have to go and rewatch 13 Ghosts, though. I mean, they're, they're not great horror films at all, but 13 Ghosts, I think, is a more interesting story. And the set design of the actual haunted house is brilliant. It's like one of the most amazing sets I've seen. I think I was annoyed because the ghosts were intriguing and the house was great, but they felt wasted. Like... Yeah, well, unfortunately, if you got the DVD, you had a really interesting kind of Word document where it had the backstory of all the ghosts and how they were caught and what they were in life and how they died and what ghosts they were. Like, oh, like that's a, a what I in the film. It was fascinating. It was like, yeah. So it's, you know, it was interesting, um, but I wish it had been in the film, yeah. Oh, bloody hell. Mm, right, I'm going yeah, to have to see that out, actually. Yeah, and as someone points out, House on Haunted Hill does have a cameo from Jeffrey Coombs, so that does make it a little bit better. Do you know, I wouldn't have, I probably didn't know who Jeffrey Coombs was when I watched that. Oh, that was back in the day when I was just first discovering him, like in the mid-90s when it was like, who's that crazy guy in The Frighteners I like? Oh, he's in Reanimator. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, he's in this. Oh, he's in that. I went to watch The Frighteners about six months ago, so I had a copy and I've never seen it, to discover it's a bloody HD DVD. <laughs> oh. So, um, yeah, wasn't going to be actually playing <laughs> that. I've bought it on Blu-ray and I will get around to watching it now. But I'm going to watch yeah. it Halloween, but bloody didn't. Yeah, I love The Frighteners. I'm very fond of it. It's Michael J. Fox, if I remember, isn't it? Yeah, great. it's got a great cast, and I like the fact that it starts off quite light and frivolous, but the last half hour is actually quite grim and, and, and scary. Mm. Oh, God, anyway, that. let's look around yeah. <clears throat> Chris Belize's yes. House of Becomes film 2021. Rose in Shadows, thank you for the uh, 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 bits there, just trying to find what they said. I found a slideshow demo of this thing on a cover disc. Excited to see the full... Yeah! The sequel to this weird, they gave the whole thing away on cover discs, famously, which was pretty well, cool. I don't know if you want to repeat what uh, Chinny said to you. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yes. And Drive Shaft. Yeah. Thank you very much for a sub as well. So Chinny Hill 10, uh, who is a friend of the channel and also the discoverer of Maywood. So he gets special points. Uh, the people who made this CD-ROM and weird for it was the same company went to his school and gave a talk about their company and making multimedia stuff and that. And as far as we can tell, went bust about 14 seconds afterwards. But uh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It, it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to have in your school rather than, you know, the stranger means danger policeman who comes in or the Green Cross Code man who's yeah. not really the Green Cross Code man. Or Norfolk Youth for Christ who are sort of weirdly yeah. creepy. Yeah. Mm. What host snorkers? Thank you very much for the sub there. Hope to see you at an event next year. Hopefully, if there are any. Uh, right, I, th I seem to think we've done this diving mask thing. Yes, I think we looked at it. Did we? Yeah, let's click. I can't remember where we stopped. Along oh, God, he's off. You. He caught the bug for underwater exploration. Unfortunately, a rather large octopus caught him. Ooh. Who was that? Did you say Jacques Cousteau? I don't know, Schmelik. Thank you for the sub. Um... Let's just see if we can get that again. See if we can boost his volume a bit for the people at home. I'm not actually sure we can. It gives the annoying way it comes through. But I'm going to bloody try. I'm going to bloody do try. do it, guys. brother. There we are. Right. Go again, Chris, Christoph Lee. This diver's helmet belonged to Mr. Montague. He caught the bug for underwater exploration. Unfortunately, a rather large octopus caught him. I can't remember. Was Mr. Montague the man who owns this house who was once, it, like, I can't, I can't remember now what the no. backstory to this house was. It was like, was it his house or a house of a ghost investigator and you could look around it? Either way, I don't think Mr. Montague existed and was eaten by an octopus. Yeah, but basically that's just bullshit, I think, is that Christopher Lee, very nicely narrated bullshit there. Mm. Caramu96, right. thank you for the bits and thank you for the amazing uh, Cheetah Man emoji by the looks of it. Right. Um, right left or right? So we did the friend. library, didn't we? Yeah. Oh, let's do left. Always going to left. I think, isn't that a rule for getting out of a maze? Always stick to the left hand side. Yes, and you'll get there eventually. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, down into the depths oh, of the Oh, going down. Now we know Ooh. from horror tropes that this is a bad idea, so I'm already frightened. We've got some nice lighting, though. Can we... You know, for. 
That's some big real estate for his house underneath. This is huge. Yeah, bloody hell. But he's got, there's going to be wine bottles down here, I bet you. I bet. Yeah, or crates oh, 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 of mysterious oh. origin. Yes. Oh, no, there are wine. What oh, he it? likes his wine, though. Somehow he's managed to run a wire down here for an internet connection. Interesting. Unless it's just oh, that makes me, desktop. makes me worry about what he's up to in his, <laughs> in his, his basement web lab. <laughs> Christopher Lee's wank den. We've found it, everybody. <laughs> This, this is, this is, his handle online is pissed off <laughs> <laughs> uh, Right, well, he's got some sort of... Uh, well, we're going to have to take a step back to view that, I think. Whatever he's got on his projector. Mm -hmm. We found his files. Din, 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 din. That's good. Oh, he's got a few. Oh, he's got a... Oh! oh that's okay. it. It's just, just some liquid. There's nothing else can we look at the top you can't touch it no so the top one you can't look at the middle one's just got some liquid and this one does have a something Ooh, oh hang on let's watch the sony dat tape or whatever it is <laughs> someone got a sony laptop and had access to a lot of sony <laughs> icons and graphics <laughs> so, qm squirrel says so this is where christopher lee plays meridian 47 <laughs> It's just a game I haven't heard a reference to in like 15 years. I love the concept he's sitting down here with some early MMO RPG, desperately waiting for EverQuest to be invented. Oh my god. Right, let's see what's on this. Oh, hang on. Ghosts and technology. Oh, here we go. Let's ask oh, Sue, Sue Blackmore, Black yeah, no. the sensible one. Do you believe yeah. there is fraudulence involved in lab experiments? Don't they mean fraud? Said, yeah. Wouldn't that just be, do you believe there is fraud? Because fraudulence is like a different conjugation, isn't it? Yeah. Perhaps they said flatulence, and they just spelt it down. There's right. probably definitely flatulence in lab experiments. Yeah, doubtless. Oh, my God. She's going to say, yeah. Rodney Mitchell will describe Robo Ghost. <laughs> oh, my God. I Please be a Godfrey, it's a Godfrey is. Ho film, I'm convinced. <laughs> part robot, all part ghost, all cop. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, right, we're going for it. That's a very difficult question and I don't know the answer. Thanks. I have been involved in <laughs> sure, cases <laughs> where I suspected that fraud was involved and even then I couldn't be absolutely sure that it was. There are very few experiments that reliably get good results. At the moment, the Gansfeld experiments done by Charles Onerton in the States stand up as the most uh, impressive laboratory results that there are. Now, I don't know how those came about. If those experiments have been done the way they are written up in the literature, then then it looks as though they're due to psi because they certainly couldn't be due to sensory leakage. But, but fraud is a very difficult one. You, you never can completely rule out fraud. However hard you try, there's always somebody who could come and cheat. Um, Somebody who's designed the experiment can always see a, a way around it. Someone who's written the programs that run it can always see a, a way around it. It's very, very difficult to design a foolproof experiment. What makes that not important in most of science is that we have theories that get better and better and better, and a little bit of fraud along the way won't matter. The problem is in the realm of ghosts and psychic phenomena that we don't have good theories, and we're always relying on one great proof, and if that's fraudulent, the whole thing falls down. I, I think it's sad to say some of the the most important psychic experiments have been fraudulent, like Sol's experiments in the 1940s. Um, but as for all the ones today, I don't know. Hmm. Maybe it's some bastard Something. making stuff up. Well, the interesting thing about this is that when it... <sighs> When it comes to how do you prove the supernatural, the hardest part of it is the reproduction of those uh, events, if any happen. And as a result, it's almost theoretically, if you even believe in the paranormal for a smidgen, there's always a possibility that you could see something, it proves ghosts, it, you know, completely, but you can never replicate it and you can never prove it again. And that might be your one and done thing. So when it comes to like science experiments, they're, they're limited by the factors. First of all, they don't know what the paranormal is. So how at all do you measure it? So people put their own limiters in. They put their own kind of uh, checks and balances. And if they come close to appeasing those, then yeah, oh, we've got something spooky. But at the same time, those checks and balances could be biased. So it's a really difficult, almost impossible thing to approve supernatural uh, events in laboratory conditions. Mm -hmm. True of many things, but especially something so, well, ethereal as the ethereal, basically. 
<laughs> how do you get a ghost in your lab? Because a lot of them test cheese. I don't know. Yeah, you you put ghost cheese on ghost string and you just pull <laughs> it across the ground. <laughs> There's one that was a headless um, Victorian. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> yeah, but again, it's like I think a lot of the exact tests he was talking about were not so much can we make a ghost appear because that was an experiment done in I want to say Canada. It was like the Kevin Project or something or the Keith Project. It's something daft like that. But basically, these scientists created a ghost that haunted them just through force of mind, force of will. And it was an interesting discussion in like psychology. Um, but then a lot of these tests, I think, are more like prove you you got ESP by being in a room cut off from sound and vision and you have to draw on a piece of paper and blah, 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 blah. Those kind of tests, mm. which can be easily faked. Yes. We've all seen the start of Ghostbusters. We know how that goes. Yeah, we have. And his Zena cards. Uh, thank you to Caramoo96 yeah. for the bits and Parzival there. <laughs> Long-winded way to, for that woman to say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. Yeah. When you're being interviewed... You do have to find very long ways of saying simple things, or it doesn't come over well. Yeah. So also, I think in Ghostbusters, I've, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, and maybe I'm wrong if I watched it back right now, but during the beginning, when they do that card test, Tulsa test, did you say? Um, I think the guy who keeps getting zapped is actually psychically seeing the cards of the girl across from him. So she gets them wrong, but he gets her one coming up right. I think, oh. I think that's what happens in that scene. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he guesses the one she uh, ends up getting. Oh, I've got to go and look at that now. That's interesting. Yeah, mm, that's quite clever. I, I, I might be wrong, but I, I, I think, I think that's what they do in that scene. If it is, I'm best Ghostbusters fan ever. <laughs> <laughs> the real Chupa thingy says Paul is correct. Mm. Oh, about what? No, just everything ever. Oh no! Don't say that. <laughs> For Seelai, thank you for the sub there. Right, let's see. If I, I'm desperate to hear about Robo Ghost. Ooh, oh yeah, sorry. Well. I've, I've, oh, this, is the, this could be the big event. Not so. I just, I just know it's going to be ridiculous. What we have here is um, a computer system that is monitoring a number of sensors which are on the end of wires. So this is one of them which is nearby. This is a temperature sensor, a small, very sensitive sensor which is um, feeding information into the computer which is then being recorded and displayed on the screen as a trace. Now if I grab hold of this, you'll see the, uh, the temperature go up along that curve there. And as the temperature goes up, it's recorded and uh, into the computer's memory and we can take it off onto a floppy disk and then uh, analyze the data at a later stage. And um, what is more, this machine will give a warning if any of the readings change fairly drastically. Um, I don't know if it'll do it for me if I'm hot enough to, uh, to get a significant effect. No comment. I don't think I am, but um, you can see the temperature fluctuating. Oh. So Robo Ghost. <laughs> that was awful! Robo Ghost is just a fucking thermometer! <laughs> it's a thermometer! You do not oh, get a thermometer and call it fucking Robo Ghost. Come on, guys. <laughs> Bloody <laughs> hell! A dog. I call it Doggy Ghost. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna make a joke about that looking like a character that like Kevin Eldon would do on Fist of Fun, but uh, Mister I Thompson has beaten me to it, so <laughs> clearly it, it wasn't like, just me. Yeah. It was like the guy from The Office, in you know, on the hour, it's like no one died. It was kind of that tone. <laughs> you may drink your weak that. lemon drink now. Yeah. This is mid nineties, right? This is what ninety four, ninety five. This comes out. Or was it earlier? Ooh, I think it's about 95, I think, yeah. Okay, his computer should be better than that for 95. I'm pretty sure even I had a better computer than that. It did kind of look like a BBC Master or something, didn't it? Yeah, it was something like that. And I, I mean, look, I don't know how good a computer that is, but didn't look very impressive. It looked like the ghost hunting equipment of, uh, equivalent of Metal Mickey. <laughs> did, did, I tell you in tin foil. did I ever tell you about the time I met the uh, guy behind Metal Mickey? No, it was, it was, that was an experience. Uh, Larry has met him separately as well, and he had an even stranger experience. But uh, that's one to say for off, off uh, Mike, I'm afraid. <laughs> a very strange gentleman indeed. Um, my God, they, I mean, who would have a? I was going to say who would have a BBC Master in this day and age. I've, I've got one about two feet to my left because I need to change a battery in it. But um, let's yeah, not get into that. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Ah, Tony Cornell has two videos. That's how important he is. There we go. 
What equipment, Ooh, what equipment is being is used during an investigation? Well, obviously, Robo Ghost. <laughs> yeah, Robo Ghost. Did he push it on a skateboard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite warm in here. Yeah, thanks. Brilliant. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, right. Unfortunately, well, the heat generated by the computer means there's always a steady temperature. <laughs> in the past, what people used is they go along with a notebook, um, pencil, uh, camera, tape recorder, um, and mainly common sense. That's a very uh, important piece of equipment, believe it or not. These days, what we've decided to do is to try and see if we can get uh, up market. And we produced a thing uh, called Spider. We had to call it something, it's a black box, it's an electronic box. There's a spectrum in there. And it has all these wires sticking out. And uh, SPIDER stands for Spontaneous Psychophysical Incident Data Electronic Recorder. Silly, isn't it? But principally, equipment that will register changes in the physical state in the room. Because people say that physical things happen, things are thrown, they see ghosts that aren't there, they, they light up and they disappear, things are moved. Their smells, their electrical problems, there's interference. So we take equipment to measure that and to record it so we can play it back. And mainly common sense. <laughs> it's, it's basically, to it's a, it's a box of crazy shit, but don't worry, we're sensible people. Yeah, and don't worry, we've got this ZX Spectrum that was released in 1982, even though it's now like 1995. <laughs> <laughs> what I think is adorable about that, though, is when you look at that box and what it what it did, and the fact is, right now, my phone can do all of that and probably more. Is actually really sweet. God, that's true, isn't it? Probably an awful lot more, actually. Bloody mm. hell! Right. Do you think that field research is more or less effective than lab experiments? Well, that's a bit Ooh. apples and oranges, isn't it? Anyway. Yeah. It's a difficult. It's a difficult question to answer, but I'll try. And because I'm a little bit biased, I'm more interested in the spontaneous cases because they've been going on for years and they're still there and they still need answering. At the same time, uh, people in the past quite rightly have said that the control conditions aren't good enough to examine in a haunted house. That's why we've got the equipment. So they wanted uh, to put them under strict laboratory control conditions and see whether these things were caused by human faculty. It's a very good and sensible approach. Now, I don't think the laboratory people will, well, will entirely agree with what I'm about to say, but I, I don't really think that 40 years of laboratory work has produced anything. I don't think it's advanced our understanding of the subject any farther. It's cleared up one or two points, but the phenomenon that we're interested in, all of us, is the spontaneous stuff. It's out in the field. And that's where to go, and that's where to look. And I'm inclined to think we should take the laboratory to the spontaneous cases rather than trying to take the human faculty to the laboratory. But I don't really think the laboratory is a bar sound on that much. Well, if it's like the stone tapes, you've got to go out to the uh, field. And yeah. But again, the stone tapes is contentious because like, it, it's primarily a fictitious idea of Nigel Neal's, but... Mm -hmm. People still hold that to have. Like some, I think it was um, Jay Zebus who asked about the EMF meters and how they first got used in ghost hunting. And I'm not completely sure, but I think it was around about the time that the ghost hunting TV shows were kicking off. And a lot of these companies and groups were using stuff like that, this kind of pseudoscience where they were using actual technology, but not using it correctly to get results that they thought proved the existence of ghosts. And it was interesting. So Biffo and I, we did that. Um, Halloween special where we mucked around in the woods and I had mm. my K2 meter, the EMF thing. And in the video, I said something like, oh, it's what electricians use to uh, look for wiring. So anyway, and that's what I've thought for years until someone in the uh, comment section below goes, actually, just out of interest, those things you, you've got, electricians never use them. They're more for like labs that are dealing with a, a lot of equipment that can bleed out a lot of EMF, which can be bad if a lot of it gets out and it's in the atmosphere. So they have it for lab conditions to measure equipment. It's that's the only way it's effective. So outside of the lab, it's highly sensitive to anything like a mobile phone or especially a walkie talkie, which is why when the lights usually went off on things like most haunters or whatever, it was someone with a walkie talkie nearby just clicking it and setting the lights off. Brilliant. So you're basically taking something out there which is set off by everything. 
Well, I mean, it, 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 it has a purpose and it works for it, but outside of lab conditions and a certain focused, you know, purposes, it's, it's absolutely useless for ghost hunting. Brilliant. But of course, because you can set it off and it all looks exciting, it's been adopted, isn't it? That's it. They have a thing as well called REM pods in ghost hunting shows now, which are like little pods with lights on that you leave in the middle of the floor. And if someone walks by, it trembles and sets it off and lights up. So, you know, there's an, there's an item there which can be set off by any means that can give you visual stimulus for your ghost show where nothing's happened for the six hours of the recording session that you've had and you need half hours worth of footage. Mm, bloody hell. Parzafal, thank you for the bit, says third Ashens film is going to be that Ashens rebuilds Spider out of tack he finds in his garage. Probably do that now, to be honest. As somebody said yeah. earlier, you probably use a Lego Mindstorms kit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one of those in the garage, actually, but it's, it's... I do the mighty thing of every time Argos has three for two on toys, I buy three expensive Lego sets, keep them for about three years, and then sell them on for ludicrous profit. Uh, <laughs> And that's how YouTube works, kids. What the hell yeah. is this? It looks like an, a Russian Nez clone or something. Yeah, what is that? I can't oh, even make that out. Into... Bloody oh. hell, it's got a fucking sniper rifle there. Jesus. Right. Let's start. Is this from like St Christopher Lee's days of Nazi hunting, where yeah. this was his base of operations? <laughs> we'll find all their skulls just to the left. <laughs> <laughs> and each skull's got a tiny dagger mark right between the eyes. <laughs> That's how he knows the noise so well. <laughs> Let's click this thing first and see if yeah, what the all right. bloody what hell is that? that? See, this, this could well, be all no, the ghost no, hunting okay. gadgets. Yeah, I think you're right. I think this is the gadget table. Let's have a... what we have yeah, because that looks like it. Oh, oh, bloody hell! Sorry, this looks like a sorry. You no, I think he's about to sell us, but I think it's an EMF type thing. Ah, hence the air. Right, it's just some of them kick off bloody video, and you got no idea. What we have here is um, a wand sensor. It's a type of thermometer. And the useful thing about that is not only is it on a long lead so we can investigate temperatures physically, but because it has an illuminated digital readout, it's very useful for seeing even in the dark. And the change of temperature is noticed directly. Now, we can, if a, a report has been such as here, when there's a phantom has been seen under this particular beam, we can find out if a temperature change is associated with it, you see. It may or may not be. So we can look. Somebody said, ah, there was something on this chair there. So we can actually leave it. Now, we can actually leave the thing so we're not disturbing anything. We can go to where the readout is, even if it were in another room, because we can have the wire as long as we wish and see what's taking place at a distance. Good idea. So it, it's simple in essence. But it's the interpretation of the data that it gives us that is important, you see. Hmm. Okay, then. Yeah. Can I just say, not so far, all they've told you about ghost on equipment is that it can read temperature. <laughs> that seems to be their big IP right now. It's like, the, oh, it's get cold. That's what we can we measure cold. <laughs> Ghosts are drops in temperature. Isn't the strongest argument I've ever seen for the souls of the dead surviving the death event? I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I, it's it's all very strange. But mm. as I say, it's like it's almost in its infancy. This was like the eighties and nineties were the period where ghost hunting went from, you know, reel-to-reel uh, uh, -reel tape recorders and notebooks and pencils and the basics to post Ghostbusters, literally post Ghostbusters, into like technology and science and gadgets and all these kind of things and i think they were just soaking up they, they were, i think they were literally inventing things for ghost traits they were inventing as well yeah well this is it isn't it oh suddenly it's to do with cold oh suddenly it's to do with emf suddenly it's bloody reflections in your camera lens whatever guys yeah but also you don't know that that isn't reading a cold breeze coming through a window or a, a draft in a floorboard it, it there's so many factors it doesn't tell you that a simple drop in temperature isn't enough it's, it's not very convincing, is it? To put it frickin' mildly. My God. Yeah. Well, Crucible One, thank you for the sub there. And hum, Hooter Noodles DDS, <laughs> thank you for the sub <laughs> as well. Right, I'm going to see what this this box is. Any any guesses? Uh, I mean, it's got a... Uh, that would probably might be a K2 or EMF type thing. Or, judging by everything else so far, another way of reading how raw Maroom is. Yeah. 
it looks like to me something from a late 80s early 90s film that is the code box they've got to steal from the russians so that they can intercept the special transmission <laughs> <laughs> something from bond Ex or bond knockoff exactly this is a little device that's designed to detect the uh, charged ions in the air um, now these ions can be either negative or positive um, positive is usually bad it gives people bad impressions of the atmosphere of a place negative is usually good it makes people feel quite good so um, an excess of positive ions in a room would um, cause people to feel it was unpleasant spooky had a bad atmosphere and so on so um, we, we will check that huh? out using this piece of equipment to, um, to see if there's any sort of reason why people might be feeling bad about a place anyway and it could be that um, <laughs> mate your fashion's making me feel bad <laughs> Should have given up on that hair a long time ago. See it in the way that ions, ionized air will glow. So there could be some association. So we use this to check that. And um, looking around here, I'm afraid we're getting no unusual readings at all. <laughs> so at the moment, um, there is nothing untoward happening, unfortunately. The fuck is. You can't just say, oh, positive ions in the atmosphere make people feel what? sort of uneasy and, you know, as if there's a bad presence. What the fuck? You can't just say that as if it's a fact. It's an utter nonsense. Well, I don't even know what he means by reading ions. What 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 is he getting at exactly? Like, the room is full of types of ions. Some are positive, some are negative. I mean, I mean you ionise the air, you get those ionisers and things, but they don't change how you feel about a. What? Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, it's all very strange. Again, it's all this weird pseudoscience where, like, they're creating, like, circumstances which fit a parameter that obviously says to them if it's haunted or not. And again, it's like, I don't understand what the ions mean at all. And even if that did read ions and did read a change in them, that doesn't mean it's ghosts either. Uh, well, well, as many people have pointed out in the chat room, uh, everyone looks like they're dressed to do the polybius heist. <laughs> yes, they're all getting paid in jumpers like Nerdcube was. My God, my favourite thing so far was Smithy Dude says, are you sure these videos are from the mid-90s? Yeah. I know what you mean, because everyone's dressed like it's 1982 and using farcically outdated technology, but there we are. Congolmex, thank you very much for the sub there. <laughs> um, Big Clive, oh Big Clive, internet electrician, Big Clive, told a story about how he accidentally wired up an air ionizer backwards and it put out positive ions. Apparently, at least to the people around there, it did make them feel weird. Ooh. Weird. Ooh. I just need to know what they mean by iron. Yeah. By what, what are they talking about? I mean, which is iron. Sort of air That's molecules, what I've just missed. Surely. Surely it's the air molecules. I don't, uh, do you know what? I'm not even going to hazard a guess yeah. as to what these people but mean. But again, that doesn't mean ghosts. Do you know what we haven't had no. for a little while? Just a random crap know. ghost story from somebody. You know, where you just click on the photo and it's like, I was out with my dog and the dog was a ghost, or whatever. We had a load of those at the start. We had yeah, no, all we've had so far. No, all we've had so far today is... He got eaten by an octopus, you know, and we're like, yeah, Lee, all right, whatever, mate. <laughs> <laughs> We've not much of Christopher Lee either, I mean, my God. Oh, right, what, what are the photos? Oh, the, oh, here we are, look, yep. That spider, bloody great fuck. God, God, I mean, the amount of bloody electrical interference this shit would be kicking out, crikey. I mean, it's basically, it's That's a That's a good spectrum. point as well, because... Yeah, Spectrum. I, I was about is that what they were using then, the guy before? Yeah, this is Spider. The spontaneous psychophysical incident data electronic recorder. Um, I don't understand. Where where are they looking at? They must have a screen somewhere, surely. I would argue it's probably just a wire that goes into a monitor or, or a readout or a printer or something like that. Yeah. I would. It might be more likely to do that kind of thing than it to be like an interface. I think you could be right. I mean, look, they've got the printer here. so Oh, yeah. yeah you could well be right. And but yeah, there's all, you. all that bunch together can't, for instance, if you're trying to record, you know, ghost voices, that tape's going to be drowned out by the buzzing and the fuzzing and God knows what else. <laughs> yeah. and then you've got your shitty bog roll thermal print uh, printer here. You've got a lot of bare stuff there. You've got, <laughs> yeah, look, just fucking three hand plugs <laughs> in there and a massive unshielded speaker. I mean, come on. <laughs> there's a massive power supply in the bottom right hand corner as well. A huge big block. <laughs> Somebody says they've got a current micro speech and it goes 
ghost detected in that voice over and over. Oh, Kara micro speech. The automatic oh, speech be... system, which wasn't quite good enough to actually understand. Uh... I would argue this would be improved with the speak and spell, at the very <laughs> least. <laughs> Snaky B, thank you for the sub there. Is this a picture of the next Wish computer you're going to build? Oh, man. The next one no, is that's something my Twitch stream setup. <laughs> I like the twin cameras. That's good. Oh, look, they're, yeah, look, they've got a little monitor for yeah. the output. You were right, yeah. External. My God. So it's Ro Robo Ghost, the ghost of a dead Specky. Oh, my God. It's, it's like, yeah. Well, it was the ghost of a dead Specky that joined forces with the ghost of a dead Commodore 64. And if it can get a dead Amstrad CPC in as well, it'll take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just literally a load of cameras, oh. and yeah, mm, fair enough. Right, what the hell is this? Oh it's man, what nineteen? That look. Like... Hello, because whatever this is, is a <laughs> it's a silent scope machine. I think um, it's oh, it's got to be a directional mic, surely. Oh no, Paul's dropped out entirely. I think. Can you hear me, Paul? Am I here? Am Yay! I here? You have returned. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can indeed. I've, I've dropped my Twitch stream down. I think it's just... I need to apologise because I'm at a friend's place looking after it. And his internet is not great. So I'm surprised we've got this far. So I've turned the internet off other than what I need. Good man. Let's see if we can now <laughs> discover how to shoot ghosts in the head, apparently. This fascinating piece of machinery was constructed um, in case we needed to be... I mean, to deal with, with a terrifying entity of some sort. What? Because people often say to us, have you ever been frightened with, with what you're doing? <laughs> We've never actually been frightened. But you never know. If we saw an entity, we could in fact, literally, like the Ghostbusters, we could sort of, you know, fire a beam of light. And, uh... What's that going to do? An epileptic ghost if we did that. But, um, it is a very real piece of machinery. Now, <laughs> it's very complicated, but in brief, on the side of the machine... It's a gun with a torch on. Um, a GSR machine, Gavalic Skin Response Machine, which you hold in one hand, and if you see something that's frightening, you could sweat. You might not realise you were sweating, but there would be a response in the palm of your hand. This then emits a high-pitched buzz, and <laughs> if you felt uncomfortable, you think, my God, people have reported a, a sinister presence there, but I don't actually yeah, say anything. You hold this. And if you began to feel uncomfortable, it would be responded, you get a sound here. And then if you wanted to, even though you couldn't see it with your physical eyes, you could nevertheless upset it with that. <laughs> it's very difficult with anything like this commonly to decide what is, is, as it were, subjective or objective. It's something that you think you're going to feel, or is there something really there? On one occasion we used it when there was something really there. We used it in a deserted church. We fired the beam of light at a swirling green ominous mist which exploded into trillions of glistening lights and rushed out of the door and disappeared. Now, did not happen. It, believe it or believe it not, that doesn't matter to me. But the fact is, it came in useful. We liked the machine, we developed it, and it's fun. But the galvanic skin response machine does help you to decide if you are actually physically responding to something anyway. Now, there's a lot more that could be said, but it's probably beyond the scope of what we're recording just now. Bullshit. You lying hell. arsehole. My oh, come on. God. That, uh, that is the maddest thing I have actually seen to date on, when it comes to ghost hunting equipment. The, the strangest thing up until now was a child teddy bear that had, had all the ghost hunting equipment built into it, like a recorder and an EMF reader and a webcam and things, so you could put it in a child's room and let... You know, it's a teddy bear that can catch ghosts. <laughs> hell. That, that video was the most pathetic thing I've ever seen, and I saw a whole episode of Crime Traveller once. <laughs> Bloody hell. I mean... I... I've, I've never seen anything like that. A gun that fires a flashbulb torch at a ghost. Y yeah, and also, but when, when the, the green, green gas was there, it made it all turn into glitter and fly out the door. <laughs> didn't happen. It, that didn't <laughs> happen, mate. <laughs> I couldn't keep a straight face saying that, as you may have noticed. Uh, Fucking hell. And also, he says his logic is it fires if your hand gets sweaty, right? Because you might be getting nervous, so it said... Can you imagine if someone designs a gun that goes off if your hand gets sweaty? 
and won't <laughs> stop until your hand dries. Don't go into a worn room. Warm room. You'll fucking kill everyone. <laughs> Mind you, they've got so many pissing thermometers, they can tell if a room's warm or not before you go in, I suppose. Oh, yeah. dear. Well, it... I've never seen anything like that. That is so pathetic. He's either very desperate for things to be real and have some cool stuff to do, or he's taking the piss. I don't know which one it is, to be honest. Do you know what this reminds me of, all these little video clips? Like, have you ever gone around to someone's house that you don't really know that well, but for whatever reason, you're hanging out with them for a bit, and they're showing you all their crap, and they're both proud of it and slightly embarrassed that they've never shown it to anyone before, so you're the first person. It kind of <laughs> has that weird, I'm uncomfortable being here, <laughs> looking at your toys situation. <laughs> that really is it, isn't it? Oh my god. He's just showing his weird He Man figures he got in Mexico that are all the wrong colours and stuff like that. Yeah. Bloody hell. Oh, nah, uh, I knew we would find. Yeah. Okay. Booze. Yeah. The secret booze. What? There better be anything. What happened there? You, zo you, zo what? you zoom out and it oh, zooms in. I don't understand what's happening. What? No, that is, that is a wall. That's not helping. That's just wall, mate. Yeah. They've overestimated how much exploration <gasps> is needed. P. This is the puzzle. There's one puzzle in this. It must be this. You must spell out a word, I presume. Is it, is it ghosts? Oh, no. <laughs> right. Shall we do this puzzle while we're here? As it is the only one. Yeah. Okay. So it must be like all the wine bottles of the letters of the alphabet, and you have to pick the right ones to spell a word. Exactly. So, well, right. let's work it out. We may not be able to work out what the password is if it isn't ghosts. I mean, it might be something that's like written. I, I bet it's in the kitchen. Robo ghost. Be a spider. B. That should be C, hopefully. A. B C A. Lemming, lem oh no, it was the BDA. Uh, e. Okay. I hope I'm writing this down in a way that I can actually understand in a minute. F. D. Well, I'm, I'm, I take, I'm walking back my theory that it just says ghosts on the grounds that we yeah. haven't had any letters from that yet. H. Well, one now. So that's just, yeah. So that would be G. Uh, yeah. Oh no. Oh, it isn't ghosts, is it? I don't know, H. Oh, if it is ghosts, I'll genuinely not. Unless there's something in the room that will tell us at some point. Yeah, I it's got to be something him just to say ghosts would be rough. So I think it's, I think it's just the alphabet just laid out by the wine bottle racks. Oh yeah. So it's starting at the top A, then the next row down is B, C, D, and the next row down is oh, yeah. E, F, I, I won't even G, H. It. Hang on, does it go down oh, yeah. to Z? Yes, and it yeah. says Z for some reason. That means, shall I try... Shall I try ghosts? You could just type ghosts in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it is as well, because of bloody state. I do not believe so, it. Where's O, then? I, J, K, L, M, N, O... Yeah. E Q R S. Yeah. Ah, that's uh, the voice of Fred from uh, the uh, the Enfield Poltergeist. Bloody hell! I'm great. I'm glad it wasn't the word like Gestapo, and it was like <laughs> you find his Nazi hunting information. <laughs> I'm really annoyed that it's just ghosts. You shouldn't be able to just guess like that. <laughs> no, that's the worst password for your computer. So what's at the end of this? Is this where we find Christopher Lee's corpse? He's like, I was a ghost too all along. Oh, just As like you predicted spent. literally at the start. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. Oh, this is like Duke Nukem for the uh, game.com. <laughs> 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 Alien bastard shut up my ride. What the? Oh, it's a painting. I, I was not expecting Ego. that. What? Is this the painting of hell? Well, we're going to click on it and find out. We meet again, my friend. Oh? I'm afraid that I have misled you slightly. My life ended long ago when I've become part mm. of this house. 
I now know the answers to all its mysteries, but I cannot share them with you. You must make your own decisions about ghosts and spirits and wait until you leave this world to find the real answers. I wish you good luck with your quest. Right, just the point of interest. Let's just say you're on a quest to find out if ghosts exist. Then a ghost turns up and goes, I'm a ghost, <laughs> and this proves it. But your quest isn't over yet, because you have to decide whether you believe in ghosts or not. It's like, well, I've just seen one, so can I go home? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty convinced now that I've fucking seen one, let a chat with it. <laughs> Living in a painting. I say this, they brought the twist forward a bit, didn't they? Yeah, bloody hell. Oh, perhaps we were supposed to go this way last, I don't know. I don't know. Quis inquisitive minds always route around in basements don't they when they look on a mystery hunt yeah true just just that was the next door wasn't it you know thank you for the bits what host norkers who says well done for mr gannon yep you predicted <laughs> that indeed my god <laughs> uh, look i'm no genius i just just thought what's the tropiest trope that could possibly trope in this <laughs> cd rob and my god they troped it hard <laughs> yeah they really did uh doesn't it a Mm. That's it. You've come all this way to find out that Christopher Lee's dead. Yeah, and mixed Which, really you know, low in the audio for some reason as well. Yeah. Oh well. What, why in a painting? They just whoever made this had just seen Ghostbusters two on VHS. I think that's extremely likely. Can you imagine how better Ghostbusters two would have been if Vigo was played by Christopher Lee? <gasps> Don't you think that's one of the lost opportunities? Oh my god. Or just got Max von Sydow to do the whole thing. Yeah, all that. That would have been that would have been good. Yeah. Right. What's on his slide projector? Right. I'm gonna guess uh, nudes. <laughs> <laughs> the ghosts of old England. Hey. Oh, oh, here we are. Look. Yeah, there they are. The three ghosts of old England: Billy, Pewter, and <laughs> that Biffo. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck like is it? You can't just photoshop some crap together and call it the ghosts of old England. <laughs> <laughs> Ghost of lonely water needs a hug. What? <laughs> what the fuck? Oh. What's all that? Oh Everyone's my... sad and ashamed. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost of um, Queen Elizabeth's oh, impersonator. God. It oh was dress-up day in the office, so they all got the camera out. <laughs> and then broke the fucking lens by the looks of it. What? Oh, that's lazy. What's even that meant to be? Bunch of doorknobs. Oh, there oh, she is the from cover. the front cover. Yeah, we saw that one before at some point, didn't we? What's that? Somebody changed Oh, it's heads bowed. I think, yeah. Oh, I see. It's not the ghost of Max Bygraves, then. <laughs> what? So someone just had a lot of spare... Microsoft Paint art that they wanted to put on the disc. Apparently, there you go. That's that's your Christmas card lined up. <laughs> Fuck it up. Mm, the, the emo painting has come to life. Yeah, that's an Evanescence album cover. <laughs> <laughs> if, to be honest, if someone put "Wake Me Up Inside," I don't want it. over this music, <laughs> it'll be perfect. <laughs> oh, the nearly headless God. horseman this is like when a five-year-old does a book report at school and it's like tell us about ghosts and they just found every <laughs> image they could out of a book fucking obi-wan kenobi that's there it. at the end apparently that's what let's go so, is there a, the haunted realm england's supernatural sites go on then. all right here we go here we are i need to know more than just a picture what, what is that house. yeah okay okay, the, okay. A nice picture. Is this going at its own pace? Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Um, two pictures put together badly. I don't know. Well, I don't know where. They, we need at least a thing on the bottom saying, Ye Oldie Castle, Warwickshire, you know? Well, exactly. Tub Fen Penny Farm uh, or something. I don't know. Uh, Although I do like the sound Tub Penny Farm. I need to work that into something in the future. Don't they have a fight on top of that in Highlander? Ramirez and the Maybe. <laughs> Oh my that God. could be anywhere. I don't know, unless you recognise it from living local. I don't know where any of these places are. Yeah, I haven't got a bloody clue. I mean, that looks like there's something written above it, but you can't make it out. Ugh. Doesn't help when they've just slapped together a bunch of fog on it as well. Oh, and done, and done the Polaroid negative, whatever it is they call it. 
Yeah, posterize or negative or yeah. yeah. God, I hate that. That's the worst thing about the nineties when someone decided that was the thing. Oh god, it didn't last long, but what a dark period it was. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, great. This is this is unremarkable content. It needs some at least some sound, doesn't it, or music or something. And it needs something, you know, it needs a bit of titles and a bit of music that would help immensely. Maybe some carry on music would be quite nice. I can actually add our own music. I was I can press a button for the Benny Hill theme, but you wouldn't hear it. So <laughs> <sighs> Gravestone, right? Great. This is. I would not hire this man to put on a show about, you know, ghosts and informative lecture because this is all he's got going for him. Yeah. I was hoping there'd be more oh, pictures dear. of Spider and a box full of Spectrums or something. But uh... Yeah, I love all that stuff. I like all the old weird tech. Because like, the stuff they use these days is pr practically the same, but just, you know, modern and branded. St. Michael's Mount was one of the places, apparently. That's Cleopatra. Well, that's the uh, needle, Cleopatra Needle, isn't it? Yeah. At least I know that. And apparently that's almost haunted. Yeah. It's just on I don't know fire, where that is. Great. This is like this is literally like looking for your your, your mate or your mum. <laughs> this is photo Auntie album. Agatha in front of the house. This is Auntie oh. Agatha at the side of the house. This is Auntie do you Agatha. Remember Auntie Agatha? The house. Yeah, oh. do you remember her? She, she used to give you boiled sweets. No, I don't remember, Mum, because I'm three in this picture. What do you want? <laughs> Alright. That's the Tower of London, I think, is it? I don't know. Oh god, this is so staid, this, isn't it? This oh. is just the AA guide to Britain. Yeah, the AA guide to bad photoshops of British locations. Yeah. Uh, what are I meant to get out of this? This is probably anyone all to get used in the rest of it somewhere. I, don't, I honestly don't know. Oh, you th oh, I see. It's like a dumping ground for. I, I do wonder. Got maybe a couple of extra. Yeah. Right. Oh, what's on the computer? Ooh, have we looked on that computer? Oh, hang on. There's a, there's a spooky corner with a book or something. Oh. Oh. Ho, ho, ho. What's oh. in here? Nothing. Literally like fucking anything. nothing. Oh. Great. Right, how do we get to the front of this bloody computer? I suppose we have to go here. Oh, I don't know. We're going to have to walk right up to the wall face first and then turn around. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yay, oh. we made it. Yay. Ghostly oh, glossary. Meta. Oh, yeah, and this is a copy of the uh, very CD-ROM we're using. Right. Oh, here we are. Black Shook is a local one. A phantom so black is... dog. Great. Who is often thought to be so an this... omen of death. Great. Yeah. So is this like if you don't want to go through the house, you can just look through all of this stuff, do you think? Yeah. Or is this like literally a uh, a separate glossary? I, just, I don't seem to remember them mentioning black sugar before, but to be fair, we haven't seen it all yet. So. No, we haven't had a good look around the house. Mm. Although I'm a bit less interested now that we know Christopher Lee's dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <coughs> The Fox sisters were allegedly the, had the ability to communicate with spirits and were responsible for the birth of spiritualism. Okay, mm. then. Grey ladies. Grey ladies are spirits that are seen wearing grey dresses. Typically, they return to haunt their previous homes because of a tragic event during their lifetime, usually involving a loved one. Thanks. Oof. Harry Houdini. This is very sort of basic. short paragraph, and that's not pseudopod is a false limb formed by ectoplasm that appears on a medium's body during a seance. Yeah, yeah. So it's also a really fucking uh, good podcast, Pseudopod. Um, I've got Pseudopod. Uh, <laughs> I'll buy a case the old Pseudopod. <laughs> Zeneca. Oh yeah, Zeneca. There we go. Yeah. Screaming skulls. Like that. We yeah. had a whole story about that earlier, didn't we? Yeah, I think that was covered in the uh, elsewhere, isn't it? Sigh, seance. Sigh, as on Ooh, pounds per square inch. Probably for a minute from psychic. A person with psi powers has extra sense of... Oh, God, sir. Yeah, like psyops. Yeah, and the psy core from uh, Babylon 5. They missed an opportunity to put a game on that, then. They could have put a nice little kind of, I don't know, frogger type thing. No. All we got no. was the wine bottle puzzle. Well... You really want to hide your twist behind a bigger reveal than that. Some would say the greatest puzzle ever. Not me. I had to sit through it and it was shit. Um, 
Right. Door on the right, but and then upstairs afterwards, I suppose. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Oh, well, this, does this go down? Oh God! I oh. think it, two basements. Oh no! No, they just. Oh no! It would go into the, the kitchen. Walls out. Yeah. A very empty kitchen. Is there a garden? Maybe. Interesting. Right. So we came in from there. We've got a chair. Oh, poison. It's, no, nothing yet. Literal poison. Justice is often blind. And there are some who would sooner take the law into their own hands than see a crime go unpunished. The case of Nell Cook, the servant of a canon of Canterbury Cathedral, plainly illustrates the dangers of setting oneself up as judge, jury, and executioner. Nell Cook tended house for the new canon of Canterbury Cathedral as best she could and was rewarded for her diligence and devotion by deceit and gross impropriety. She had not always felt this way, and when the canon gave his first mass in the cathedral, she was suitably impressed by the character of her new employer. The old canon, who mercifully passed away after many years of ill health, was a kind but ineffectual cleric, more concerned with getting his meals on time than spreading the word of the Lord. Now, here before her, was clearly a man of passion, who had directed his considerable energies and charisma in the service of the church. And yet, there was something about the new canon, like the way he would never look her in the eye before he went to visit parishioners who had sought advice in spiritual matters, or his often extreme moodiness and irritability after returning from some of these calls. Nell put this down to his youth and passionate temperament, but she would soon find out the depths of his feelings. The canon was a man who kept odd hours, and it was difficult for Nell to arrange meals at set times. One evening, after watching the stew she had laid over all afternoon grow cold on the dresser, she decided to wait for him to come home so that she, so that she could broach the matter forthwith. <coughs> Late that night, Nell was drifting in and out of sleep in the kitchen when she heard the scuffle of feet and whispered giggling from the drawing room upstairs. She couldn't believe it was the canon. She crept up the stairs to catch a glimpse of the intruders and was sickened to the stomach by the sight that greeted her eyes. The young canon, obviously inebriated, was on the settle being very familiar with a young woman. But the real shock came when the priest's companion turned around, revealing herself as none other and his own niece. Oh. Nell could bear the scene no longer and stole off to her own room to a fitful rest. In the morning, the niece was nowhere to be seen and the canon seemed in particularly high spirits. His hypocrisy appalled Nell and she had to take her leave with some feeble excuse about tending to something on the stove. In the kitchen, her sanctuary, Nell brooded over the night's events. She decided to bide her time, as this might be a isolated indiscretion, not uncommon amongst men of the cloth. But deep down she feared the worst, and her instincts were soon borne out. The canon's niece started making more frequent calls on her uncle at his quarters, and their conduct together became more brazen and unforgivable. It was not something Nell could discuss with anyone else, so she resolved to deal with the matter herself. One evening, when she expected the canon's niece for dinner, she expressly made the priest his favorite meal, mutton pie, emptying a bottle of arsenic into the filling, and grimly smiling at the irony of it all. After serving the pie to the <coughs> Nell waited by the dining room door, wondering at the effects of her special past. She became a pig monster at this stage. After the meal, which seemed... Are you local? Family, the canon congratulated her on for you here. excellent dinner, as usual, and said that he and his niece would retire to the study where she would help him work on tomorrow's sermon. Mm. Nell hurried to the kitchen to check that she had used the right bottle when she heard a cry from above the study. The poison must be doing its mischief, and so Nell took her time responding to the desperate pleas for help. 
When she reached the room, she found the canon and his niece writhing on the floor in agony. Foam, the color of sage, forming around their mouths and their eyes wide with terror and supplication. But Nell simply watched them with a curious detachment, as if none of this was really happening, bade them good night, and retired to bed. Yet her awakening was violent, wresting her from a deep slumber. Upon opening her eyes, she saw a crowd of people in her room, all speaking in agitated tones, and the most vehement amongst them was the man now shaking her roughly by the shoulders. Still drowsy, Nell could not fathom what her assailant was babbling, but when he mentioned the poison, the hairs rose on the back of her neck, and she recalled her actions of the previous night. It all seemed like a dream. Now, fully roused, she attempted to explain, to defend herself, but those gathered in her room were well past listening and only sought vengeance for the slaying of their priest. Nell was dragged from bed and into the streets, where the people who had once been her friends and neighbors turned on her with a viciousness that was breathtaking. Stones caught her in the head and chest, forcing her to her knees, blood pouring freely from a gash on her cheek, and still it rained stones, pounding her into the ground, her arms uselessly hanging by her sides, and then succumbed to the darkness. If only that were the end of it. On regaining consciousness, Nell found herself at the bottom of a deep pit, looking up at her tormentors, some of whom had shovels in their hands. She desperately tried to raise herself, railing against her attackers and accusing the priest of terrible sins. But their response to this blasphemy was a clump of earth that hit her hard in the face, filling her mouth and choking off her appeal. And then the next mound of dirt landed on her, and the next, until her body was covered by damp, cool soil. The last thing she saw through the clod of mud clinging to her cheeks was the poison bottle being thrown into the grave with her. And then the darkness truly closed in. Forever. The passage between the old infirmary cloister and the green court in Canterbury Cathedral is known as the Dark Entry and Nell Cook's spirit is set to wander through this foreboding corridor, lamenting the injustice of her fate. It is also said that any who look upon the wretched apparition will soon taste death themselves. Blimey. Ghost story for well, Christmas there. I was wondering if the, where the ghost story was going to pop up, because up until then it just felt like a long episode of EastEnders. <laughs> I thought it was going to be um, the whole thing of, oh, it turns out there was a twin and it was not the guy's oh. niece at all. Although if there were twins, it would still be his niece. No, I didn't think that went through. Oh, well. Or even um, like Creepshow, like the ghosts of the person, of the people she killed come back and get her and drives her to madness. Yeah, but no. Some people no. were displeased with her vigilantism and she didn't yeah, and become the first Batman as a result. No, it's often a uh, misunderstanding that people can easily become Batman, but by and large, people with like a tragic upbringing and a death of parents don't go on to be uh, Cape Crusaders. Yeah, I, th I think that's entirely true. It's, it's just, you know, playing the art averages. What's in Christopher Lee's cupboard? <gasps> Come on. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. Hey! <laughs> well, we're not to tea tonight. Pumpkin rind. Great. Do you know what would be really spooky? If you open a cupboard door in the game, yeah, and there's a pumpkin, yeah, and it glows up. Oh, that'd be dead spooky. Let's make it happen. Cut to that, and you think, we we haven't realised our dreams. And do you know what noise it can make? This one. Uh, 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 it was the pumpkin that couldn't be asked. Well, there's some no. sacks. Great. It's great. Pans. 
great. More pans. Oh. It's not a very haunted kitchen, is it? The, the hob. Oh. Hang up, no. Is there a story of someone who was baked in the oven? No. No. <laughs> this has now become um, through the keyhole, basically. <laughs> who lives in a house like this? Um, David, it's over to you. <laughs> What was on the sideboard there? Red. Was it meat? Yeah, I think oh, so. No. What oh, is no. That? That's, oh, fucking, I sound to work this place out. Isn't it? Oh, bollocks. This clip is <laughs> here again. Right. Can we have a story about some haunted meat? Oh, maybe. Oh, it's gloves. Gloves, yeah. Oh. Oh. Uh, is that it? Yeah, apparently. If this just turns the... Oh! Oh! Suddenly blood. Oh, oh it's gone. And it's back. That's That's it. Oh, that was uh, amazing. Why even click on the gloves if I, yeah, they're useless? I don't understand a, there's it. There's a lot of that in this. Hang on, there's an upside down teapot and some paintings. That's something. Right, P photos or something. A collection Ooh. of exquisite imagery. Some of England's most haunted sites. Didn't uh, we just have this? Bloody hell. It's just more yeah, of this. Tones. Just more of this. Oh fucking hell! Right, not happening. I'm gonna, I'm gonna click off. Oh, a Tie Fighter. Um, <laughs> export. What does oh that wow, mean? we can, we can save this image. <laughs> we'll save it to documents, uh, and it's gonna be called Tie Fighter. Yeah. There we are. I'll put in .bmp because I can't remember how useful this um, file thing was. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Maybe this is another puzzle of the game. Yay! Yay! Good old there Bob. We are. Amazing. We can just nip through them now and see if there's one of interest. Yeah, great. Oh, there we are. Great. Oh. Yeah. Looks a bit like me in 30 years' time. It's, it's a terrifying, futuristic stone carving of. John Sim in 30 years? I'm not sure, actually. Oh, I'm trying, from a distance, I'm trying to see if there's a face that comes to mind. It's a little bit Leonard Rossiter. Yeah, that's it's the ghost of Rising. It's literally Rising yeah. Camp that formed his face. Yeah. Ooh, Miss Jones. <laughs> Etc. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Bigsby. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. We're, we're round again, I think. Oh, are we? No, no. Knobs and uh, angels and bridges and yeah, okay, yeah. turrets and walls and griffins and towers and stocks and statues and tunnels. I like that one, it's quite futuristic. That that's actually quite nice. I like that. I wouldn't mind having that on my wall. There we are. I'll export it for you. You can have it later. Yay! That's Christmas sorted. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we're around now. There we go. Ooh, Great. Are these all the same thing? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, they're all exquisite image. I don't know if that, I would use the word exquisite. Oh no! <laughs> That's what will happen when you write bomb. Mother, mother, me, me game's gone crashed. Mother, I shouldn't have used the <laughs> evil export. It's done it now. <coughs> I'll load in our save. We didn't save for ages. It doesn't matter because there aren't any things to save other than we haven't saved the state. Hello. Goodbye. Um, of the um, <laughs> puzzle. But that's it. Uh. Up. Yeah, we went through there, did the puzzle right back straight in the kitchen, I suppose. Just hope it doesn't crash this time. Right, go back in the kitchen. Yeah. Can we go out to. Or oh, let's check sure the table. You want to leave the house now. No. No, Chris. Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, if you leave, you don't get to go to the garden or something. It just... No. We've got to find all the mysteries out before we can leave the house. So what's on the table then? We've got a teapot upside down. Oh! There's a pulsating eyeball in it. Yeah. That's that's a bit sad to guess that, isn't it? Yeah, that's... Oh, dear. Mm -hmm. How, when do you run out of ideas when you put one of these together? When, where, when is the moment? <laughs> Quite early <laughs> on, I think. <laughs> <laughs> is it when you start designing the kitchen and go, it's not many spooky kitchens? So let's just put a really long story in and you'll get your money's worth. Yeah. 
But that's it. I think that's it for the kitchen. That's it. Yeah. Oh, bloody hell. Up the stairs we go. So, up the wooden hills. So that means we've done all the ground floor. Oh, hang on, hang on. Oh, oh, hello. What is this? The servants' quarters or something? Oh, spooky attic oh, time, maybe. Oh, what a small little bedroom. Oh, yeah, se servants' quarters, I think. You'd think Christopher Lee had a better bedroom than this. He must have. This is oh. a secret. Yeah, this must be the servants' bedroom. You're right. Yeah, he'll, he'll it's, have a Because it's away from one. the house. Shit's chair. Yeah. Skylight for light. Oh, there's a box on the bed. Oh, there's a phone. Oh, there. that's good. Oh, now we're talking. Believers. There, we go. there are people all over the world that have devoted their lives to the task of proving to the sceptics that ghosts and spirits exist. Some started out as sceptical as the next man. Others were born with psychic powers that were so strong that they could do nothing else but accept ghosts as a vivid reality. <laughs> Some people are born mentally ill. <laughs> there are a great deal of ordinary people who believe that they have come face to face with ghosts. Turned out it's just an old fielding. Many do not get the chance to talk about their experiences because they are frightened of being dismissed as cranks like in that Christmas with the Cranks film. In this file, believers are given the chance to put their opinions across. Well, that would make a nice change in this CD-ROM, won't it? Yeah. The skeptics say this file... isn't biased at all. We'll give you... Oh, God. Right. Go on, then. Jane Hartley is a social worker living in Yorkshire, England. A one-time sceptic. She was sceptical once, but didn't enjoy it. She was Only that once. <laughs> become... At the price of meat at Woolworths. Yeah. <laughs> She has inherited her mother's and grandmother's ability to see ghosts. Looks a bit like Lily Allen. Yeah, and write songs about them. Yeah. Father John Nuttall, we've had him before, is a Roman yeah. Catholic priest who teaches in the county of Surrey. He's fascinated with the subject of ghosts and has helped members of his parish in the past who have experienced hauntings. Robin Furman! There's the man. The man, the legend. I want to see if he's still banging around. I'm going to have a look on the internet. Is a trained psychologist. He needs a fucking slap then. Bloody <laughs> prancing around this fucking ghost gun. Jesus Christ, that's... man. Where did you bloody get your degree? Advert in the back of the big issue or something. Uh, trained psychologist, an expert in the field of the paranormal. Yeah. He founded the organisation Ghostbusters UK in 1984. You mean he saw Ghostbusters and really liked it, but then decided to pretend it was real. Yeah. Uh, up, up, right up until when a. Uh... Sony Pictures knocked on his door and went, you can't call yourself that. Yeah. <laughs> and he stopped. <laughs> yeah. And now he's called Ghost Smashers UK. Ghostbusters UK's eccentric activities have attracted worldwide media attention. He's hoping to collate enough evidence to support his argument to the existence of ghosts and also make more weird guns. Tony Cornell. So he has a book yeah. out. Oh, does he? A book called Ghostbusters UK. And he lives in Grimsby currently where he still operates. He is a uh, psychic investigator and he lectures in parapsychology and he's into hypno uh what's the word it says yeah he's a psychologist and hypnotherapist and it's just the books about his thing so he talks about um he heads an experienced real life team of psychic investigators which include a microbiologist a computer consultant which means nothing and an electronics engineer who are all in constant demand to tackle hauntings and paranormal experiences Writer Moira Martingale has assembled a remarkable casebook of the Ghostbusters' recent experiences, and their many successful exorcisms. That's dodgy. These include the case of Grey Farm, the scene of a sudden death and bizarre accidents, the churchyard which had missed, had missed rising from open tombstones, unexplained lights, cloaked figures, a ghost train, a slightly too realistic corpse, and the woman possessed by Pazuzu, the lion eagle monster from the desert fringes of civilization. This is all bollocks because i you know he was running up with his little light uh, <laughs> going be gone <laughs> pew, demon. Pew, pew, pew. so he saw ghostbusters and started ghostbusters uk he saw the exorcist and decided pazuzu was a thing he shouldn't be no, allowed to watch worse films. than that worse than that he saw exorcist 2 and decided to call oh it my pazuzu. god yeah because it didn't mention the name as such in the first one in the same way do they? i don't believe so oh my god don't and show what, him Star um, Wars. They'll be off bloody trying to exercise Darth Vader or something. Bloody hell. Yeah, but what's uh, Exorcist 2 about? It's about hypno hypnotherapy, isn't it? And psychology and all that stuff. Well, it tries to be. <laughs> well, it tries to be. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so poor, it's unbelievable, actually. I, I can't remember which was worst, Exorcist 2 or Poltergeist 2. 
Um, uh, I would say Exorcist 2. Poltergeist 2 is at least watchable and has some fun moments in, like yeah. where he vomits up the worm I'd and the big priest. I saw them both quite soon after each other. We did them on sequelizers, but I can remember very little about Exorcist 2. Very little, actually. I, I All I remember of Exorcist 2 is the bit where the dad vomits up the, the tequila worm thing, and then the very end, which takes place in like some weird, I don't know, end space, weird ghost universe, where they're all floating about. Oh, and God. But that's all I do remember. Ugh. Ugh. Bloody Although yeah. I do remember watching Poltergeist 3, and even though I thought it was awful, I thought all the mirror special effects were very, very effective. I've never seen Poltergeist. I've seen The Exorcist 3. Made the mistake of watching the director's cut first. Terrible, terrible oh, mistake. <laughs> um, of Exorcist 3? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because that's because he didn't really want an Exorcist in it, did he, originally? So they had to ask him to put one in, and that's what went out originally. Yeah, apparently the original theatrical cut is like much better, because the... It was very, very overly long and ponderous and didn't quite hold together mm. in the director's cup, um, which is probably why they didn't release it like that. Anyway, yeah. um, this is the man with the spider. <laughs> spider being the box of spectrums. Yeah, I like the fact that when he explains what spider stands for, he kind of almost <laughs> apologises. Yeah. Oh, and it's silly, I know, but... We, we have a laugh. We have a laugh, we do. <laughs> Go on then. There we go. Ah, this is the believers. So there's a skeptics one around somewhere, apparently. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. Let's have John Nuttall. What view does the Catholic Church take on ghosts and hauntings? I'd imagine a positive one, because yeah. that's their whole belief system is based on the idea of ghosts <laughs> yeah, and life say. after death. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be negative, is it? <laughs> He's not going to say it's all bollocks, is he? Hang on, isn't that a Betamax case and it's got a VHS in it? Maybe. Mm, I'm not sure, actually. Unless anyway. it's an SVHS tape. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's a Super 8. Right. <laughs> well, I think it would certainly say that uh, ghosts and hauntings actually exist. There are far too many um, numerous occurrences of things happening just simply to be able to to dismiss them. And the fact mm, is that no, we've actually I'm pretty sure I can. Um, mm. prayer books, rituals, etc., with, with various sort of little services to, to try and help to cope um, with those situations where people are uh, perhaps disturbed by them. Um, so Catholic Church, and I would say probably the whole broad Christian church as well, would actually say yes. There are various uh, phenomena that we experience that can't be actually put down to something which is tangible and, and visible. That's the way we are. I mean, we're, we're actually moving I suppose most of the time as a church in a sort of spiritual plane we're dealing with uh, a god first of all who's not directly visible to us um, we have round about the church various sort of images like stained glass images with uh, angels on um, etc so yeah we, we're always talking about um, things which are non-physical if i can too i mean it, it's not um, it's not language which is unfamiliar to us, um, certainly from the scriptures itself. And in uh, the very end chapter of Luke's gospel there, this is just after Easter Sunday, and Jesus appears to the disciples. Now, he's been dead one minute, and suddenly he appears, and they're frightened. And he says to them, why are you so agitated? And why are these doubts rising in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. Yes, it is I indeed. Touch me and see. A ghost has no flesh and bones, as you see I have. So well, the, the, lang the language itself is quite uh, quite familiar to us. I see. Well, hmm. that went pretty much as expected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was like a, that was what they call it, a bunt shot or whatever. It's just like you just hand them a softball question. Yeah. Do you believe in ghosts, Vicar? Oof, don't know about that. Tell me, Mr. Burns. How does your uh, campaign have the uh, energy of a runaway freight train? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. Bloody hell. This, uh, uh, and noises. Anyway, we can now get a ghostly <laughs> encounter from Jane Hartley, which will be uh, <laughs> hopefully a bit more interesting. But this particular night, perfectly ordinary night, I went to bed around 11ish, which was, was normal for us went into the room, went to sleep, you know, perfect, nothing odd about the night. Um, the room was, it was dark, 
because it was quite high, high up, so the street lighting didn't shine a bright light in there. But you could distinguish the shapes of all the furniture, and colours were in terms of shades of grey and black. You, you couldn't have picked out colour in the light. Anyway, I'd gone to sleep. I, I don't know how long I'd been asleep or quite when I woke up. It was still dark. And I woke up and I sort of just laid there and I thought, oh God, what's wrong with me? I felt really ill. I felt sort of slightly sick, slightly feverish, just very, very odd. And I sort of laid there feeling uneasy. And I thought, God, I'm really ill. There's something really wrong. Thinking I'm going to have to phone the other co-worker at the other house to get somebody to come round. I turned over in the bed, I'd been facing the wall. I turned over and had my eyes open and there was a figure of a woman stood maybe two, three feet away from the bed. Um, she seemed quite tall, but then I was laid down in the bed and she, she was stood up. She, her silhouette was very simple, um, sort of shape, long dress sort of seemed to be quite high necked. Her face I could distinguish was paler but I couldn't see her features clearly and her, her head was in my direction and I very much felt that she was looking at me and I was absolutely petrified. I was really, really scared and she just didn't move. She just stood there. I mean, I can't remember whether her arms were by her side or in front of her. She was very still. And I didn't even debate in my head, you're not seeing this. I knew I was seeing it, and I was very frightened. And the problem was, I was completely trapped. The bed was in the corner of the room, the doll was sort of over here, and she was stood in between. And there's no way I was going to get out of that bed to pass her or even attempt to go around her. I, was, I can't express how frightened I was. So I just got my head under the duvet, and I stayed under the duvet, sweated it out, you know, until I thought morning must be here, and I kept sort of peering out, you know, waiting for the light to come. The light came, I got my clothes, and I left that room. Um, the next day, of course, at, at nine o'clock in the morning, the co-worker from the other house came round, and I'd, I'd really, it had really shaken me up. You know, I was still sort of feeling strange and very, very depressed, and the feeling from her was one of total desolation. And I just felt so depressed, and I'm not a depressed person at all. And I, I said to the co-worker, I'd actually told him I'd had a dream, because I'd, I'd decided at this point it must have been a nightmare, a dream. And I told him, and just said, God, I couldn't sleep last night, and this happened, I saw this, I was so scared. And he just, he just looked at me and said, don't say any more, you've got to speak to, to this guy called Ken. And he wouldn't sort of elaborate, I said, wait till Ken comes in this afternoon, you know, to take over. Um, so I waited, this guy came in, and I said to him, I said, you know, I think I had this really weird dream, dreamt that I saw a ghost, I think. And he said, oh, what did she look like? And I knew when he said that, what did she look like, that he'd seen it. So I described what I'd seen, and he and, and, and the other co-worker was sat there as well, just smiling all the time, and apparently every detail tallied. But the, this, this guy, Ken, had seen her much clearer. He'd watched her. He hadn't been as frightened as I was. And he watched her disappear through the wall. And the second time he saw her was in broad daylight. He was, there was a full-length mirror on the wall. He had his foot on a chair, tying his shoelace one morning, looked at her to sort of just fluff his hair. And there she was in the reflection of the mirror. And she just disappeared. She melted away. She didn't move away from him. And as I say, every detail tallied, though his description was much clearer he'd seen her in daytime and I never slept in that room again I wouldn't sleep there was a, a smaller sort of cupboard and I slept in that I wouldn't go in that room again because I was so frightened every detail tallied despite the fact she gave almost none <laughs> <laughs> the thing is it's, t it's tough this because th the more I kind of look into people's histories of ghost hunting and their own experiences I'm, I'm led to believe it's a very personal experience, something that literally can't be measured in a lab or captured, you know, by a computer, like Robo Ghost. Um, it feels like, in that case, like, the story starts... Whenever I hear a story that starts with, I was asleep and then I woke up and I saw a ghost, my, my instant reaction is, well, then it's one of those weird hallucinations you can have when you come out of a dream and you don't know what you're seeing and, you know, the whole body paralyzing sleep thing that like your body's not really waking what up. sounded like. One yeah. The lucid dream sleep paralysis things. Yeah, yeah it, there's that. But then when 
she, you know, she explains it in that part of the story with Ken and the whole, you know, clarification and uh, her beliefs are kind of, um, co- you know, backed up. That's when the stories get interesting, but then you can't be sure that, you know, what they're saying isn't taking the piss or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the story's built up over years, you know, it's adapted and changed. So I don't know, it's, I like those stories, but there's always, to me, a kind of, yeah, but to them. Yeah, well, precisely. There is something properly spooky about that, though. Her haircut, which I'm pretty sure was non-Euclidean. Like, it had to... It was almost... <laughs> I was going to say, it's almost like a kind of Terry Wogan look. <laughs> it's a Terry Wogan haircut given by Cthulhu, yes. <laughs> uh, but bless her. Oh, Tony Connell talks about scientific attitudes towards ghosts. They've put him in with the believers, and I'm, I mean, I'm sure he is because he's got his spider box and that, but he's, he seems to have a fairly sensible head about it, Connell. So. Yeah, I like to it, Tony. Yeah, let's have a... Hmm. And it's no good our friendly scientists say it's all hallucination, but it isn't. And I'm inclined to think that when people say it's all hallucination or rubbish, they find the problem too difficult to solve, and that's one of the challenges. Solving it. Explaining it. It may be that we will never explain it. Perhaps there is another dimension. Perhaps these things are from spirits. Perhaps there is a life after death. Perhaps people do come back. I'm not too happy with that one, but I, if you're an investigator, you've got to balance it. Okay, then. <laughs> Fair enough. <Yeah. laughs> <Okay. laughs> Bloody hell. Oh, there are some YouTube clips of uh, Robin Furman uh, talking about the differences of his Ghostbusters and the fictional version on the screen. <laughs> the fictional it's version are really... interesting. I think it's the biggest difference. Oh, yeah. my God. Right. We, let, let's see what Robin has to say about it. Yeah, his good investigation. old Robin. This is going to be good. On one occasion, we used it when there was something really there. We used it in a deserted church. We fired the beam and a swirling green, ominous mist oh, which this exploded bit. into two yeah. glistening lights and rushed out of the door and disappeared. Now, Unless it goes on a bit more, it, but... It or believe it not, that doesn't matter to me. No, it's the same bollocks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Robin. Oh, that's it. That's, that's, that's the oh, four that's believers. It. That's the believers. Right, we'll find the skeptics so down the toilet the or something, judging by how this is going. <laughs> oh, oh, hang on. Oh, what? We don't have a reflection. What's the... Why is there a different cursor? Odd. Ooh! It's full oh, of blood. This. Or coolant or something. Oh, God. Right. Is that it? This is a, this I guess is a that's it. nothing-y room. This is the believer's bedroom for believers. Oh, wait! Oh, hang on. Hey. The skeptics are on the floor. <laughs> no. What are ghosts? <laughs> oh, this Muzzle is interesting. Versus Sue Blackmore. Ooh. I like the way they've got them as weird paintings. Um, I just really want to make sure I missed no, no, because we came round that end, didn't we? So yeah, okay. Yeah. Why not just have them on the pissing wall? Oh, for God's sake, they can't go down. Oh, bloody hell! Oh, bloody hell! Christ on a tricycle! Come on! No, you can't look down. Right. <laughs> right, so we're gonna have to walk back up here. That is unbelievable. Hang on, is that a cup? We didn't look in that... Yeah, we didn't see that, did we? No! <gasps> oh, it's a coffin! Holy shit! Right, we're, right we'll come back to that. Right, Let's, we'll come uh... back to that once we've figured out how to walk to a painting. <laughs> this is the real puzzle. <laughs> well, I think the simple, almost a dictionary definition of what our ghosts would be, something along the lines of a, a, a disembodied spirit of somebody who's obviously... Oh, thanks. Okay. And well, you know, yeah, I mean, that is it. Yeah. The, the vicar with a dictionary. Next up, Sue Blackmore, sceptic. I think a ghost is something constructed by one's own mind, a mental image, a mental construction that is seen in the context of the ordinary world, an eyes open apparition. It's easy enough when you shut your eyes to have mental images um, against a blank background. It's harder for most people to have them in front of the filing cabinet, the piano, whatever it is. Um, but I think that's precisely what a ghost is. And that's why they look the way they do. Mm. Oh, I like it. Yeah, it's a very great, good, good shot of it. That's kind of, you know, 
edgy. She's serious, but it's also almost like she's in action. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Now let's look for the coffin in the cupboard. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the coffin cupboard. Um, I can't understand why we couldn't see this from the other angle. Maybe I missed it. It depends. The way they block the room is very strange. There was something red on the floor, like an apple or something. Like an... It'd be bloody annoying if there was a coffin in next to your room, wouldn't there? Has this got Christopher Lee in? Oh, it's Christopher Lee! Oh, <laughs> ah. Right, let's see what happens. There are some for whom death holds no dominion. For whom a visitation from the Grim Reaper is simply an opportunity to challenge the Dark Lord's presumptuous presence. Sir James Lowther, the first Earl of Lonsdale, was one such man, whose spirit was sustained in life, as it was after death, by sheer malevolence and an indomitable will. Ooh. Lord Lonsdale, or Wicked Jimmy, as he was best known, <laughs> was <an laughs> Wicked Jimmy Biscuit, <laughs> aristocrat whose tyranny knew no bounds, a sinister figure to many of his contemporaries, his greed for power in both business and politics was rapacious, and it was a foolish peasant who did not meet his criminal extortion of grain and livestock. The unlucky individual would be flogged mercilessly until Lowther grew bored of the amusement. He was also a man of unbridled passions, and this was to prove his ruin. Despite his overweening authority and fearsome temper, Lonsdale was trapped in an unhappy arranged marriage and engaged in unwise dalliances outside his ancestral home of Lowther Castle. Oh his amorous attentions mm. eventually fell on Sarah Cook, the handsome daughter of one of Lonsdale's tenant farmers. Wasn't the last lady Sarah called Mel Cook? Considered of common stock. Everyone's cook. All ghosts are cooks. He was forced to keep her as his mistress in lavish oh. style at his manor house in Hampshire. By and by, his love for Sarah grew, softening his mood and bringing much unaccustomed joy into his life. But it was not to last. In the winter of 1790, Sarah fell unaccountably ill and died at the manor. There was no warning and no time to grieve, and so the Lord of Lonsdale reverted to his old ways and simply refused to accept her demise. Sarah's cold, stiffening body was left on the bed next to him. Much I hope this doesn't go where I think it's going to go. Oh, God. Was forced to play along with this gruesome charade or face dismissal. For the first few days, the chambermaids cleaned and dressed the deceased and brought her down Ugh. to dinner when their master returned from business. The two of them would be served... <laughs> it's like weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> but manoeuvring the cutlery between the corpse's frozen fingers was a grim and nauseating chore Ugh. for the young lad who attended table. But soon... No amount of perfume could disguise the sickly stench of death as Sarah's putrefying flesh slipped free of its bony scaffold. In due course, the servants could bear it no longer and left Lowther alone with his skeletal sweetheart. Wicked Jimmy then had the body placed inside a glass-fronted coffin so that he could gaze at the left face that at once so bewitched him. The days would drag by interminably, and he longed to rush back and be with Sarah, who would listen patiently to his stories of the day's progress and his overtures of love, all the while staring at him with vacant sockets and smiling her grisly smile. He didn't need her to speak. He knew what was in her heart. But the inevitable could not be put off forever. As the body rotted and frayed in its bower of glass, Lowther was exhorted by the few acquaintances who dared visit him now to dispose of the body. It was not right for Sarah to be denied a consecrated burial. Her spirit would never be at rest. And so, 
Two months after her death, Lowther buried his beloved at Paddington Cemetery in London. Wicked Jimmy, the scourge of the Westmoreland countryside, returned to Lowther Castle a broken man. Gone was the rambunctious despot to be replaced by a desolate figure who suffered chronic bouts of depression and took to wandering aimlessly through the nearby woods for days on end. His wife had little option but to remain by his side, but his business languished and the estate fell into decay. He died in 1802 and there were few tears shed at his funeral. But Lowther could not resist one final affront. As the lid was about to be placed on top of his coffin, Wicked Jimmy suddenly sat up, eyes blazing. A sharp hiss of air issued from his dead lips. The tremendous force of his movement knocked the attending vicar off his feet and caused a gasp of horror to break out from the assembled mourners. Wicked Jimmy had risen from the grave like some demented Lazarus to strike terror into the hearts of his neighbors once more. However, a collective sigh of relief shuddered through the gathering when, having had the last word, Sir James Lowther sank back into his casket which was hurriedly nailed shut. But if the people of Westmoreland thought that was the last they would know of the bad lord, they were sorely mistaken. Lowther Hall was the first to bear the full brunt of his homecoming. The upper floors shook violently as his ghost strode about in a rage that forced those few kinsmen who had remained in the castle to cower in the chambers below. Worst of all, though, was the dreadful bellowing, Sir James's booming voice, which terrified those at the receiving end of his ire when he was alive, now threatened to shake the crumbling edifice of Lowther Castle to the ground. But he would not confine his hauntings to his erstwhile residence Sounds like a and spread his new reign of terror. <laughs> to the surrounding countryside. Dressed in black, thoroughly disheveled and sporting a manic gleam in his eye, the first Earl of Lonsdale drove a spectral carriage pulled by demonic chargers through the quiet lanes bounding his estate. None would forget wicked Jimmy in a hurry. Death may have hauled the physical form of Sir James Lowther, defiant till the end, into the void but his spirit would not be denied. Having been cheated of the great love of his life, he would not rest until all had felt his anguish. And the bad Lord refuses to be silenced still. Well, it's always a treat to get a story from Crazy Uncle Lee. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. They could have just called him Wicked Jim, and that would have been cool, you know? Like yeah. Jack the Ripper, Wicked Jim. But Wicked Jimmy sounds like the worst <laughs> 80s celebrity. <laughs> he used to go on tour with Bobby Davro, yeah. Yeah, all that. Like, wasn't good enough to be on Russ Abbott's Madhouse. That kind of comedian. God. So, there's a heart Also, on the floor, a lot of people... Yeah, well, this is the thing. A lot of people have just been reading about the uh, Wicked Jimmy and say... Uh, uh, it's very unlikely that that story's true. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Like, why is that a jug or a heart? Like, you can't bend down to look at it. I don't know. Yeah, once you're in the room, you can't see it anymore until you go all the way round. And it's... As Glitched Out points out, it still sounds better than Angry Horny James. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the worst YouTube channel name I've heard, to be honest. <laughs> Well, that, that's uh, had, had, oh, God's sake! For some reason, the um, navigation's got really poor up in this area. Ghosts. Well, there we are. That's the servants' quarters where they keep. Oh, well, there quarters. we go. Oh, we're locked in here forever now. Aren't we? 
Right, where are we going now? So we this is the back area. So yeah. there's going to be another room somewhere with skeptics in. Yes. So we've got or the from... same four people, but with slightly different sound bites. So we've had the kitchen and the servants' quarters. Yeah. So, so now we've got to there. go up the stairs here. One presumes. Yeah. We've so we've done the whole ground floor now. Yep, the whole ground floor and all the basement and subfloors are done. Excellent. All right, we're making progress. We've got to, oh my god, a, a whole lot of bloody paintings going on here. Did they fold those paintings on a corner? Oh no, it's just the way they built them. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe that one day there will be evidence to prove that ghosts exist? How do we leave? Oh god, we're stuck here forever. Just trying to work out if there's anything else to look at on the walls. Mm. I think there is. Yeah, some stuff there, and also to their right. Let's do the side right. walls first. So just oh, I don't know if you can actually. Oh, here we go. No. This is where you're going to spend 15 minutes trying to look up now. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not going to bloody happen, is it? No. No, they are literally just decoration. Those, and we have got two extra doors, one at the end of each thing. Well, I'll tell you oh, what. Oh, they're taken. They're taken from uh, the uh, exquisite shots of haunted England. That's what those images on the wall are. Yeah, I don't want to see them again. Actually, that is entirely fair. No, we're all right. We're done. Oh, we can look at the scarf or something. That's oh, that's a scarf. I reckon this is going to be a Christopher. Oh, oh, it's just a scarf on a <laughs> on a baluster. Great. Great. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Oh, well. Let's hear the words of wisdom from our four favourite ones. Do you believe that mm. one day there will be evidence to prove that ghosts exist? I don't know. The problem with, with science is that it, it does deal with things that can be measured. Like take something apart in a laboratory or measure it or stick things into it or use telescopes to actually ascertain whether there is something out there. And this seems to me to be so diametrically opposed to a <laughs> to my bullshit. Right? How do you actually measure the presence of a, of a ghost, for example? Can you actually film it? Uh, is it possible to, to record its movements? I don't know. I doubt it. Um, having said that, though, there is actually a body in existence, um, a psychic research body that produces a report quite regularly and as scientifically as possible. It would actually go into a house where perhaps they'd suspected there was a ghost or a haunting, and they would actually put this down in print. Um, I, suppose, I suppose as cold and as clinically as possible, but they just actually relate the actual events that took place. And this is actually available in, in most public libraries for people to go and peruse. So I suspect that in the end, people will actually say, we have had an experience of a ghost, or we have had an experience of something that we can't actually put down in so many words. But there are people who are cataloguing these and saying, it's enough of a phenomenon right across the human race to say, we can't dismiss it. So basically you don't think there will be, is what you're saying? No, <laughs> no. It's saying a lot of people will try, but no one's going to. This is what goes to my theory, though, about the idea of like ghost sighting is such a personal experience that maybe it can't be measured because if you want to, you know, lean into the psychic about it a bit, it's a psychic connection you have with something that no one else can experience. So why would it be something you can capture on camera? Mm. As a thought. Yeah, that's handy because it means people in TV shows can make things up easier. It's really handy, isn't it? <laughs> That's why a lot of these ghost hunting shows are built around this conversation. Did you see that? No. I heard something. Yeah, I heard something. That's it. Yeah. That That's the whole script. I want to go on Most Haunted and claim that Derek Akora is now my spirit guide. I, I'm, I've been so tempted to do that myself. <laughs> <laughs> like on Cheap Show, I tell people that we're, we officially inherited Sam when Derek Akora left, so now Sam works for us. <laughs> You, you were second on his list. Yeah, like, oh, God. <laughs> bloody hell. Oh, well, at, least, at least they're better than a Cora. Oh, bloody hell. Just a bit. <laughs> Blimey. Right. Let's see what Sue Blackmore has to say on this subject. I think it would be very exciting if we had some evidence that ghosts exist. 
The problem is, I think what's most likely to happen is that we'll go on getting the kinds of so-called evidence that we've had for years and years. That is stories of people seeing things, apparently matching up to how things were in the past, but when you go and check, you can't really be sure and so on. What would really make a difference would be if somebody came up with a plausible sounding theory about ghosts. And most of the theories that I've heard just don't really stand up at all. They involve all kinds of uh, very strange ideas of energy or a vibration or a storage of information which just don't fit with anything that we understand and you can't do anything with them. What we need is a theory that will say, right, it's using this kind of energy, it's storing the information in this kind of way, it interacts the brain like this, now let's test it. If it's true, it predicts such and such an effect, let's go and look for that effect. That, that is how normal science proceeds, by putting up a theory and trying to see whether it can make predictions that, that come out right. If we had that in the realm of ghosts, we might get somewhere. Um, but it, ha it hasn't happened yet. I think it would be very interesting if it did. Hmm. But right, what's interesting is that this CD-ROM is right before the birth of paranormal reality TV, like a few years before Most Haunted starts, right? And when you think about the hours of footage that all these shows have filmed in all the, what, 20-odd years they've been on TV... And then you think about how much of that is actual, really quantifiable evidence that's worth investigating further. And it just goes to show that catching ghosts isn't going to be possible, even with the modern technology. I don't think, I think it all boils down to, at the end of the day, it's going to be my word against yours and vice versa. That's exactly it, isn't it? And if there's nothing measurable or more to the point repeatable, what are you going to do? You know, exactly. You haven't got anything to show at any stage, and frankly, nobody should be believing in it until they've experienced it themselves. Well, and even I then, tell you what, do you, want to, mm. do you want me to read you something really fascinating? Yes, for God's sake, yes, because so, uh, bloody Robin Furman's coming well, next. <laughs> all right, okay, so maybe not fascinating, but I found really enlightening. So, um, you know, last time we got together and we did this, and I remember, um saying, oh, wouldn't it be a good idea if there was a ghost hunt show that was more like a court case where you had a judge and a prosecution and, a, you know, the defence mm. and the sceptics put their argument forward and there's like a jury and they vote if the place is haunted or not based on all the evidence. So I thought, I know this guy who's trying to pitch a TV show, a ghost hunting show to history. And so I sent it to him in a rough draft and he sent it on to the History Channel and they wrote back to him, do you want to hear what they said? I would bloody love to. Right, good. So here's intro. This is what they said. This is some, some, he doesn't put who it was, but it's someone from the History Channel. Thank you so much for sending over this concept. I went ahead and shared with the team as it came in just before one of our development chats. It is a very fun concept, but sadly, we think it would be a tough one for us to sell. The main issue here is that we always want to come from a place of belief. You know, our audience is really made of true believers, so we need to stay on their side. We really try to keep away from any debunking or disproving. In the majority of our content, it is less about proving and more about acknowledging. We tend to just affirm that something is going on, even if we can't point a finger to exactly who or what is causing it. For this idea, we'd have to strip too much away in order to make it fit our view. It would certainly be a fun way to use celebrities, and even in a short form, we just felt it was sadly too far away from our tone. The History Channel said this, a show based primarily on facts. Fucking hell. So basically, no, we wouldn't do that because we just like to make up shit because people watch it. Anyway, apparently we're the History Channel. <laughs> yeah, that's a scary thing. But if you look at like who's recently been commissioned, famously been commissioned to have successful ghost hunting shows, if we look at ghost hunters, I believe they first came about because um, they just happened to be in the right place at the right time when the, uh, the Discovery Channel were looking for someone to front this ghost hunting show. So they were hired for that. But then you look at Zach Bagels or Baggins, whatever his bloody name is, and he put a YouTube video up. I think it was YouTube. It was definitely a video put up online somewhere. And it got so many hits that a TV company came to him and went, we're going to turn yours into a series. And then that's how that thickness started. And then I think, oh, what was the other one? Oh, there was another one that just escapes me now, but it was a very similar thing. Oh, okay. So do you remember on Twitter, there was that, was it called Dear David? It was that artist who believed he was being haunted by a baby with a oh, dent in its head. Oh, yes. He's got a ghost hunting show now. And so that was because of his Twitter account. And now he goes around the country chasing ghosts. And he does it in a... It's horrible. It's like they slap a load of Twitter chat room boxes all over it and Facebook messages. And it's all kind of like catfished the whole genre up. 
But, but Dear David was like a fictional thing. Oh, no, it's it's not. Apparently, it's a real thing that really happened, not an ongoing con by an out-of-work artist. But it, what? He wasn't even pretending it was real at first, was he? I thought it was... What? It was just an in-universe fiction. If he wasn't fiction. at first... No, I think if, if, if first, it may have been he did it for a laugh, but by the end, he was selling it like it was a real thing. Oh, my God. I mean, I'm sure he's... And it's really I'm depressing. I'm sure I've read him saying how he did it, or, so, or something along those lines, that it wasn't real. I'm, oh, Maybe. I mean, the thing is, without... I mean, it could be easily found on the internet if you do a quick search, but, I mean, for the purposes of, like, him getting this TV show, it was off the basis of this ghost story. And again, the weird thing about that ghost story is it talks about this new way of how we tell ghost stories, especially in like an online media. So back in the day, you had the cliche, you know, round the campfire, you're also ghost stories, which were based in urban legends and myths and history. And these days we build them as we go. So like here's an example of Twitter where he's like, oh, I'm being haunted. And the audience follow it tweet by tweet and they build on it and they even help build the narrative sometimes. It becomes this big homogenous mass of everyone's influence and him guiding the story to fit his audience same for like um uh slender man is a perfect example of how it was almost literally made a real thing by the ongoing mm. uh, b uh, belief in the idea of the wicker man even though wasn't it originally an award-winning piece of photoshopped art for a reddit page or something yeah i think it was like for one of the worth 2000 competitions or something if i remember correctly something yeah. like that or from the yeah. like something awful forums or something oh Wow, that's just that's just depressing. As DC Flake says, <laughs> waiting for the Ben Drowned TV show. Yeah, there we are. I should have mm. a TV show about haunted video games or something because I wrote a film about something that was a bit like that. <laughs> Apparently, that's well, how it works. works. Yeah, because who isn't it? Is that the story about the haunted Le Legend of Zelda game, the haunted yes, Majora's Mask game? That's exactly it, the Ben Drowned one. Yeah, which is a, which is a great urban legend it's a great bit of you know modern uh myth making yeah but oh god but yeah now it's <laughs> it's probably gonna be a movie or something isn't it if that wasn't depressing enough now we've got to hear from bloody robin Furman. <laughs> <laughs> i love him uh... he's become my high breakout star of this <laughs> here we go i think we're very close to it because you see the team and i are all skeptics that is we we doubt but we accept sensible evidence Whereas people who say they're skeptics and don't believe, of course, are not skeptics. At least they're not scientists, because a scientist has an open mind. They're dogmatic. They're paranoid disbelievers. We're the true skeptics. We doubt in the absence of evidence. But I think we're getting there. What? Then why have you got a fucking light gun that scares the spooky cloud away? <laughs> then? God, it would be less of a joke if he used a little, you know an NES zapper. <laughs> he's, he's, he's gone up a bit. He's got a menacer. Holding over his shoulder. Yeah. Oh. The worst goodness. thing about it is, it could have easily just been a flashbulb torch. You know, that's all he needed to do was have a torch in his hand. But he had to build it onto, I think it looked like a spray painted super soaker. Yeah. That's, that's, that's astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. Parzival, thank you for the bits, says the History Channel has very little to do with history. Proven by the fact that CBBC is a historical comedy sketch show, more accurate than it. Entirely true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like Rish, Rish of the Jackals. He looks like Liam Neeson's demented older brother. <laughs> <laughs> to me, every time I look like look at Robin Furman, I keep thinking, is this what Rick Moranis is going to look like in 20 years' time? Oh, my God. That's what Rick, uh, Rick Moranis looks like now, I think. Because we haven't seen oh, him in yeah. 20 years, have we? You know. No, the last wasn't he in that advert with Ryan Reynolds recently? Yeah, he's slowly making a comeback. I think now he's raised his yeah. kids. Yeah. Well, he's he's making a new Honey I Shrunk the Kids film, isn't he? Oh my god, I didn't know he was attached. Amazing. Yeah, it's called Shrunk, but it's been brought to um, Disney's attention by Josh Gad, so he's going to be in it playing, I think, Wayne Zizinski's son, and probably Rick Moranis oh. gets a ten-minute cameo, probably. I reckon. Nice. Yep, down for that. Well, let's see what Tony Cornell says. It's got to be done much more accurately, with a lot more equipment, more spectrum, and a lot more analysis, and I think more important than anything else, with all that backup, the psychology of the people involved is very, very important. We don't know what causes this, but it does seem to be linked to, in many ways, people's beliefs and the circumstances they find themselves in. In, in other words, the mental state. I don't mean crackers. Their, their, their mental outlook. 
from that point of view, the laboratory investigation we were talking about earlier can help us. But uh, as for a breakthrough, I don't think I shall see it, and I don't think my children will see it, and I don't think uh, my grandchildren, if I have any, will see it. And I'm inclined to think that it won't be a parapsychologist that will produce this phenomenon. I think probably uh, an orthodox scientist will find something and the whole thing will fall into place. Because I'm inclined to believe that the phenomenon that we are dealing with can be explained eventually in scientific terms. Now, not everybody will agree with that, but that is my belief. So that's what we should be aiming for, and I think that's probably in time what will happen. Hmm. I'm more likely to believe that end of things, if there's going to be evidence at all. Yeah, it's not going to come from the people who are very, uh, a little bit too close to wanting it desperately to be real, to the extent that they've made a super soaker with a torch on it and claim they can shoot clouds. <laughs> yeah. Because I used to have a big problem with those radio voice boxes that Ghost Hunters use, which scan the radio frequencies and ever so often briefly catches a syllable or so from a radio station but they oh it says it said kill you oh no and you think that you're it's such a ridiculous way to look for any proof of anything yeah well, absolutely you yeah I mean, and like he says maybe one day somebody will discover something entirely by accident while looking for something else but I'm not convinced by the evidence Mr. Lee has presented so far, put it that way. No. Maybe the second twist is that it's, he's not dead after all. <gasps> in fact, the, the ultimate twist is he's actually Sylvester Stallone in a mask. Hey! That'd be amazing. I hope you like walking around my house, you <laughs> fellow ghost. <laughs> he's oh, never man. done a horror. Has, has, Stallone's never done a horror film, proper one, has he? I don't think he has. I mean, Schwarzenegger's done a couple, but... The closest he got was Detox by Rennie Harlan, which was kind of like a slasher film. Mm, that's interesting. I can't believe that that's, I managed to pull that fact from my head. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of it, to be honest. Detox. I think it goes by another name as well, but basically it's about, like, he's a he's a FBI or CIA or a top-level cop, and something happens, and he goes to this kind of recluse kind of self-help group up in somewhere snowy. And then there's all the cops and damaged people there. And then one by one, they all start dying. Oh, bloody hell. So there you go. There's, there's my recommendation. Look, up, <laughs> look, look for detox. And then, and then hate me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my... What I forgot, yeah, what I forgot to mention is the film is bollocks. Oh. Yeah. It sounded quite interesting right up until that point. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, it, it's, it's like the same with all those kind of lost late 90s, early 2000s films from like, especially Rennie Harlan, where it's like the juice just ain't there no more. It's it like, it literally died after he made Long Kiss Goodnight and then Cut for Island happened and it ruined his career. Mm. I liked Long Kiss Goodnight though. Underrated that one, I feel. It's, you know what? It's a great trilogy. If you watch that and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and The Nice Guys back to back, that's a really solid three movie Shane Black fun time. Oh, I've not watched um, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I've seen Nice Guys. Yeah, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is literally Nice Guys, but now it's set in LA. Oh, no, that was set in LA as well, but it's set in modern day rather than the 70s. Ah, interesting. Oh, fuck. Oh, oh that's all right. Right, let's save here, actually. That is the perfect point, I feel. Yes, a door. First. <laughs> <laughs> There we are. And next time we can, well, suss out the last one. Shall we have a sneak peek? Yeah. A, oh, a teaser. Oh, 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 it's one of those boring um, man in the street ghost story things. Amazing. Of the giant oh. master. But, oh, God. Insane. Whatever that is. Clock dream catcher combination with an axe on it. Oh, Excellent. God, amazing. I've, well, I've now got, much that cost in Ikea. I've got, I've got to see what's on the other side now. Let's have a look. Oh, this oh. is a boring one. <laughs> the guest bedroom. I honestly thought that was Rudy Giuliani for a second. That was... Just... <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that... Lies oh. in Easter. What? Well, there you go. The answer lies in Easter, which means the answer's probably eggs, isn't it? The answer lies in Easter. Oh, is there another puzzle? It must be. 
Ooh. I like the fact that, imagine if you were these parapsychologists and ghost hunters and shifts, and you went to this guy's house, and you just saw pictures of yourself all over the house. <laughs> like, literally every room's got a picture of you in. <laughs> it's like that bloody uh, Alan Partridge episode <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bloody hell, is that a gauntlet? Or yeah, possibly oh, a... a severed hand. Oh, is it going to be a uh, hand of glory or something? Maybe. Anyway. Or the worst masturbation aid in living history. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the worst or the best? No, you're right. right no, no, it's the that. worst. Yeah. Right, let's let's shut this blighter down. There we are. Turn off the virtual computer. Oh, bye-bye. Bye-bye, Christopher Lee. <laughs> God, that sounds comforting. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while since I've heard that one, actually. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Ah, marvellous. Well, thank you well, very much for joining us again, Mr. Gannon. It was a long time coming, but it was a pleasurable trip around Christopher Lee's haunted house of horrors. It certainly was. We've discovered that Christopher Lee is dead and lives in a painting, which is great. Yes, that's, um, that's a boon. And, uh, and, and uh, <laughs> he made a light gun ghost hunting piece of equipment, <laughs> which is the biggest takeaway. That that's, yeah, that, that's definitely my favourite. I'm almost wondering if I should make an emoji of it or something. Absolutely. Please. <laughs> Please. A lot of people are saying we should um, uh, play Phasmophobia. Yeah, I, it's, it's one of the things I've been looking at, that and Among Us. And mm. Phasmophobia, I've been seeing a lot of people playing that, and it looks a lot of fun. Yeah. All i got to hope is that my computer, my laptop can run it. I hope it can. Maybe. I've got no bloody idea. It looks fairly low-res, Phasmophobia, doesn't it? I haven't yeah. really watched people playing it properly. It's something about you've got to like find out details of a ghost without being killed by it or something isn't it? it it's literally like being in an extreme version of ghost hunters so it's you and a small team and it's cooperative and you get different ghost hunting equipment like a uh, like a k2 meter and a camera and the book for the ghost to write in and dust and chalk and all these things and you leave traps around the house and you've got to find out where the cold spots are and try and make contact because apparently it, the game reads your microphone as well so if you call out the name of the ghost you can summon it so it's like yeah and you have to have so many objectives cleared to solve the case or to leave the building. So you basically have to work out its name and then call it or something and then hope you've got other stuff yeah. done that it likes. So you can give it some and ghost some, cheese and then it goes back. Yeah, and some thing. ghosts will only appear if there's one person in the building at all. So the other ones have to wait in the van uh, or some of them need to be in the room together or you need to like, you need to kind of do the history of the ghost so you know what to incite it with. Hmm. It, as I say, people have watched... It's fun. And there was one I watched that did give me a proper good jump scare. So, you know, that seemed fun. Ah. I've heard it's good in VR, but I'm not sure I would want to be playing that in VR, frankly. It sounds bloody frightening. It sounds. It's like I want to play Resident Evil. Is it six in VR? Is that the, is that the one in the in the Redneck's house? Is that it? Seven? Ooh, I don't know. Seven, is isn't VR it? One. Yeah, I don't know the numbers. but yeah. yeah. I'd like to play that one. I still want to play that game full stop. It's been years. Come out on the Switch, please. Everything else has. Come on. Anyway. <laughs> is it going to come out on a spectrum in a box with a printer that's what i really want well here's the thing apparently if you live in japan you can download resident evil 7 to your switch it's one of those stream download games you can get oh but it ain't in the uk man and i want it bad yo <laughs> i just want to stop playing binding of isaac mate that's what it comes down to it's never going to happen that is that is the rest yeah. of your life now the binding of isaac it's probably what i'm going to do right after this <laughs> frankly <laughs> There is no escape. That is the true horror. There is no escape from the binding of Isaac. It's true the binding that. of whoever plays it. Mm. The binding of Ganon. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> That's the sequel everyone needs now. <laughs> yeah. Righty ho. Well, you take care, right. my friend. Thank you very much for coming along. See you the fortnight for more spooky fun. Take care, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Bye, everyone. Bye. Cheers, man. Bye bye.